Hello, everybody, and welcome along to the fifth round of the 2014 FIA World Endurance Championship. We're here in Japan for the six hours of Fuji at the awesome, always awesome Fuji Speedway. About a couple of hours away by car from Fuji, considerably less if you take the fastest narrow gauge train in the world, the Romance car, which is what uh, race car engineer Sam Collins is doing. This track originally built in 1965 for stock cars, didn't look quite like that then, although all of the old circuit, most of the old circuit is still here. Well, they love their motorsport and they particularly love endurance racing here in Japan. Down in Tokyo, the hustle and the bustle replaced up in the shadow of Mount Fuji by serenity and calm. However, that calm is about to be shattered here at Fuji for the six hour race. Didn't get to see the races uh, this time last year, but two years ago we had a cracker. It's a big crowd in here today, and they are still coming in. All the usual folder roll down on the grid. The car park down below turn five is absolutely stacked full at the moment, and we already have the traditional dress of the grid girls. Jerome Blackham all in there driving Ferrari. And everyone here thinking, of course, particularly the Ferrari drivers of Gilles Bianchi. Now, the big news this weekend has been about the 2015 calendar. And who better to ask to take us through that than Gerard Naveau, the man at the top of the WEC. You join us on the very busy grid uh, at Toyota's home race, and I'm joined by Gerard Nevu. Um, we've had the launch of 2015 calendar. It's looking good. It sounds very good. So we have a uh, stability with eight races next year. Most of the races we already have in 2014. Uh, we just uh, switched Brazil by Nürburgring next year, and we will reduce the summer gap with a fantastic event in Germany uh, by the end of August 2015. Uh, with WC, but also with celebration of the 50th anniversary of the 1,000 kilometers. So we're really happy to go there. This is the home circuit for Audi and Porsche. And after that, we visit Japan with the home circuit for Toyota and Nissan next year. And we will still go to the main place of the season with uh, Silverstone, Spa, Le Mans, of course. And uh, Circuit of the Americas in, in uh, Texas, uh, Austin in USA, Japan, China and Bahrain. And normally Brazil will be back uh, in 2016 after they will uh, finish the, the renew of the facilities of the racetrack. Lovely, thank you. So it's all looking good for 2015, but let's take a look at how the drivers and the cars got onto the grid positions here in Japan with the highlights from qualifying. Well, going back to yesterday, it was a very big crowd for the qualifying sessions as well and a huge half mile long orderly queue forming before they were allowed into the pit lane. It was the GTs that got us underway of course and Pedro Lamy out first. Looked like he may have done a little bit of damage to the right front of his young driver Aston Martin. But he got away with it more than that. Led the field early on and Alex McDowell backed him up brilliantly to take pole position. So two pole positions for Aston Martin, with Fernando Reis and Alex McDowell taking the second pole. Then into the prototypes, P2. Problems for the Orc car in post-race tech. Sent them to the back of the grid, too big a restrictor for them. Alex Imperatore was good earlier on, and Richard Bradley backed him up nicely. And then it was on to the battle at the very head of the field. Audi didn't seem to take part in the battle for pole position, concentrating perhaps on a different strategy. 
Mark Webber held pole position for the number 20 Porsche until the very last lap of qualifying, when Sebastian Buemi found the two tenths he needed on the four lap average to take pole position. Anthony Davison absolutely delighted. Now the national anthem of Japan. The enthusiastic crowd here are brilliant. They love a flag, they love their replica shirts, they love their expensive camera equipment, and they clearly have a lot of time for endurance racing, no pun intended there. The LMX Audi R8 safety car, the run-out model of the current version, the one that Alan McNish drove to start the 24 Hours of Le Mans this year sitting at the front of the field and a good crowd down in the green your Burmeister I can see there standing the lanky frame just to the left of picture and the atmosphere here has been superb and once again Suzuki uh, the uh, rather the Fuji circuit has been a perfect host to the FIA World Endurance Championship Graham Goodwin of Daily Sports Car is with me, and this is a trip that isn't easy to make for us Europeans, but it's worth it every time. It's absolutely a highlight of the season for everybody that uh, arrives here from all around the world, John. Great crowd uh, coming together now as the grid's formed up. Still busy with the spectator areas behind our commentary booth here, and a great show being put on for spectators, as always, here at Fuji. It's a real example. Uh, to international events, uh, trying to build an audience. Uh, hugely enthusiastic crowd. Uh, lots of families as well, which is always great to see. And as you quite rightly said just a little earlier, the car parks down below us, because uh, there's an awful lot of elevation here at uh, the Fuji International Speedway. The car park's absolutely packed. And as we're getting used to nowadays, uh, crowds queuing overnight until the gates actually open here at Fuji. Ferrari, thoughts, I'm sure with their development driver, Jill Bianchi. Nice to see the drivers at the head of the grid earlier on. And an awful lot of Forza Jewel stickers on helmets. Uh, the crowd have taken that up as well. Great to see that the series and all of the major teams are supported in great numbers here. And a fantastic array of support from the, the manufacturers as well, with Toyota, Audi, Porsche, all represented just behind us in the fan area which was packed this morning some a fantastic set of uh, toyota 800 sports an unusual car for us europeans and the beautiful toyota oh. 2000s oh. as well <laughs> yes indeed Fujitsu san the spirit of the mountain on the top of the aston martin there it's the number 98 car and, that and is we also the fired up the ts10 ts10 3.5 meter v10 which uh, which just tingles down the spine doesn't it uh, young lady there enjoying her day, I'm sure. And there, the fabled Mount Fuji. No snow on top of Fuji uh, this week. Crowd waiting patiently. I won't have to wait much longer because uh, not long before we get the cars rolling. As you can see behind that young lady there, stands pretty well packed down at that end of the pit lane and pretty well full or filled. Uh, down here too, John, and this is a very long stand and what is an extraordinary start-finish straight. Yeah, 1.4 kilometres or something, isn't it? It is a very long time. Now, here's the GT Pro category. Uh, that's one of the Porsches there, the 92 car, which we believe will be started by Patrick Peele. Oh, which is having trouble with the lights this weekend. Nope. It's uh, 14 degrees in the air, 18 degrees on the track. It is quite humid out there, very little wind. The weather generally comes in up the valley, 
and we've got the opportunity to see both ways here with the back door of the comps box open at the moment. A little bit cloudy behind us, John, uh, over towards Fuji, but uh, we're not expecting rain at the moment uh, during this race. I wouldn't be that surprised with the odd spring ball, but certainly the kind of the importance of meteorological doom that we're actually doing the rounds a couple of three days ago don't appear at the moment uh, to be threatening to interrupt proceedings here. Uh, I think uh, there will be parts of Japan that will be suffering the effects uh, in the not too distant future, but uh, for the next well, just over six hours, I think we're good to go. can't believe you've actually used that. There's the 99 Aston, started by Fernando Reese. He's had a good year this year and has come on very well indeed. There he is with the glasses on, just about to put the silver, blue and red helmet on. Just behind these big girls, there he is. Had a good chat with him yesterday. Uh, it is little and large. Uh, reminds me very much of the York Bergmeister team or Bernard Diaz uh, in the Porsches but they've got a seat that moves and a, an insert for Fernando he's very much the littler side of the uh, Alex McDowell and Reese Shaw Fernando Reese Shaw and as I say he's developing into a very very se steady pair of hands for endurance racing two autograph sessions uh, this weekend two pit sessions this weekend this one for autographs yesterday was just an open pit and as ever the crowd bringing all kinds of things to <laughs> to uh, sign. I hadn't seen one. And that was uh, the Mark Webber kangaroo. Not a proper kangaroo, it just a wallaby. Now, Louise is down on the grid. And one of the great heroes of Japanese motorsport is with her, Takuma Sato. Takumo, we're just getting pictures taken now. We've just seen pictures of the crowds. This is fantastic, isn't it? The support from the local crowds. It is fantastic. Despite the weather, it was a little cold today, but stay on the dry. And look at the fans here. I mean, the Fuji Speedways with their WECs always has a great support. And uh, what are you doing here today? Uh, today is just uh, enjoying the uh, enjoying the race. I'm just uh, the um, a guest of the one of the my personal sponsor, Interrush, and uh, cheering on them. And they got the pole position in class, and so it's. Uh, Hopefully they have a strong race today. And we know that you're in IndyCar right now, but is, is there a possibility that you're going to join WEC in the future? Oh, anything is possible. I mean, uh, I've been experienced WEC racing two years ago, and it was it was great experience actually. And my first ever sports car race as well as endurance race, and I really enjoyed it. And I missed so much. So. Uh, you know, with any circumstance in, in the future, plan is open, wide open, and uh, I'd love to come back to the Japan for, for, the, for the race as a series, and uh, it'll be fun. So I'm a big fan of the WEC. Thanks very much. Do you want to try and give the uh, crowd sure. a wave? See if, if they, they see, see it. <laughs> yeah, there, there it is. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank Bye. Just brilliant to see. Great to see full stands and great to see Kumasato back with uh, the WEC. Uh, so of course, he had a couple of races, I think, John, didn't he? Yes, he did. Let's uh, remind everybody of the grid. Graham with uh, Porsche and uh, Toyota on front row, Porsche and Toyota on second row. Then the two Audis really, as I said, just didn't get involved in the silliness at the front of the field. The two Rebellions on row four, row five, at the first of the P2 cards and note that it is a different uh, pool sitter than we were expecting from yesterday and there's a good reason for that. Uh, that's because there was a penalty for the, uh, the lead here. We'll get to that in a moment, I think. But uh, into the GTs, it was a double pole for Aston Martin, but the 99 car, the Kraft Bamboo car, setting pole in GTE Pro. Getting down now into 10th and 11th row. Uh, and uh, there we have on the 10th row, it's the pole sitter for the GTM class. At the back of the field though, John, we're going to see another car that got in some strife. That's the number 35 Oak Racing car. Set second fastest time in qualifying, but uh, post uh, session in the scrutineering was found to have too large a restrictor. The reason that the Ligier is not on pole, the number 26 car, is because uh, there was a bit of an issue in free practice for Roman Rusinov yep. uh, around a yellow flag infringement and uh, went back three places on the grid. The Eagles have been out all weekend. 
and looking, they've got a great vantage point, haven't they? Uh, yes, overtaking under a yellow flag. Also a penalty for the car we're looking at now. We'll see that uh, come into play a little later, the number 37 car, which is one of the two Orica Nissans run by SP Racing. This car has used too many engines this year. There's a lot of cost capping involved to keep the cost of sports car racing down. Uh, they therefore will have to um, do a stop and three minute hold at some point in the first half of the race. Uh, uh, you've got to do that as early as you can, really. You are, you would think so. The 35 car, by the way, the one that starts in the back of the grid, will, in addition to being put in the back of the grid, also need to do a stop go at some point at the discretion of the race director. Oh, really? Yes, indeed. Uh, for, for that same indiscretion? For the same indiscretion. Okay. Uh, here we have uh, Nick Manassian, the man who's just had the most expensive running session of the weekend, because uh, Nicola, another man who uh, got a bit of a penalty, 600 euros for Quick Nick. Now, Graham and I are not ones to do gym bunny type things, but Louise told us that her gym membership for the whole year is uh, about 600 euros, and that's what Nick got fined for that uh, 4.5 kilometers around here. And why did he get fined, John? Because the safety cars were doing an exercise on track at the time. <laughs> Now, but he's go. not a Muppet. This is, this is he Muppet. told us that last year in Poirier. This is the uh, the new pole sitting car, and indeed, uh, first time race winner in WEC last time out at Circuit of the Americas. This is the KCMG, entered Orica Nissan, and uh, it's two Brits and one Swiss aboard this car this weekend. Um, Matt Housen and Richard Bradley and... Uh, Alexander Imperatori is the young man we're seeing there now climbing aboard one of a what do we call a, a group of Swiss John collective noun for Swiss race drivers but lots and lots of Swiss race drivers. A cabal probably. A cabal is a good one a canton maybe. A canton, a canton very of good. Swiss uh, race drivers and uh, very quick indeed does almost all of his racing out here in Asia very well known to the locals here. There's the shapely rear end of the number 13 Rebellion. Bit of a whoopsie in the qualifying session for this car. It will be Dominic Heihammer. You can see him with the eat the ball message on the side of his helmet. That's his personal sponsor and also a team sponsor now. And Dominic, one of 15 drivers that to date in the 21st WEC race in its uh, history has uh, competed in every race. Gives us a quick wave, thumbs up from Dominic. Loves his motorsport. And still the crowd is coming in. There are still cars going to the car parks, all the way down at the old banking uh, at the far end, at the southern end of the circuit, down uh, by the Dunlop chicane. We've still got a big crowd in the fan area behind us, having a look at the Toyota hybrids, the Mazda, oh, the Mazda that's in there as well. Oh, that's 90, lovely. 92 race dirty Mazda. There's the Rebellion, Rebellion R1 Toyota for. That is Matthias Besch. Matthias Besch, starting another the Swiss. Race. Yes. It is a very pretty car, that, isn't it? It is extremely pretty, very low slung. The uh, Toyota V8 engine mounted extremely low. Yeah, and very, very quick down this main straight. We were seeing, in, uh, I think you had, you had it explained to you by the Tota guys that the car catching the Totas at the end of the straight as they do their lift and coast. The Audi's pulling a G of deceleration on lifting and coasting. Astonishing, and it is all about efficiency. It's about uh, maintaining speed and saving fuel. And if you see the Audi's brake lights on in the middle of a straight flashing, and um, that's probably because they're lifting and yep. coasting. They do have that. Uh... Now, in case you think uh, from hearing that for the first time, this, this means these cars are going to lap slowly. These cars, <laughs> these cars lap at more or less precisely the same kind of times, within tenths of a second, plus or minus, as the cars did last year. But they're saving well over 20% of their fuel load. So the forecast is pretty good, overcast all the way through. The typhoon is misting us. We're possibly even going to get some sunshine in the second hour as it spreads in from the south. Uh, and if you're tuning in to us around the world here from the WEC, at whatever the time of day it is, it's an awfully busy weekend for motorsport, particularly for those of you uh, in this time zone uh, in the, the Far East. Uh, I know that uh, the great race is going on down under at the moment. We're watching that earlier on. And for those of you in Australia, the UK, around the world, wherever you're tuning in, welcome to our big sports car community that is focused at the moment on round five of the World Endurance Championship 
here at the Fuji Speedway in Japan, and the crowd is going to be even bigger than it was last year. And after the trials and tribulations that the spectators and the endurance that the spectators went through last year, Kaznak and Jima there sitting, starting the race. One last year, of course, and that uh, rain interrupted six hours, John. And you're quite right. Uh, we talk a lot, don't we, about the spirit of endurance racing. That was there for everyone to see here last year with the vast majority, and I mean 95% plus of this crowd uh, last year, staying the course and then uh, in their thousands taking part in an impromptu uh, pit lane walkabout. All the team stayed last year. Uh, say thank you for the loyalty of the fans sitting here in awful, awful weather conditions. Infinitely better looking now. We can see the mountains off uh, right in front of us. We can see the mountains behind us too. Uh, beautiful natural setting for the Fuji International Speedway. Should point out as well that on Friday there were over 1,500 school children brought here as part of school trips. They were all given a WEC hat and they've all been involved in projects around the national curriculum here in Japan that uh, tap in to what we see here in motor racing, whether it was uh, estimating the number of seats in grandstands, looking at the cars, uh, and there's been some art projects going on as well. This is an ongoing project that's been going on for the last few years as we look at the 14 Porsche there, uh, second row uh, of the grid. Sitting uh, in behind the pole sitter, so it's uh, Toyota Porsche, Porsche Toyota. And there is Mark Webber, who must have thought he was going to get a share of oh. pole position for the first time. He was 0 0.008 of a second ahead. We had a little red flag when one of the rebellions came to a halt at the Panasonic corner, the final of the 16 here at Fuji. And man, about six and a half, seven minutes to go, the Porsche sat on pit lane. When Bohemi went back out again, Bohemi's first lap, getting ties up with temperature. Second lap, his second flying lap, he was only two tenths away from what he needed. And the opportunity for Porsche to go out and defend were there, but they didn't take it. Now, if you're new to this, we have to remind you that the guys are starting on the tyres that they're qualified on, and at the front of the field, that might well be very interesting because we don't know who can double stint tyres or not. Audi seem to think that they can. Porsche and Toyota are keeping their cards pretty close to their chest. What about the GTs, Chris? Well, the GTs, uh, we wondered why there was a slight, slight change, not, not to decry the talents of Alec McDowell and uh, Fernando Rees, but why there was such a change around between the normal for, uh, fortunes of the Aston Martins with the 97 car seemingly unable to actually uh, beat the times of the 99. Well, in part, that's because they're running on different tyre compounds, John. The 99 car uh, was running on softer uh, compound tyres, the medium compounds for the 97. That's likely to have an effect on the pace we see from the cars as uh, this race unwinds. I think it also might be one of the, uh, the, the factors, the, the tyres will certainly be a factor. Here with the P1s, as you mentioned, Audi rather bailing out of competing for pole, and I wonder whether or not that was strategic. I wonder whether or not they are doing all they can to stretch those tyres, as we saw they could at uh, Cota, the Circuit of the Americas last time out, to double stint their tyres while the other P1s would struggle. If they can, that's a mighty saving of time. Something like 25 seconds, I think, isn't it, John, for a, a change of the four tyres in the WEC. This is not the same as a Formula One tyre stop, remember. There are serious restrictions on the amount of kit and people you can use. It's not that you basically throw a garage full of people around a car and do it in three seconds flat. These guys are perfectly capable of doing that. But uh, Let's uh, go down and have a listen to Sebastian Buemi talking to his engineer, Mathieu Lanel. If you need to go on HV4 earlier than uh, predicted, you can ask me. So he's talking, uh, Sebastian, there through the start procedure. It might have been interesting for Porsche if they'd got pole position. I think they would have controlled the field in a different way than Toyota will. I expect to see a very late green and Toyota using their 1,000 horsepower with the super capacitor to ping away from the rest of the grid. Had it been Porsche on pole, I would have expected them to get their hybrid charged up and their batteries charged up as much as possible and basically floor it coming straight out of the final corner 
and then they'd get another 3.1 megajoules as they crossed the line. Yeah, all sorts of tactics. So we've seen this throughout the season. The, the, the teams are still learning how to get the best out of these packages. The, the, the development curve is near vertical for these, uh, these cars at the front of the grid. We've said it before, well, undoubtedly say it again, if you're looking for where the most technologically advanced race cars on the planet are, you're looking at them right now. Maybe not that one. Uh, that's a pretty traditional LMP2 car, but the front of this grid with the LMP1 cars here with the hugely powerful normal engines they've got, plus the... Uh, and we're going to hear, I think, from the number seven team radio. Ignition on to check capacity of charge, please. Yes, now that was very interesting. Make sure it's charged right up is basically what he's saying. You're going to need that extra boost of power uh, when you come to the green light. Now, to give you a general idea of what we're talking about here in terms of power, uh, the one team that's really shared any kind of figures with us was Toyota at the start of the season. This is why you'll hear John and I talking about 1,000 horsepower because it is 1,000 horsepower from the combined efforts of the all-time and full-time engine that the car has, about 600 brake horsepower from that, but a 400 horsepower or so boost. The grid. Clear the grid immediately. Eduardo Freitas. To start the formation lap of the six hours of full Please clear the grid immediately. And still, that grandstand is filling up grandstand that we are in actually as people begin to take their seats further back down the grid that's down towards turn one and it's absolutely packed you can see the blue in the middle of that picture they are all Toyota supporters absolutely they've all come decked out in team jackets and hats the merchandise stalls have been doing a roaring trade lots of Ferrari fans here Bullshit as well too. yeah Henri Pescarolo the Grand Marshal the man for whom in endurance racing terms the word legend is simply not enough uh, quite right he's race been after a cracking time he's this been week, loving it he? he's raced been here before of course he, uh, 1968 his first race here uh, in a factory march he was telling us uh, back in the days when the start finish straight you see now was longer still went over a crest beyond turn one and down into the banking which is still here start of the formation lab for the six hours of Fuji. and uh, as Henri actually said at the press conference pre-race when you actually have that experience this long, long straight down into that bowl, uh, you know, a legacy of its uh, original purpose here as a NASCAR circuit was planned here. It was never completed that way. Uh, you understood the term kamikaze. Yes, that got a good laugh. Let's remind you of the grid then. Sebastian Buemi on pole for Toyota with Weber alongside of them. It's Le uh, Lieb and Ka uh, Kaznakajima. Lotterer and Duval will be the starting uh, drivers for Audi on row three. Then Matthias Besch and Dom Kreheimer for Rebellion, who have row four to themselves. Pole position, KCMG inherit that pole position. The Alex Imperatori starts the car. Championship leaders pushed back uh, and... Oh, sorry, Paul said to push back. The championship leaders will have to come in for a three-minute stop and go for using their fourth engine Other of the car. season. Other car. It's 27. It's the championship leading okay. car. It's the same championship leading team, but uh, it's the 27 car that, uh, that leads the championship. Courtesy has very good results for them in points terms at the moment. And pretty good results at Cota as well. So the great part about that, John, is these guys have got to push. Pole position for Fernando Reis in the 99 Aston Martin in Pro and in Am. Pedro Lamy in the 98 car and has York Bergmeister in the Pro Porsche behind him. Pedro Lamy will start that car. A couple of drivers that didn't make the qualifying standard. Christoph Bouchou was one of them. Uh, he has been allowed to start to take the race, but not take the race start. Yeah, Brett Curtis, the other in the number 61 Ferrari. So this is down at the lowest point of the circuits, coming into Dunlop. So we go on board with Kaz Nakajima climbing up through the probably nip turned at 13 and then through 14 and 15 that complex two left handers there's the Dunlop chicane you can take an awful lot of curb there if you need to on board with the 91 that is York Bergmeister at the back of the GT field and that was the GTE am Paul Sitter ahead of him watch the red Audi RS5 lights are off pulls off to the right hand side early fantastic two by two formation as the fifth round 
of the FIA World Endurance Championship, the 21st running of an FIA World Endurance Championship race. The series comes of age this weekend. The pool sitter, Seb Buemi, has to stay behind the safety car. Expect a long hold. They're still on red. We've got the green flag in the hands of Henri Pescarolo. Six hours on the clock, and we will race at Fuji this year. It's a very slow start indeed, and this is playing into the hands of the super capacitor on the Toyota, and still we wait. Such a long run to the line, and the whole field have passed us, and now we are racing. And from the outside of the front row, Mark Webber has no answer to the hybrid power of the Toyota as Buemi defends stoutly into the first corner, and there's a touch, and Webber is pushed wide. And it looks like the second Toyota of Kaz Nagajima has a little look down the inside. Porsche is trying. Weber is trying, round the outside, Porsche leads at Fuji, into the Coca-Cola corner, we did not expect that, Mark Weber with a blistering manoeuvre, and the second car coming through there, the third car coming through there is the first of the Audis, Mark Weber down into the hairpin, right in front of us for the first time, and it's side by side, and round the outside comes Andre Lotterer in the second place, Audi have been hiding their light under a bushel. It's side by side, John, as they go through there, Toyota back up to second, three, three wide, down down into, turn, down into the slow spot the corner, How and Audi lead? leads now. Three manufacturers have led in the first three quarters of a lap, and Andre Lotterer from the third row of the grid, and here comes Buemi, back again on the inside, getting some heat into the tyres maybe, using the hybrid power differently. This has been a remarkable race, and Mark Webber up the inside of 15, you can't do that, Mark, that's impossible. Uh, well, not for him, apparently. <laughs> into the final corner of the first lap. We're going to go for a lie down and leave you for 20 minutes after this. This has been completely bonkers. And Audi are going to lead the first lap of the six hours of Fuji Speedway. I said the championship was coming of age. Look at this power from the Toyota in second. The Audi is very slow. That's the trouble. Car. The two cars in trouble, John. Let's have a listen. So Buemi back in the lead, and here's the Rebellion going through as well. Rebellion ahead of the number one Audi. They are so quick at the end of the straights, the Rebellion. In the GT categories, Jimmy Bruni's got to the lead for Ferrari, Ferrari ahead of Fernando Ruiz. How did he do that? He was behind some of the AM cars. And in the AM category, it's Pedro Lamy from Jerome Blegamol and taking his first start, indeed his first competitive drive in a Ferrari. And now we see the power of the Toyota engine without the hybrid, as the number 12 of Matthias Besch takes the position from that number two car. Something not right with Andrea Lotterer, who had such a great start. And there's a Porsche in the pit lane, it's the 92 two car. car. It's two the 92 car. car in the pit lane. And that was uh, that was started by Patrick Peeler, so maybe he did have a problem with the lights again this weekend after his uh, not too clever outing. Well, we've got them on. astounding scenes at the back of this LMP1 uh, grid, John, with the Audis duking it out with the Rebellions. Now, the number two car lost a huge amount of ground down the start-finish straight, but has actually recovered past the P2 cars. Is now back with the Rebellions. I have not a clue what happened on that first lap. It was too, too very, 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 very strange. We saw cars losing huge amounts of momentum out of turns. And it looks like we've got another car coming in as well. The... Well, the cars go through to complete the second lap, and it's Buemi from Weber from Nakajima, Toyota Porsche, Toyota. Duval, oh, and it is a puncture on the back of the 92 car of Patrick Pile, and it's damaged the rear wheel arch as well. So a new Michelin on the back of there. An auspicious start for the better place of the two Porsches. And there's some blue paint on the side of that car, blue and orange paint. Now, that to me would say Aston Martin, and indeed there was an Aston Martin in the middle of the road there. It's and that's the, the road car. It's the, the 97 car. It's the, the 97 car. car. And the 97 car hit one of the team cars as well. Yeah. So, uh, to say there was an action packed first lap here, John, but car 37 is getting its uh, stop, three minute stop and go penalty immediately. Uh, but to say there was uh, plenty of action in that first lap would be an understatement, wouldn't it? Yeah. But uh, what we've effectively got now are two groups of P1 cars. It's the lead four, uh, which are the Totas and the Porsches in the order 8, 20, 7 and 14. Buemi, Weber, Nakajima and Lieb. And uh, the start now under investigation, we're hearing. And then it's the Audis 
with the number one car, Luke Naval, ahead of both of the Rebellions, and still Andre Lotterer unable to get by the two Rebellions. In P2, Alex Imperatori leads from pole position. Olivia Plan, the 26 G drive car in second, has uh, just knocked Nick Manassian down a place in the 27 car. Kira Lanigan in uh, fourth position. And Gustavo Jakobin already up to 15th position from the wow. back of the grid. That's a heck of a drive from Jakobin. He's only got uh, Jimmy Bruni, who's leading the pro class in GT. Uh, and we've been bicycling spectators now. We've uh, now got, uh, yep, Lotterer managed to get past the number 13 car, now closing back in on the number 12 Rebellion. That car at the moment running in sixth position. But uh, it would seem clear that Andre Lotterer has got some kind of issue the number two car led the race in the first lap and then dropped back dramatically at the completion of that lap. Fastest lap last time around for Mark Lieb in fourth place in the 14. There is the 92 car. That's still catching bodywork, isn't it, on that uh, left rear tyre. And he's going to have to come back in again. And this has not been a great start to the race for Patrick Peelet. Contact with an Aston Martin, the 97 car on the first lap. He's had an awful couple of weekends, hasn't he? Yeah, 97 car started by Darren Turner, of course. Effectively the lead Aston Martin, if you will, in terms of experience with he and Stefan Mucha at the wheel of that car. So, we've still got five hours and 54 <laughs> minutes to go. <laughs> and I do feel as though I could do with a lie down now. This is supposed to be endurance racing, fellas, not an 18 minute sprint. Leaders in GT down at Dunlop, and it is Jimmy Bruni with Fernando Rees now Closing in on him in third place is David Rigon because the third car in that line, the second of the Aston Martins, is Pedro Lamy, who's leading the AMP class. And we saw this, we've seen this all the way through until qualifying, Graham. We saw the leading AMP car up at the very front of the GTE field. Side by side action again between Audi and Rebellion as the number two makes his way by George by Matthias Besch. So he must have been past him again, and there's another issue for the 97 car, uh, for the 92 That's Porsche. That's the, the smoke we saw, the dragging body a little earlier. I think they've got a suspension problem on that car, if I'm honest. It was a bit of a clunk, wasn't it? And uh, meantime, Gustavo Jakobin has passed Jimmy Bruni now to go onto the back of that uh, P2 train. We're now back with the lead battle, though, or the lead four, rather, John. This is the fourth place car, number 14. Ahead of him is Kaz Nakajima in the Toyota. And you can just see it going up the turn. 16 ahead of them are the two leaders, Weber and Buemi. Top four, uh, still within nine seconds into the garage for the 92 Porsche, says Louise Beckett in my uh, right ear from the pit lane. Thank you, Louise. You'll see and hear more of Louise later on. Buemi, 128-1. And that's the whole P1 field bar the Lotus on the start finish straight line astern, but it's a 1.4 kilometre line astern. The top four, though, separated by, what, four seconds there? Now, we're expecting something in the region of 36 laps from the leading cars, perhaps even 37 for the Toyotas. Porsche perhaps not quite there on that. Through goes the CLM, and then side by side across the line is the battle for the lead in P2. Going down to turn one now as Imperatore is under pressure from Olivier Pla. And there is the visual confirmation. Great pickup from the guys in the truck. Thank you. And it's just about held on by Imperatore. I did think Pla got his nose ahead there for I a moment, I think Grim. he did. I think he did. I think he just lifted out that. Just a quick shot. The Lotus ahead. This is Olivier Pla. Wait and see where we might see Olivier next year. Uh, one of the quickest guys, one of the most talented racers on this whole field. And here's the battle for the lead in GTE now. And this is championship leader Jimmy Bruni. Well, Jimmy took his opportunity on lap one when there was that schmozzle and kerfuffle right here on the circuit, picked his way through uh, and managed to uh, get by, what, two or three cars to lead the race at the end of the first lap in GTE Pro. It's been a good comeback from Fernando Reese, who was clearly held for a while. Now, this is the 37 car. Start of the weekend, they put their fourth engine of the season in. Victor Scheikar, Anton and Kira Ladigin in the SMP Racing number 37 car. They knew they had to take this three-minute penalty. It's going to equate to a couple of laps. So you take it early and then hope that 
issues befall other people, I guess is the only thing you can say about that. Still watching the lead for GTE Pro, Jimmy Bruni in the 51 red Ferrari from the Gulf coloured Aston Martin racing of Brazilian Fernando Reis. I was saying before the race start, Graham, what a season he's had and he's really coming of age now and challenging as they start to drag up the hill. This is a little bit further back. This is the in battle Am. second position in GTM. This is Jerome Plikemolen in the number 61 AF Corsa car. And behind him is uh, Nicky Team making his comeback after a race away from the Dane train, the number 95 championship leading young driver AMR car. And these guys are right among the pro drivers and down the inside at Panasonic, turn 16. A classic Fuji maneuver by Nicky T and immediately look at him pulling in the middle of the road. He's trying to break the tour for the two Ferraris that are behind him. That's Ant, uh, that's Bertolini behind yes. them. So that is second, third and fourth. And Bertolini getting a double tour down the front straight as the leaders begin to come round into this battle. We've had just uh, seven laps and three wide. That's second, third and fourth and Bertolini's down the inside. Well, there you go, Andrea Bertolini, very uh, highly experienced indeed in Ferraris. It's uh, it's own bleaker moment. Here's the leaders, and, and that's what it looks like when the leaders catch you up. On board with Buemi, danger time, coming into turn three in the quarter corner curves. He'll go around the outside of the right hander here. It's dangerous because those cars do move over on you, just like has happened there from Bertolini. But look at the extra grip. A little bit of dirt thrown up there as Buemi had to go off oh, line. Bit of there. Lost the grip on the tyres for a moment as he went into the hairpin. Now he'll have to do exactly the same around the flat out right handers of 100R and down towards the Dunlop chicane at the bottom of the hill. And Mark Webber is not losing any ground at all here. This is the leader in traffic with Mount Fuji shrouded in a little cloud. Just looking over to the west side of the racetrack to complete then lap number eight. And it is Seb Wemi leading by about a second from Mark Webber. And in fact, Webber's closed down on him as he comes out of 15. Had a better in the traffic there. And this is going to be interesting now down the main stu ha how much, straight. How much hybrid has Webber got? Because if he's saved a little bit here, he'll get a big boost. The Toyota going away, going away. We look to our right. Oh, there's traffic again. Now you'll see the Porsche start to make up ground. Nearly 200 miles an hour for these cars going down the straight. And Weber has got target acquired down into turn one. Takes a slightly tighter line in. Compromises exit slightly. Now you're dropping downhill quite significantly here and there's more traffic ahead. And remember, that's battling traffic as well as they go into turn three in the quarter corner, corner for the ninth time. And the sharp contrast to the last race, John, this shows how these cars, which are mechanically and electrically very different, how they behave very differently on different parts of the circuit and on different circuits. These same two cars, leagues apart in terms of early race pace at Cota, uh, here, Sebastian Buemi just cannot shake off Mark, uh, Mark Webber. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whose tyres have the better longevity. They use their tyres differently as well. Remember, Porsche didn't do the extra three or four laps at the end of the qualifying session. This is P2, battle for the lead again and again. The orange, black and white coupe of G-Drive Racing under the tutelage of Olivier Pla tries to go around Alex Imperatore back in the KCMG team and he was having none of it. He didn't block, he didn't even defend, he was just later on the bricks. Great stuff from Imperatore. He's doing really very well indeed to fend off the hugely experienced, hugely quick Oli Pla in the, and the young, let's face it, the more modern car here. This amp power at the head of the P2 field and they're catching the CLM, the Lotus team car. As that goes past the that is the 92 car with the damage to the left rear, 92 Porsche. And the two uh, P2 leaders, by the way, pulled away by about three seconds from Nick Manassian, uh, who is something in the region of 12 seconds ahead of Gustavo Jagerman coming up from the back of the grid in the York car. Back at the front of the field in the Oak car. Back at the front of the field, and Mark Webber once again, he does like to have a bit of clear track ahead of him, Mark, and he's... Uh, Got the tractor beam again on the back of the blue and white Toyota as they head downhill towards the Dunlop Chicane. Oh, look at this. <laughs> this is the battle for fourth, I think, isn't it? For third and fourth. 
in uh, GT Am. Fourth and fifth. Yeah. Great stuff up down the hill. I think we may, by the way, as we watch this battle, have got uh, the answer to the problem for the number two Audi at the start. Uh, Luke Wills via Twitter suggesting, I think he's right, I think the Audi ran out of hybrid. And ah. we know what happens when that, it basically, like you said, John, it just it just looks like the car stopped. It's still going very quickly, but I think you're right, Luke. I think that's exactly what happened. Good call at DSC editor at Spectatainment. We'll try and keep our eyes on that as well, but frankly, dare we take it off the action <laughs> on the track. As oh, into the pit lane comes Mark Webber. Mark Webber is in the pit lane in the number 20 Porsche from second position when he came in. Of course, he's already been usurped by Kaz Nakajima. Toyota one and two now. And let's see what goes on. Well, it's fuel, you'd expect that. No panic. New set of Michelin tires, slicks of course, about to go on. No start the dollies. And it's gonna be a full set of tires. Now, are they just getting out of sequence, or have they had an issue? You would have to guess at this stage of a slow puncture. Or the tyres, which they had a worry about, have just done too much. I wonder if they were on the wrong compound from qualifying. Slick, that could be the other thing. Stop there, though, from Porsche. Mark's on the way. Takes a quick look down at the gauges, and away he goes. Fourth place now for Loic Duval. Well, that, that's... Hmm. That's throwing a curveball at me. We'll see if Louise can find out the thinking behind that. Uh, looking at that car, they had the right-hand side door up, and I don't think... I need to see the 20 car again, but I think the seal is sticking up, or something is sticking up from the right-hand side door. Meantime, the battle. Now, we're, we're hearing from Louise Becker down in the pit lane, exactly as Graham Goodman of DailySportsCar.com surmised. Uh, Mark, quite happy to continue, but from the data, a slow puncture. Meantime, trouble potentially for the GT Pro leading 51 Ferrari. Car 51 is under investigation. Track limits abuse with advantage, yeah. says Race Control. Let's keep an eye on that one. And that is the battle we're looking at at the moment as they go past us again in the commentary box just to drive us left. There's the confirmation. Down into turn number one for Jimmy Bruni. I'm sure what he's going to say is, it was carnage in front of me. I had to drive round and not drive through it. Oh, change for the lead, is the no, not quite. It's Olivier Pla and Alex Imperatoria side by side. The G-Drive car on the left-hand side with the roof is ahead, and we do have a change of lead. Coming onto the start, finish straight. Imperatori, though, right in the wheel tracks, almost pushing them along. Oh, he's pushing him into the wall. He's eased over to the right. That's really naughty of Olivier Pla. Dirty tyres now for the car on our left, the red, white and blue car. But well, he's, he's got the position. Can he get it stopped? though? No, he can. And that's a great piece of driving from Imperatore. Interesting to see that what should have been the aerodynamically more efficient coupe not. did not have no. the ponies down the front straight when there was no DRS. No Super Mario flap there, that's proper racing. Remember, this is the revised Orica for this year. Uh, new kit from Le Mans onwards, uh, so the 03R. That means they've been able to address performance with the Orica for the first time. It's, uh, these things are homologated for three full years, uh, so it's a more efficient, aerodynamic, aerodynamically efficient Orica now, and it showed there, didn't it, John? Oh, it really did. It really did. And the... Great stuff with these two. Well, I've, I've been impressed by Imperatore. And we've got a penalty for the 75 car coming. And that was for a jump start. That's uh, Mathieu Voxvier. That's the Pro Speed Porsche. Thanks. Look at these P2 cars right up behind the CLM, uh, which was started by James Rossiter. He knows this track very well, of course. Races in Japanese GT. This is going to be a slightly irritating time for the P2 guys because that Lotus is quicker in a straight line than they are. Oh, is it ever? Look see. at that. But unfortunately, it's a brand new car, not had the development yet. Mark Webber puts the fastest lap in the race in 127.7. And we're hearing from Audi via Louise Beckett. He 
Sturgis went a bit too hard early on in the first lap and uh, slowed him down. So I think he did run out of uh, run out of flywheel. Yep. Somebody spun we're down his top. We're about to see the 35 car take its stop go penalty. Correct. This is the uh, second part of its uh, smack on the hand, having too large a restrictor in qualifying. And again, the LMP2 lead battle comes across the back end of that Lotus. I think, is this time James Russell going to let them go? No, he's not. Well, he's battling for position on the circuit. There's no need for him to do that. No, I agree. When yes. they get to the back of the GT battle that they are catching up on at some stage, that could give the opportunity to Imperatori, who, as I was saying, has impressed me mightily this year. Ollie Plot, we all know about, and it's surely time for him to step into a factory P1 programme, and I think that's what you were hinting at. Oh, oh, that's so. a great pass oh. by Imperatori. Oh, but he's, him there's no way that he's going to get around <laughs> coming up to the final corner, uh, but he we'll will get underneath. Now, let's see it the other way around. What happens this time? Does the coupe go through as into the pit lane comes the pro speed car for its jump start penalty? And here's the Lotus, it'll make it three wide. Keep an eye on mirrors, fellas. As Pla gets his nose ahead by the line, but watch the red, white, blue car on our left in the braking area in Muratori. He doesn't even seem bothered by that. He's not, I mean, he's, he's on the. He's on a less than optimum line there into turn one, and it compromises his exit not one bit. He, he is uh, basically what he's what he's got there is, is he just knows the capabilities of that car. Here we go on the outside now. Uh, Olivier Pla takes a look out the outside. He's going by this way, and this time he's trying to use the traffic and the Lotus. That's uh, rather balky than. Oh, the nice! Can't do. Oh, it's a touch, touch there. That's the yes. 90 Ferrari the Star Wars, the uh, Starworks car. And that might well have given, uh, that was the Imperatory on the Starwoods car. Both continued, but it's given Pla another chance to get alongside. Can he do it this time? He can't. It's star, uh, of course, now for that car. Oh, and almost to a dead stop there by Oli Pla. Now, the worry will be the left-hand side of that leading moment. car. And he's got past the Lotus again on the twisties. Kind of needs to throw a rope onto the back of it as he goes by, doesn't he? This is giving uh, Nick Manazian an opportunity to close up on this pair. In third position, LMP2. That is the championship leading team. The leader's coming up on this battle as well. But Wemi, of course, knows nothing of what's been going on before, and he's got to pick his way through this. This is going to be interesting. So, Buemi presses the go button. Yeah. Now, let's have a look at this again. Imperatori. Already through. Was there a second touch there? I don't think there was. I think Pla stood on it so much that he was okay. Got on the brakes quickly. Through turn one then with the leader of the motor race with still five hours and 37 minutes to go. As in comes the 35 to serve the second part of its penalty for the big restrictor in quality. Here is the P2 leader. That headlights behind is Alex Imperatori closing up on the number 91. There is... Gustavo Jakobsen. And away goes Red Bull helmet, Gustavo. Hello to everybody who's uh, joining us around the world. I hear that uh, other motor races have been suspended for problems with the track surface. And that uh, new track surface at Mount Panorama. So if you are just joining us, you've missed an absolutely unbelievable first 20 odd minutes uh, of this race with the lead changing, I think, four times, possibly even five on the three, first lap. Three leaders on the first lap. Yeah, yeah, three different leaders, yeah, absolutely. Three different All three manufacturers uh, in the LMP1. I think we had three leaders in the first corner. It seemed that way. This is the battle for LMP, excuse me, for GTE Pro. And it is still Jimmy Bruni then that leads that. The Aston Martin in second place is Fernando Reese. Now let's have a look at another angle here of an incident further back of the Porsche going wide and missing the Dunlop chicane there. As Jimmy Bruni has his mirrors full of Brazilian driven Aston Martin. Jimmy Bruni has just been a star in GT2, GTE as it's called now. Former European champion of course with Rob Bell for GMW Motorsport. 
They owned that series for a couple of three years, didn't they? Yeah, and very similar looking dudes, those two at times. It's uh, Rob Bell is the Geordie, Jimmy Bruni. <laughs> Jimmy is Bruni. Jimmy Bruni not the Italian, the Italian Rob, Rob Bell? Yes, scary. Paul Delalana there, and uh, Christopher Nygaard in the foreground, just briefly, keeping a weather eye on this. Paul Dallalana's done a good job this year as well, he has. hasn't he? And enjoying his motor racing, big smile on his face yesterday, watching qualifying. Not heard anything more about the improving position by going off the track for Jimmy Bruni. Well, we haven't heard it's been no further action either, not NFA'd just as yet. Final corner with faster traffic coming behind these guys. This is danger time for the battle at the front of the field. That's the battle for P2 lead as well, having just been passed by the faster cars. And Mark Webber is still on a tear, by the way. That's uh, Davidi Rigon in the 71 Ferrari, the make of the way pass. And uh, again, they come down this astonishing start finish straight. There's the Porsche in the foreground. Two Aston Martins, then the P2 battle. Not close enough this time, surely, for Olivier Pla to have a dive down the inside. And we're clearly, John, with this battle in the realms of pressure, pressurising a mistake, an error, a fumble, stumbling over traffic, but uh, this is by far not done yet. Great stuff in P2, great stuff at the lead in P1. Uh, GT Pro close as well, and here we have the two GTE Am Aston Martins in line of stern. 1-2 at the moment, Pedro Lamy leads, leads Nicky team, and here we go again in P2, and again, Oli Pla look, likes the look of a try around the outside, that's not gonna work. Now past the GT Am leader, Imperatori makes it by with no difficulty. Pla, though, takes it up the inside, oh. closes a little, but not enough. Do you know, I'm giggling there because I just remembered somebody asking me again yesterday, how do you guys find things to talk about for six hours? Well, there's always the weather. Just, uh, just watch the pictures. <laughs> it's really not difficult. Tremendous stuff from all four classes of racing. Let's run you down who's leading what. It's Jimmy Bruni in GTE. Pro with uh, Fernando uh, Reese, what a second or so behind, and Pedro Lamy, Nicky team uh, for Aston Martin, battling out for honours in GTE Am with uh, half a second between them. Alex Imperatori and Oli Pla, half a second between them. And the biggest gap on the track at the moment is between first and second. The two Toyotas, Sepuimi in the eight and Kaz Nakajima in the seven. And behind that is that's three seconds. That's what three seconds looks like on the track between the two Toyota hybrid racing cars. And then a further eight seconds back is Mark Leib with Loic de Val, the best of the Audis, in fourth position at the moment, some 20 seconds back. And his teammate, another four seconds behind him. The Audis at the moment not getting under the magic 90 second mark, whilst both of the Toyotas are under that regularly. But the battles continue and coming down to turn seven, we can look straight across and down towards this corner now and see the 51 of Jimmy Bruni and the 99 uh, of Fernando Rees continuing to battle it out as again, they've got faster traffic coming through. I think we may have had a change for GTM. I've got a feeling that maybe it's out at turn one. It is, Nicky team's gone through. Yeah, and there's a change there through turn one. So we're gonna get a new GTM leader. But meanwhile, all classes in that little battle there, John. Yeah, we've got uh, three out of the four classes that we're looking at there. We just need a GT Pro car in there to make it a full set. Then we can call Bingo and go home. The <laughs> oh, and off the, off the track there for the Ferrari. Yeah. That's a change in lead. And that is the fumble in traffic that we were talking about. And Fernando Rees needed no second invitation there as he goes through. And Jimmy Bruni will not be best pleased that the was the York racing car and the no, I don't think Audi that just pushed him a little bit wide uh, into 15. Uh, well, you know, let's have a well, look at again. Get a, another chance. It is the York car. He's no, he's just he's yeah. kind of frightened him off the yeah, track, hasn't so. he? Yeah. I, I didn't think there was contact. I think he was distracted. I think he missed his turning point. What was I saying yesterday? As soon as you get half a car's width too wide at 15, the camera stops helping you, and it's going the wrong way, and you actually get pulled off onto the dirt. That's exactly what's happened there for Jimmy Bruni. But in fairness, he could go half a car length to his left because there was a rather pretty leisure coupe there. So half an hour's gone and uh, 
Start, start writing your race report. Plenty of action so far. It is Seb Buemi that leads, coming up on the back of the Pro Speed Porsche in the turn 16 Panasonic. Toyota's taken a much shallower entry into the final corner as Rob Loitman, one of the headmen from Toyota in Cologne, watches on rather laconically. Watch the speed here. Expect to see that getting up to somewhere near 300 clicks. There it is, 304, 305, 306, 307, 309. 309. That's as quick as I've seen from the Toyota all weekend. And that's 100 and it's about 190 miles, 90 an, miles hour. an hour. Yeah. And look at the green bar. That is the super capacitor. 3.1 megajoules allowed per lap and tends to be programmed into where you use it. There's no push to pass here. Down to turn six and seven. Don't get too greedy on the inside. Let the car drift out and breathe. Now, flat out through the next two right kinks. Here's the start again. See if we can see the jump start further back from the Proton car. There it is on the right-hand side, about three quarters of the way back. Well, he didn't seem to get any advantage because there was somebody right in front of him. This is the fantastic view from the number two of Lotterer, who took the lead early on, and here's where he did it. Oh, what a manoeuvre! Down into Dunlop Corner, and Dr Wolfgang Ulrich, very animated there. Then it was the turn of Toyota to be excited. Porsche had their moment in the sun as well with Mark Webber, and there he is down in sixth position at the moment. After a slow puncture dulled his progress at the front of the field, he was pushing Buemi within a second, and it's come down to two seconds at the head of the field, by the way. He's been a good addition to Porsche, as exactly as we expected he would. He's come back in, he's approached this in the measured calculating manner that we would have expected from a driver who has the thinking capabilities of Mark. Yeah, up to six, back up to second position after that uh, stop for the change of tyres. Uh, made his way through the P2 field. This is the 37 car ahead of him that's laps down. So he is now back into sixth position. But a wee way back, of course, from the rest of the factory cars. About a minute's delay in that pit stop. Look at how difficult it is to get by the uh, 37 P2 car. They need to make a virtue of this, Graham, and that, and that is possible, isn't it, in a long race? They're off strategy with everybody else, so do something different. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This stage, it's about going quickly and using the space you've actually got. You're not involved in an immediate battle, so watch the clock. Kaz Nagajima begins to close down on his teammate, Sebastian Boemi. We're not yet in the pit stop window. Expect probably mid-30s from the Porsche, 36 or 37 from the... Toyota and possibly the same from the Audi. The key is not necessarily the fuel strategy, but the tyre strategy. Remember that you can't change tyres while you are fueling. In comes Darren Turner in the 97 Aston Martin into the pit lane. Now he has dropped down to fifth position in pro yeah, in doing that, that after that incident earlier on. That's right. In fact, even though we've got uh, Darren on pit lane, three of the top four GTEs are Aston Martins at the moment, John. It's the leader of GTE Pro, then Jimmy Bruni, then both of the GTM cars yeah. ahead of the next pro car, which is the second Ferrari, Davide Vigon, at the moment at the wheel of the 71. Back, though, with the P1 battle, and it's the number seven in car now. That is uh, Kaz Nakajima looking at the eight-star Ferrari, and two cars ahead is the leader. Now look at the hybrid going down. Going into the garage, by the way, for Darren Turner. Right, down to Dunlop. Oh, look at this. Buemi struggling with a little bit of rear grip there. Can't get the power on as early as Nakajima, who saved a little bit of his 
you saw just how quickly that recharged as well. That is the advantage. Leader caught in traffic now with three GTE cars. And Nakajima has a decision. Left, right, and nah, straight down the middle. And he's onto the tail end of the leader. He takes a little bit of a tighter line onto the start finish line. Bang! There goes a thousand horsepower from Sebastian Buemi. Thousand horsepower deployed by Nakajima. Two thousand horsepower of Toyota goes past us and heads towards turn one at the sharp end of 190 miles an hour just over before they break for turn one. 310, I saw, just flicker up for a moment there. And Kastakajima really does now have target acquired, doesn't he? This is a race. Let's not forget here for a minute. This is not team orders. This is a race. These guys will be battling for it. Kaz will want to take a win here at speed. He oh, was just very, a bit. He was very pleased, of course, to be given the trophy last year, but very clear that uh, it wasn't the way he wanted to win it. But don't forget, it's the eight car ahead in the championship, isn't it? It is indeed. So that would make sense at the moment. But Toyota are owning this race. Anthony Davison telling me uh, yesterday in a, an interview for RadioLeMond.com as we look at the damage on the 97 Aston Martin, that's not how it came out of Pro Drive, is it? No. And there's going to be a massive aerodynamic disadvantage there. Cracked headlight glass, and that's why that car's come back in. Never mind the handling issues, that's going to slow you up down a very long straight here. Splitter damage, I think, John. Yeah. Front splitter is coming off that car. Not, not the work of the moment. moment. They say in unison. Let's just go back to what Anthony Davidson was telling me uh, yesterday. Just saying that he feels they should have won Le Mans and they should have won in Texas. The car had the pace to win both of those. He's slightly frustrated about things that happen that you have no control over and uh, understands that. He said, I don't ask for good luck, I just ask for no bad luck. And I thought that was an interesting that's, that's distinction. Of, uh, that's that, that's the, the next LMP1 driver along to talk about luck out of Alan Nish's quote, which is... There is no such work, thing as luck. The yeah. luckier I get. There is no such thing as luck, is what McNish would say. There's only preparation. So, Toyota ruling the roost at the moment with a 10-second lead. Uh, over Mark Lee in third place for Porsche. Then the two Audis, pretty much in unison, and now they are beginning pace. to... Now, he's interesting. Remember I said the Audis weren't getting under the 90-second mark? Well, now they are, towards the end of the stint. And what is going to be crucial here is whether the tyres will go another stint for Audi and whether they will for Porsche and Toyota. Uh, I think I not think, for Toyota. I think not for Toyota. Uh, I think not for Toyota, uh, I think probably not for Porsche either, John, uh, but possibly for Audi. And this is where Louis Louise down the pits is going to be pretty critical, find out what's actually going on in terms of strategy. Potential race-winning moment uh, in those pit stops. So you're right, in terms of overall pace, the, the Audis are coming back into it now, but there's that near 30-second gap uh, from the leader. 25 seconds. Well, but you'll make that up in tyres. Oh, you absolutely will. It's about 25, 26 seconds for a regular pit stop. And interestingly, we've said this before as well, as the tyres go away at the end of the stint for the Toyota, the Audi's pr progress will certainly they won't lose any more. They might even grab a couple of seconds back as they seem to have better and more consistent tyre wear. Now, this could all be thrown into complete uproar when the Toyotas don't take tyres, and we all look foolish, three wide, going into turn three for a moment there. With Rebellion, Toyota, 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 and Aston Martin. But that is the joy of what we're looking at here. And simply put, we don't know. Um, it, they don't have coloured bands on the tyres that tells us how much they are wearing down. There's the two Audis battling for fourth and fifth. And at the moment, playing a very different game from everybody else. But, but there's only the people behind the wall know. And I love the fact that this isn't... Uh, made too easy for us to follow in the fact that these guys might be on slightly different compounds, might be doing slightly different things with their pressures but only they know that only do they, they, and they we'll only do. see it when it plays out in the pit stop I think, you know, they, I think they would have been surprised to have got so close to the front as they did and that seemed to come and it'd be good to see it again at some point seemed to come with a bit of a uh, bit of a problem for one of the, the Porsches breaking to the left through turn one gave Andre Lotter a, a chance as we see the uh, final prep for the refettled 97 car I think I'll be soon back out on pit road ah, what would you do without tie wraps and racer tape and a four pound lump hammer. 
Well, there is Andrea Lotterer, briefly a race leader here. Now, Paul Truswell wouldn't score him as a race leader because he didn't get across the line of the lead, of course. And he wouldn't say that there was five lead changes on that first lap. Look at the speed of the Audi. Remember what we saw before, 310. And we're not going to see that here. That is something in the region. It was three, it just ticked into 300. Nine or ten kilometres down the straight slow for the Audi. Here the spinning up of the flywheel. Remember, hybrid flywheel power for Audi with a diesel engine. Super capacitive power with a 3.7 V8 petrol engine, normally aspirated for Toyota. And battery power with a two-litre turbocharged engine for Porsche. Here's the Aston Martin back out of the pit lane for Darren Turner, having been in there for around about seven and a half minutes. Big patch of race tape on the front right corner of the Aston Martin. It's now about what you can get with that car. It's about yep. points. It's got a very pirate look about it now, hasn't it? <laughs> Almost uh, with a patch over the eye. It's uh, Stefan Mucker who has... Uh, jumped back into that car. I know that because Louise is about to talk to Darren Turner in the Aston Martin pit. Darren, the team has done a great job getting the car back out there. What happened? Yeah, the guys have done a great job. There's a lot of damage to the splitter there. Um, so I managed to get a good run on the, on the inside into turn one. Uh, but with the medium tyre that we're running in this uh, temperature, it just wasn't working as well as I hoped. And uh, Fernando, he sort of gave enough room on the outside, but I was all locked up and slightly out of control by that point. So, unfortunately, hit the side of Fernando. That spanned me, and then I had a bit of contact with uh, Porsche, I think, which did the damage to the splitter. So, uh, an unfortunate start to the race. Uh, luckily, uh, the 99 car and Fernando managed to carry on and are still up front. But for me and uh, Stefan and the crew on the 97, it's, uh, it's a disappointing start to the race. And... Uh, Obviously, now we're back out there running, but a lot of laps down on the lead. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not really a great, great uh, Japanese race for us at the moment. Thank you. Darren Turner looking as sick as the Pirates Parrot, yep. if it's got the Pirate look about it. And just noticing on the screen, by the way, that Jimmy Bruni, and there is the message coming through from Race Control, reported now to the stewards. It was being investigated before, if you remember. Now he's been reported, one can only presume, Graham, that that will have some kind of penalty. You would have thought so, wouldn't you? Uh, just kudos to Darren there. It's not often you'll hear a race driver willingly admit that actually there was a bit of an error there. And uh, I think he's feeling probably quite lucky that it didn't spin number 90 car, nine car as well. We knew the cars were starting on uh, different tyres. We've got the Rebellion 12 car on pit lane for the moment, John, as well. And we can see it now as the car pulls to a stop. It's as Besh at the wheel. There'll be no driver change here. I think this is just a regular stop. Uh, fuel. Are we going to see tyres? No tyres ready, and I think the car will be sent. We're checking the car over, pit lane, as we watch still that LMP2 battle out there, John. And still, Olivier Pla can do nothing about Alexander Imperatori. Well, Imperatori here with one of, if not the best P2 driver of the last four or five seasons sitting in behind him. Now, all right, they're not in the same machinery, but you can only race the people who are there. And I I feel that Imperatori's stock is going up massively here. He's been under pressure three or four times from Olivier Pla behind him in that very, very impressive Licia Coupe. But he has weathered the storm and in fact, he's more than done that because he hasn't just hung on. He's been cool, calm and collected. I've been very impressed. He has. I think he's going to be right on Hugh Deshonak's Christmas card list because he's going to do wonders for the uh, for the, the, kind of, the marketing efforts of Oregon. Oh, no! Why does I say that? Oh, oh you, the commentator's curse is the 88 car and uh, Bachelor, Klaus Bachler turns him around and that is the lead of P2. Uh, that, is, that is endurance racing multi-class racing encapsulated in such a moment 
Now, Klaus Backler will get a penalty for that. He, he absolutely has to, but he doesn't get the position back. I'm not sure, John. Well... I'm not sure. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I think that was certainly at best 50-50. That was, uh, yeah, it was a very risky move around the outside there. I'm not quite sure where Backler was supposed to go. Uh, he was issue certainly taking a wider line. Yeah, your issue, of course, is they're breaking in different places. They really do. Um, much later for the P2 cars, but then they stop very, very quickly. And having seen that again, I'll, I'm going to say that Klaus Backler didn't do much wrong there. He held his line and went to the towards the apex of the corner. And then for Rattori, having just praised him, perhaps just felt feeling the pressure from behind. The other point, by the time that actually Imperatore was making the move, there was no real place for Backler to go because Plow was up his inside. And, and also Backler would already have been breaking. He would have been breaking earlier than the prototype car. Under investigation, as you might uh, imagine, that incident. There is Kaz Nagajima. Getting ready to celebrate his 30th birthday soon and picking his way through traffic. Has, didn't really get any closer than the second or so that he got uh, just inside about 1.3 seconds, didn't he? Now it's back out to 2.1 from Mark Lieb in third. 8, 7 and 14, Toyota, Toyota and Porsche. Then the two Audis, one and two. And Mark Webber still hanging on to the end of the lead lap after that unfortunate slow puncture earlier on for the Aussie. Having led the race, unexpectedly, I think it's fair to say. It's absolutely fair. Buiri got a hell of a shock there, didn't he? <laughs> he must have thinking, hang on, what have I done wrong here? I've done everything they told me to do. And they said, don't worry, if you do all of this and push these buttons in the right way, it'll then be fine. it'll all be fine. And he got <laughs> mugged on that first lap. He went down to third at one stage. I but think he was fourth at one stage. He, uh, he I might think be he right. was fourth. He was. <laughs> it'll all be all right on the night. Big time in, uh, this is the number eight car. This is our leader again, Sebastian Buemi. Now watch, as he goes across the line, he'll get some of that power back on the little green tower on the left-hand side. That's not because he miraculously has just had it there, it's because he's used his allowance and now he gets it back again. Although he's harvesting at this current moment, of course. Oh, in comes the 26 car. This is the new leader, very recent leader, G-Drive. Racing's car. So Nick Manassian becomes the third leader in LMP2. Two Aston Martins changing position there, but not in the same class. That's Nicky Team and Fernando Reese. They switch position on the leaderboard, but uh, Fernando Reese continues to lead the pro category. So Nicky Team Graham is now leading the GT cars with an amp car. Wow. The Dane train is on full chuff, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is got, he's got the throttles wide open for this one. Here we and go. There he comes across the line and will be scored as the leading GTE car. There's Fernando Reese leading the pro category. Identical specification cars. Of course, yes. And uh, it is the bemulleted Dane, Nicky Team, last year's Porsche Wickham champion, of course. And now, uh, oddly enough, as well as an Aston Martin factory driver here, uh, an Audi factory driver too in the customer racing efforts. And here comes Alex Imperatore. So we're into the LMP2 pit cycle now. And. Uh, I have to say, to that point, a fantastic stint for Imperatore. A couple of laps more, he'd be fate as a hero. He'd be dancing in the streets of Switzerland tonight, but uh, unfortunately... I don't think that's allowed no. in Switzerland. That's far too much like having fun. There is Imperatore in the pit lane. And there is the 27 car of Nick Manassian. No further action. Oh, quick decision from the stewards. That's very good. No further action on the 47 car of Imperatore and the 88 Proton car, which I think we said had Klaus Backler at the wheel. It did. We're still waiting to find out whether or not there'll be consequences for Jimmy Rooney. 
taking advantage, track limits. That's taken rather longer. Right, let's have a look at what Audi are doing at the moment in the shape of Andre Lotterer in fifth position. There's the washing machine spinning up as he goes down. That's what it sounds like, though. It, it sounds like a spin does. dryer. Apparently, it's pretty bizarre having this thing spinning at a bazillion revs next to your uh, left elbow encased in carbon fibre. Jimmy Bruni's in the pit, by the way, out of second place in GTE Pro. Coming up to turn 16 now with Andre Lotterer. He'll stay out wide. Don't cut in too early. There's the CLM in the pit lane. CLM Lotus T129P01 slash 01 slash AER. Yeah. As we're calling it until they tell us what it's actually called. Heidi, I think we've decided to call it. Because it's Cliff. That's right. CLM. Right, now that's uh, out has got from the Ferrari. Let's try and do that in English. Jimmy Bruni has got out from the Ferrari. And so by process of elimination, in has got Tony Verlander. Correct. Another you set a Michelin going on there. Oh, drinks, oh, oh. Drinks bottle rolling. Yeah, there. don't let that out of your pit. Now, this is uh, interesting because after the pace earlier on, of course, we've now got a laugh rebellion in between the two Audis. Blue flag for the number nine, James Rossiter, as he comes back out. Stays so, aboard. Yeah, double stint for him, but not for the tyres. And the hit, this is where it's going to be interesting. Seb Buemi picking up speed all of a sudden. And all the top cars doing 30s and 29s. Except the Audis. Yeah, they've gone out to 32s all of a sudden. Beautiful day for motor racing here. A little bit overcast. Cast, and no threat of uh, this race as it was last year. Ah, the first movement down at Audi. Lucas de Grassi has hopes in the future of becoming the first Brazilian winner of the Le Mans 24 hours, and hopefully, I guess, the first Brazilian winner of the World Endurance Championship. Yeah. Oh, now this is a bit earlier than I expected. The number seven. And this is going to be a full service stop. There was a driver standing in the background there for the number seven which I think was Stefan Sarazan because it wasn't Alex. So Kaz Nakajima, so no double stinting then for that car as in comes the 37. And that is uh, Kirill Ladigin. Of course, there's no reason why they should double stint the drivers as they're changing tyres anyway. Or vice versa. Yeah. If you're changing drivers, you might as well give the incoming driver a new it, set of tyres. It would tend to indicate a full maximum attack tactic, wouldn't it? In comes Gustavo Jakerman for his first regular stop in the 35 as well. We can see that from our position. Nakajima starts to get ready to bail out. He'll pull the radio cord. He's tried twice. He'll have another go in a moment. Into the pit lane. And jabs on the anchors just before the little blue line. Out comes the drink bottle. drinks bottle. Radio cord goes onto a little bit of Velcro on his head. He unfastens the belt, or at least he loosens them off. He doesn't unfasten them. That wouldn't be allowed. Now he unfastens them and pops out. It is indeed Stefan Sarazan, who will climb aboard the number seven car. Uh, he's got his CD changer there, I saw. He's Absolutely. Going. Some his smooth, MP3 player. Smooth sounds. So out of second position then, got as close as about a second to his teammate. And in comes the Audi number two. And this is the one. end of lap 35. So seven, one and two into the pit lane. Now, so we're just waiting for the leader and second place car, the number 14 Porsche, Sick. to complete the pit cycle, of course. Remember, we saw the number 20 Porsche pit a little earlier after its tyre problem. So the key, key point here is, will the Audis take tyres? Neil Yarny getting ready to go into the 14 Porsche. These are important moments for Audi. Change of driver there, but I... And tyres as well. Tyres are ready. No tyres no. for the two. No tyres for the two. Tires That's Andrea Lotterer. Tyres for the one, though, John. They're splitting strategies here. Yeah. So there was tyres at the end of lap 35 for the one and the seven. 
but fuel only for Andrea Lotterer, who stays in the car. Leader in the pits, and uh, Sebastian Buemi is climbing out of the car. It's Anthony Davidson, of course, that will be in, because just two drivers aboard the car this time. Number 14, this is uh, Mark Leap, making his way down to the Porsche pits. So just two guys aboard the eight car this weekend. Nicola Lapierre not with us this weekend, may not make Shanghai either for unspecified personal reasons, but is secure in the team for next year. That's the onboard shot from the number eight, waiting for a driver. Buemi getting a new set of tyres. Did Buemi get out of that? Oh, I know that is indeed a change there. Neil Yanni in the car. This, I'm being told I am required to go down for a meeting with the team manager at KCMG. They've asked me not to comment on their form ever again. Ever again. Alex Imperatore is taking you immediately off his Christmas yep. card list. I can see now, look at the, the guys from the plates. Look at the guys from Audi there Ralph Jutner, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, and Reinhold Joost. That is some kind of brains trust watching what's going on at Porsche. So. The 20 car of Mark Webber will come back through into the lead. And Andre Lotterer has gone out on all tyres. Luca de Grassi already with the fastest middle sector of the race on his outlap. <laughs> so Mark Webber, remember, off kilter with the rest of the LMP1 hybrid cars due to a slow puncture after he led the race early on. Now leads again on lap number 37. And he should be able to go about another 10 laps, I think, before we see him in. Question being asked by Alfred Wallace is, uh, are Audi playing a balanced performance game by including performance breaks in future rounds for the car? Because there's not going to be any. I think we're now frozen, aren't we? Until Le Mans next year, John. Yes. But, uh, so Mark Webber leads the motor race. 25 seconds as they cross the line, but it won't be that. Uh, See Mark now. Look at the rubber on the track behind him. As he comes through to turn one. How far back is Stefan Sarazan? But the two Toyotas are going to be very close together. Here they come now. So the lead gap 25 seconds. And just a second between the seven and the eight cars. So 20. Mark Webber leads Stefan Sarazan. In the number seven Toyota, the number eight Toyota of Anthony Davidson. And next up will be Andre Lotterer. Weber with less fuel in the car, so slightly lighter, but with tyres that have done a little more work. So 46 seconds uh, separates the, the top five. The man of the first part of the race, undoubtedly, Seb Buemi for Toyota, started the race from Paul and held the lead. He's down in the pits now with Louise Beckett. Sebastian, an interesting and challenging start to that race. Yes, it was quite difficult. Um, the temperature is very low and we don't have much grip, so the cars are sliding a lot. But uh, at the end, it was OK, you know. We, we are going for the championship. So we hope we can, you know, keep uh, keep uh, in front of the Audis. Okay, thank you. Keep in front of the Audis. Uh, this points battle is the points battle. Yes. The, the, the issue there is referring to is not about the race position; it's about the championship position. And here again, we look down from one end of this 1.4 kilometres straight to the other. It's not one toe to there; it's two, as you're about to see. Um, just following on from what you were saying about Frozen until 2015. Frozen to 2015 for the manufacturer cars. Correct, P1 cars. And the balance between the different technologies. Correct. There's nothing to say that they couldn't take the restrictor out of the uh, the, P, the P1L cars. The, the issue for the P1L cars is the rampant level of development in P1H. And uh, in terms of pace, it's a balance between power as so the number 90 car makes its way down pit lane between power, John, and between the fuel they're allowed to use. Well, they could give them more fuel. They could. Um, in terms of more fuel allowance of what they could burn, but with no bigger fuel tank, they would have to come in more often. So what you would see there is, uh, and I'll, I'll 
come back to this in a moment. Let's go and have a listen to Stefan Sarazan just in the seven. Gap to Weber, 25 seconds. We expect it to be soon. And uh, gap to Anthony, 0.5. Two very big black lines behind the eight car using all of that uh, horsepower on top. Then, then, what you would get, Graham, is a direct comparison in racing terms between cars that go longer with technology yep. and cars that don't have that technology and have to stop for fuel more often. You can make them faster, it's a question of just balancing them out. Uh, I, I think it is, and what we're expecting to see at the end of this year is we won't have the two classes anymore, we'll have one, LMP1, not LMP1L uh, or LMP1H. At the end of next year? At the end of this year. Right, so, but that means that in the start of the season, running up to Le Mans next year, something has to be done to balance the L cars. Uh, yeah, I mean, the reality, I think, in terms of the, the, the gap in performances, there's not enough that you can do to make enough of a difference and uh, that's a change. That's Anthony Davidson has gone through and looked like he was let through there uh, to second position. So Davidson now takes up the pursuit of Mark Webber. Change for second place. So to finish the point, uh, it, the, to my mind, the, the more obvious way forward if balancing the performance between the cars is the aim, is to slow down the factory cars, but I don't think they're going to do that. No, no, I don't think they'll do that either. I'm just taking a walk to the back of our commentary box so that I can have a look out at the weather coming uh, over the mountainsides. Thank you, Grip, for holding on to my wires. I, I got a, a sniff of damp air there. My motorcyclist nose <laughs> tends, to, uh, tends to tell me when there's rain on the way, the but I've stuff. been wrong so much this week. And when John's nose is damp, you can always tell he's quite healthy, which is good. There's been about three or four times this week when I would have been sure that within the next five minutes we would have had a shower. And I've been proved wrong. The wind has changed and blown it away again. And there's just a little chill in the air coming from behind us. Coming up towards the end of the first hour, in fact, just over an hour's worth of racing done. And what an hour it's been. Mark Webber is leading the motor race for Porsche. And there is the confirmation that the 22 seconds that Mathieu Linnell was telling his drivers. Anthony Davison now up into second place, so it's uh, seven from eight, uh, sorry, eight from seven. And that gap is coming down with the Audis holding a watching brief. Got to watch out for the number two car, didn't take tyres. Aston Martin leading both Am and Pro, and they are that way around on the circuit, with Olivier Pla now confirmed uh, in the lead by something like 17 seconds of P2. And here is the battle for fourth position on the circuit and in the Manufacturer Championship, or Manufacturer Car, should I say, fourth overall. And uh, Tudor Tank Countdown Clock telling me there's just under four hours and 58 minutes to go. And there is a real-time, real-world battle with Andre Lotterer versus Neil Yanni. Two very different approaches to this sports car question. The Audi, diesel, of course, now four litres. Relying much more on the engine and its economy than on the hybrid system. They use, they have less power from the hybrid system than the other two manufacturers. And the Porsche, with a two-litre turbocharged petrol engine and battery powers for its hybrid, goes past the Audi as if it's got a Jerry Bruckheimer gearbox. And he's just kept changing up and changing up and changing. That must be so disappointing <laughs> for Andre Lotterer. Remember, Lotterer is on older tyres. Yeah. Lotterer did not no, change the tyres. That, that wasn't about tyres. That was about the way in which the Porsche and the Audi deliver their power. But watch now, you should see the Porsche uh, it did, is not able to get away from the Audi uh, at the infield. It's in that straight line, the way that the Porsche punches out the corner onto that main start finish straight, where it's just like a drag racer. Quite astonishing punch. But not able to pull away anything like that kind of rate once we get into the more tight, twisty, technical areas of the circuit, John. I, I love the fact that we have this 
variety and that the WEC, the World Endurance Championship and the FI and the ACO have the confidence in their product to not need to tinker with it between now and next season. And basically they're telling the manufacturers, race what you've got, sometimes it'll be your circuit, sometimes it won't be your circuit, and guys, you're gonna have to live with that. And tactically, you might have to make some different decisions. Two leaders in the LMGTE class has come in. So the first hour is in the books here at Fuji Speedway for round five of the 2014 World Endurance Championship in front of Pack Grandstands. The pre-race festivities were well received, but not, I think, anyone expecting the kind of race that we had at the start. Sebastian Buemi leads them away, but watch Mark Webber in the Porsche on the outside. Challenges early, little touch there. Audi going down the inside, trying to get amongst it as well. All three manufacturers battling it out, and Mark Webber uses his experience and goes round the outside into turn three to lead for Porsche in the GTE battle. An internecine incident between two of the Aston Martins at the head of their classes also caught up the 91 Porsche. Still on the first and second lap, and the lead changing out oh, several times. You needed an abacus to keep score of what was going on here. And Porsche led, Toyota led, Audi led, and then running out of hybrid on the front straight. Andrea Lotterer was passed by pretty much everyone. It then turned into a battle at the front of the field between Porsche and Toyota, and the Aston Martins continued to, despite that little banging around, to dominate the GTE categories. Taking a pass for the position there with Nicky Team going through to lead the GTE category in the AM car ahead of Fernando Ries in the Pro car. So that means there was nothing going on in LMP2. Well, wrong, because it was KCMG and Oak, and unfortunately, Alex Imperatori, who'd driven so well up to that point, just making a slight miscalculation and giving away the lead. First lot of pit stops saw only the Audi number two not take tyres, and that allowed Mark Webber, who'd had a slow puncture earlier on, to retake the lead. And then just a moment ago, his teammate, Neil Yarny, going back up into fourth position as he passed the number two of Andre Lotre. And there is Weber, still leading it. So you're up to date now as we move into our number two. Graham Goodman of Daily Sports Car alongside me, John Heindel. This has been thoroughly entertaining. You could have thrown out the chequered flag at the end of the first 20 minutes and we would have had enough to talk about, but that's not how we do it here in the World Endurance Championship. We go to the full six hours and you just get the feeling that there's more drama to come. We don't often see side-by-side, -side, don't always see side-by-side -side racing as we saw the, the calibre of we've seen in that first hour. The tactics will come into it, but more and more recently, We've seen that the overall reliability of even these brand new cars for 2015 at the head of the field, Graham, has allowed the teams to make these really sharp strategic decisions. That means we are seeing side-by-side -side racing. And we saw plenty in LMP2 that now sees Oli Pla leading. And Oli Pla leading increasingly comfortably at the moment, pulling away from Alex Imperatore. You're right about the reliability, John. We'd heard all about how complex, how cutting edge the systems were going to be with the factory LMP1 cars. We saw a touch of unreliability in a few incidents in early races, but the, the overall level of uh, the, these teams to be able to deliver development so quickly, it's just been breathtaking. The pace is breathtaking, the efficiency gains have been breathtaking, and there's more to come next year as well as the teams push even higher levels of, uh, of uh, hybrid power being punched out of these cars. 1,000 horsepower might seem passe uh, next, ne next year for some of them. People might raise their eyebrows at that, Graham, but we've already heard from Toyota and Porsche that they're thinking about going from six to eight megajoules, which will give them, one would presume, a quarter more, a third more power again from their hybrid motors, potentially. Audi know that they need to do something on their hybrid side, and they're talking about adding another 
hybrid generating unit. They're the only one of the three teams to only use one uh, source of gathering and therefore also uh, deploying hybrid power. So, you know, Audi aren't that far off at the moment. They're only using two, two mega -jokes. Yes. So if they were to go to six or eight, that would be a huge difference in terms of the hybrid Absolutely. boost that they would get. Absolutely, and we yet to see, of course, what uh, the interlopers, the new boys, the, new, the Mavericks are gonna do. Nissan. Uh, it won't be something that everyone else is doing. That's all we know. And if we know anything about Nissan, the car will be built upside down um, with wheels on the roof and drive everywhere backwards or because they just don't do everything. The driver will be sitting backwards driving like on a screen like the SPV in Captain Scarlet. I don't, honestly, you have no idea what is going to come from the mind of Ben Bowlby, who is their director of innovation and well, who is I, heading I, up the project. I think the, 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 uh, the clue comes with their current hashtag, 30 years of Maverick for Nismo. Let's wait and see. I can't wait, I have to say. Meanwhile, back on the circuit, Fast, it's furious, and it's extraordinarily elegant at times. Sports car racing. Let's have a listen to what Mark Webber's saying. Well, man, a few words is at Aussie Grid. Still leads, but he's been caught gently by. Anthony Davidson, uh, where are we now? It's 47. Under 20 seconds, the gap now. And, uh, is Stuart pit stop any time soon? Yeah, and Anthony Davidson is bringing Stefan Sarazan with him. Weber, that is. So, Rosie Grit will be in before too much longer. Uh, and Davidson. Let's have another listen to Mark and see if we can uh, tune into him this time. Fuel on, fuel on. Acknowledge fuel alarm, acknowledge fuel alarm. Right, that is fuel pressure alarm going off. So, depending on when that goes off around the lap, will depend how many, whether we can do one more. It tends to be on the generous side. You don't want it to have less than a lap in. Okay, Mark, box of fuel, box of fuel. Press box button, box of fuel. Uh, Fuel only said there, not fuel and tyres. So Mark's done a full stint and a little bit more. He's just done his fastest centre section. Here he comes in to the pits now. This is the leader of the race. Watch how he comes in the pit lane. He's the quickest man to that line there. He really attacks that little right-left kink as you come into the pit lane. And now it's time to the Porsche mechanics to do their job. Let's have a listen. I don't hear Mark getting out of that car, and I don't see Mark getting out of that car. Through goes Anthony Davidson to resume the race lead for Toyota. And Sarazan has followed him through, so Weber's already dropped down to third. So this is the 20 car in the pits at the end of lap 48. So fuel only for that one. Fuel still going in, it's away now and away he goes. That's a double stint for those tyres. Yep. They were brand new set of Michelin's when they went on for the, the the puncture. He'd done about 10 or 12 laps on the early ones. Rubber the eyes there for Mark. Just changing the radio station there. Absolutely. Smooth FM, I think he's this time. Or Radio Le Mans, almost certainly. Yeah. He's <laughs> listening to see what uh, Nick and Bruce are saying and Trusses are saying about him. He'll have been listening to find out if Trusses uh, had decided it was the right time for him to pit. That's probably why I told them fuel load. Yeah. Well, he has been listening. So 
there is Mark Webber back on the circuit and he drops in behind the Audi of the number two Audi of uh, Andrea Lotterer. It's going to be a pretty close contention with one of those Audis. That's Lotterer. He's between the two of them, he's between yeah. the two Audis. Now, Andrea Lotterer is also on a stint all tyres, but he changed his tyre. Uh, he came in for pit stops on 35 laps. So those tyres now are... A lot of his tyres now are 48 laps old. Marks are about 10 or 12 laps shy of that. I was going to make mention of John. That sounded like a very urgent radio call from him on fuel load. I wonder whether or not there was something of a surprise there. <laughs> Genuinely, there was certainly a, 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 there was a note of urgency in the way that uh, that uh, that Mark was actually uh, communicating that. We're on board now with Mark, running in fifth position. And we look to our right, we can see the headlights of the bright white headlights of the Porsche, the Audi, the Porsche and the Audi actually, as they go past us. One or two people just drifting away from the grandstands now. If I look behind me, the fan area is busying up again, but it was already been a big crowd today. And the car parks just to the left of that last camera shot are absolutely jam-packed. Also, on uh, driver's left down at the bottom of the hill, parking on the old circuit in parts there. The old tarmac for the banked area still visible in some areas, including there. Down into turn seven then, and there is the number one, Lucas de Grassi, got into that car on lap 35, and at the moment, he's on lap uh, 48, 49. And there you can see how many fans there are on the bank sides through the windscreen there of Luca de Grassi's car. Good vantage points here at Suzuka, well above the cr crash fencing, the debris fencing. Oh, that was a little bit wide there. Stay in the middle of the road, stay in the middle of the road, don't have to go that far. Now turn it in. Just feather the throttle over the top of the brow so you don't lose the rear end. This is Panasonic. And a quick flash of our cameraman up on the tower there. Brave man. Now onto the front straight. And this is the Audi's issue. Watch the speed here. Already you can almost hear that car running out of steam. And then the flywheel takes over and gives you a little extra boost across the line. And here's Weber. This is where the Porsche course is strongest bit of a lock up there for the number two Audi ahead of him. On board with Mark Weber. Ahead of him is the next car he wants to overtake, Andre Lotterer. He's already shooting, his dares go around the outside, blue flags waving for the Aston Martin ahead of him. Now which way does he go? Don't go the inside there, Mark, no. This is the 100R. Grab the car and haul it back into the left-hand side so you can set up for the left-hander. That is a face of a man who isn't sure. I would say. Yeah, I don't think this has gone their way, actually, John. I'm, I'm perplexed as to why they would, if they were planning to run that strategy, unless there was a reason why they changed tyres in one car and not the other. I don't, I can't believe that they've been planning to do that. Fortunately, I haven't got my usual link down to the Oracle of Audi, Martin Pass. Yep, did the Capello look alike, Martin Pass? Uh, You've Tuesday never seen Dindo Capello, Mark Pass and no. Joe Bradley in the same room at the I same time. I think it's that way they can get three helpings of dinner. Yeah. Good. No Back onto the start for this is where again. Oh, there's the Audi coming to the pits. Oh, ahead. that's a pit. Now, that is that is not on schedule for the oh, number two car. Incredibly quick entry to the pit lane for the number two car. Well, he was only in on lap 35, so the gamble on tyres has not paid off for Lotterer, one would assume. As he comes in, oh, oh the Porsche's got straight out. Mark Weber himself. had an issue with his braking there, and you heard the lock up. He's got back on again, no harm, no foul. Aside from the fact that uh, Luca de Grassi has gone through into fourth position, John, and that just looked like a straight mistake, I'm afraid. Well, there's an element of electronic braking here. Let's have a look. As he gets down, he should be braking. No, that's just a lock up. That's Ray Tyler. Well. Is it when he changes down? Incredibly difficult to balance the braking on these cars. A good look underneath there. 
of Andrea Lotterer's car and a new set of Michelin's going on. So that was only 14 laps. So a stint and 14 laps for those tyres. They're in trouble, I think, John. Yeah, they are. That is the dice rolled, and sadly, it's come up snake eyes. They don't appear. Here watch, he comes into the pit. Look entry. how quick he... Oh, did he clip the barrier there on the right-hand side? Driver sitting on the right, so he has got the opportunity to place the car on that side. Meantime, there's been another oh. spin for an Aston Martin. It's the 95. That's, that's the leading David car. Hansen, it was that leading car. It's leading Am car. Yep. Uh, but Tony Valander had already gone through to lead GTO over, overall. But that was David Heinmeier Hansen in the car. Now, did Paul Dallalana go through there to lead the class? I don't think he did. Uh, he shouldn't have done. There's quite a gap, but we'll keep an eye on that. So dramas up and down the field. David Hammer Hansen, meanwhile, has continued. Well, now they've got to let Andrea Lotterer off the leash, uh, haven't they, in the two car. Lucas de Grassi is the best Audi in fourth position. Let's go down to Wolfgang Ulrich, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, and find out what Audi's thinking is. issue no no there is no issue we just try to use the tires to the maximum uh, but uh, we always go as fast as we can so we can expect you to push we can expect to see you pushing yeah for sure there is no other way we are lacking so much top speed on the straight so we only can try to catch it back in the fast corners and there where we push like crazy thank you thank you that's the answer to the question is there any other sport where you could go to the man at the head of the program and get uh, at A, ask such searching questions, and B, get such sensible answers? Yep. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Louise, and thank you, Wolfgang Ulrich. Uh, 92 car is on pit lane, but another car is going to be in trouble now. The number 51 car we heard earlier uh, was under investigation for taking advantage of track limits. A drive-through penalty has been assessed for the 51. It leaves GT overall by, what is that, 14 seconds. I think McDowell is trying to chase down uh, Tony Valander at the moment. He's going to get that opportunity any time now uh, because it's certainly going to take something more than 15 seconds to drive down that pit lane. Uh, so we're about to get a real-time battle in GT Pro. Number 51, by the way, leads number 99. And then the 71, James Collado, with a very good run at the moment. And James is actually right with Alex McDowell, so not by any means a certainty that it's going to be an Aston Martin that leads the lap after this stop-go penalty is uh, assessed, John. Meantime, back with the leader, the number eight car, the one red light showing on the side of the Toyota TS040. And Anthony Davidson just 2.3 seconds ahead of Stefan Sarazan. Yes, it's been an impressive run so far, but it is only so far. We've seen Toyota do this before. There'll be some tension down in the Toyota Hybrid Racing pit. Among the luminaries are there. Alex Wurtz, by the way, reinstalled to the head of the Grand Prix Drivers Association at the behest of the current drivers. He did a, a stint as the top man there when he was racing in Formula One. And the current drivers asked him back as in comes Jimmy Bruni. Great honour. He, he said to me the other day and uh, Alex telling me also that the whole of the board of Toyota met the other day he was there he was asked to go and talk to them as we're looking at the battle for third in GTE Am with uh, the 14 of Neil Yanni coming through and I have a feeling that many of them are here just adding a little bit more pressure to the motorsport side of things. There's Jimmy Bruni coming out of the pits. And he rejoins just in front of Ricard Leitz, uh, who is fourth position in GTE Pro and fifth overall in the GTE uh, order. David Heimer Hansen, by the way, did retain the lead in GTE Am. He's running third overall in the GTE order to go on board at the moment now with Stefan Sarasam. Just gives you a hint of the kind of violence that these guys actually suffer through here, punishing On stuff. what looks like a fairly flat and smooth racetrack, 
Absolutely. And it's certainly not the worst track that they'll race on this oh, year. No, absolutely. We were saying earlier, weren't we, John, the, uh, the tarmac and the spectator tunnel is smoother than most UK race tracks. <laughs> so as it goes certainly these smoother turns. than most UK roads, yeah, for the sure. The G-Force is trying to rip his face off here. Just going back to that Toyota Tech Talk that I did for Radio Le Mans, com with Alex saying that it's not just the physical side of things it's the mental side of things as well Mark as Webber, Mark Webber has gone up into fourth position now so we're back to Toyota Toyota Porsche Porsche, Porsche Porsche Audi Audi Rebellion Rebellion oh my goodness that was close on the back of that car that was the 91 Porsche of Ricard Leach looking back and there is the confirmation from the Audi number one, looking now forward at Mark Webber. Look how the Audi closes up in the faster corners. That was 100R down into the hairpin at six and seven. Now, three wide here. Webber plays the big chance card and it's okay it's paid off for him as he went round the kcmg lmp2 car with alex imperatori on board gives the number one of luca degrassi a chance to close up but this is going to be very demoralizing for degrassi even if he can stay on the back of that porsche through this gt and lmp2 traffic as soon as the porsche gets on the start finish line on that 1.4 kilometer straight the writing on the back of that car is going to get very small indeed. Isn't it just? And, uh, this Here we go, watch this. That is extraordinary. Pulled out three, four, five, six, ten, twelve, and now we can't see it anymore. Isn't that extraordinary? Absolutely amazing. The sector times and differences between the Audi and the Porsche will be very interesting to look at. They will, because of course, sector one here includes some pretty tight turns. Mm. That's where the Audi is pulling back some of that time. But so uh, the straight line advantage is just profound. It's the most polite word I can actually come up with. Audi looking forward to the tighter tracks at the end of the season. And the championship, still tight, still very to be tight. talked about. Porsche looking for their first win of the season. They've had podiums, they've had front row starts. They've had pole. They've had a pole position. Spa. At Spa. And there was the replay from earlier on, just to underline the kind of speed differential that we're talking about there. But this is exactly what happens when you have a set of regulations that are open enough to allow people to come up with different engines, different hybrid systems. Now looking to defend that uh, manufacturer's championship lead they've got, courtesy of, well, a Le Mans win. Yes, that helped. And uh, consistency elsewhere. But after a poor start to the season, uh, it is still the Toyota crew of number eight, the Leeds Drivers Championship. But uh, it doesn't look like it on this form, does it? But uh, it's going to be a very interesting run in to the end of the season now. Why? Well, because certainly Audi, I wouldn't say they've got the backs of the wall with the circuits we've got to come, but they're also up against a Porsche team that is certainly in the ascendancy. Shanghai, the next race, has got a long straight. Got two long straights. Yeah, Bahrain got a long straight. And Brazil got a long straight, uphill. I can almost hear Dr. Ulrich sobbing gently. Now, in fairness, look what's happened, though. Weber's got through, but Degrassi, it keeps him in sight. It's only on the start-finish line. Yeah. And look how much he's gaining under braking there as they go down into the Dunlop chicane. Not using nearly as much kerb as we saw in qualifying. OK, that's P4 ahead. Gap to P3 is 19 seconds just because of the last two laps of traffic. Kyle Wilson-Clark there talking to his driver. A little bit of a different exit strategy, and all of a sudden, he's there, hoping to pick up the tour, but then it's as if someone is zooming out 
on a camera phone. Wait for the extra burst of power as he goes across the line. He doesn't get it, does he? It's a bit like watching the Millennium Falcon, isn't it, on Star Wars going to <laughs> hyperdrive. You feel the pain, don't you, of these guys? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's a long game. And it is about consistency, and it is about pressure, and that's what they're trying to do here. It's keep him under pressure. He's made one mistake, and he goes wide there too, so that there is a mistake there. Compromise line through that turn, and that's brought the number one car back into play. Lucas de Grassi now looking He's got to have a go. He's got to have a go down the hill here. He's not close enough. Oh, another lot of from Weber. Weber goes done. wide, and through he goes. And Graham Goodwin, once again, has pulled the rabbit out of the hat. And... Does beg the question, has, has Weber got a braking problem? Well, Philip Brownsley has tweeted at Spengy Tierman and at uh, DSC editor, lot of missed corners has been a recurring problem all season for Porsche. He's right, it has. And I do think that's down to the electronic brake distribution that they use nowadays. Now let's see whether or not Weber can actually deploy that straight line advantage to get back on the terms. And here he comes. It's going to be interesting as they go down to the first corner. What happened? There's the big lock up. And Lucas says thanks very much. Going down into the first corner. They're pretty much side by side again. Yeah, that's, that's an issue from on board Mark's car. Doesn't want to turn. He, did. he was wide already, wasn't he? Yeah. And here he is. Mark Weber is right back with him. Closed up on the long front straight. But now the Audi is in its element. Now, Mark Webber then has got to get himself settled down for a moment, just reorganise. There is the confirmation of the... In fact, the 12's already in there, the 13... Is a bit is, a regular stop, I think, is John. making a stop on the pit apron. Yeah, that looks much more regular, if you can be. Been a tough season for Bart Hayden and the guys from Rebellion. A massive undertaking for any private team to design and build their own car, which they have done in record time. Indeed, Fabio Langris, by the way, is underway. 13 on the way with the 2013 GP2 champion aboard. Weber's not going to be close enough at the end of the straight to catch the. Audi this time around, so we can check in with our leader, Anthony Davidson. Making his way through LMP2 traffic up the inside of, is it still Alex Imperatore? There it is. Yeah, he's uh, fought them off bravely when and they this, tried to get him out. There you go, this is a demonstration here of the difference in straight line speed between a P1 and a P2 car. The difference is considerable. Anthony Davidson just checking the gauges, making sure everything's all right. Looked in his inside mirror before he turns in. down the hill from one through two, heading towards three and caught the caller. Turns in now to turn three. Look at how smooth Ant is. Left-hand side of the screen. Just flicking the paddles with one finger of each hand. Down into turn six and seven now. Just a little correction there as the back end tried to step out. But that car looks fairly well planted. Another change up there with a the flick of the middle right finger. Now he's got traffic ahead of him. Watch his eyes, watch where he's looking, looking through the corner all the time. Not looking where the car is, looking at where he wants to put the car. And he slides up the inside of the Pro Speed Porsche. That was nicely done. Shows the nose of the car to... Hadn't been the, seen there. Yeah. Had not been seen. Oh, uh, that's exact. Oh, was there a touch there? Oh. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. The Aston, I think... Got into spinning the back of him. and got into the back of Anthony Davidson. This is the 98 car of Paul Dallalana. Second place in, just, G, uh, in GTM at that stage, John, but I don't think he is now. You oh, just, he, is. he still is. He still is. You just saw the little movement on the wheel from Anthony. Watch us. The touch there. That's a different incident. Well, that's a, that is a different incident. That was from... Now, here's the 
Here's the Anthony one. He's coming round. This is the 14 and 15. And spins. Whoa, he didn't tap. Anthony must have had eyes at the back of his head. He's going round the outside. He somehow sees that the Aston is spinning. Right. There's no contact, was there? And Anthony just wound a little bit of lock off to let the car breathe. Amazing peripheral vision, yeah. or at least peripheral... I, I don't know whether he saw him, but he kind of felt him or uh, felt the presence. El Elfin, almost. He is quite small, you know. You never amazing. Know. If he was in his ears, it's possible. It's absolutely amazing how he did that on the... And he was on the wrong side of the car. Oh, no, he was on the right side of the car. Yes, he's on the left-hand side. So maybe, you know, OK, he probably got the, uh, the sight of him just from his peripheral vision. But it's whatever. That is... That, that incident there underlines the difference between these guys driving a car and anyone else who drives. We drive pretty much every day, don't we? So we all think we can drive. But driving a race car and driving a road car are about the same as playing snooker and playing tennis. That's about right, I think. They both involve balls, nets, and something to hit them with. But that's, you know, that's the only thing. And race cars and road cars both have steering wheels, they both have gearboxes, they both have wheels, but really, it is a different skill. Yeah, I've always said, whenever people start to uh, ask about taking up, writing about sports car racing, any but motorsport, try to arrange to put them in a car with a race driver mm -hmm. on a drug track session, because they'll soon get the opinionation beaten out of them, because it's not what you expect. No, it's no, no, no. It's not no, no. about how quick you go in a straight line. It is about all those other things. Like we've just seen from Andy Davidson. Absolutely Davison. 100%. Um, Aston Martin, the pirate there, carries on. Yeah, laps down now for the 97 car. And, and uh, it is uh, really 26th position, and uh, how many laps off the lead there, John? Uh, four, four. Laps off, four laps off the GT lead, I'm afraid. And that's the eight minutes they spent fixing that car in the pits, isn't it? Pretty much exactly. Oh, control over 37. 37 has Kirill Ladigan on board. Uh, Recovers. This is at the same point, isn't it? That is 15 again. That's an odd place to go, odd part of the corner to go off there. Normally go off on the exit of that one. And was that all by himself? Ah, all yes. by himself. He was further in front of the leader, in front of the LMP2 leader. Yeah, he was further around. Just a little bit too anxious on the throttle. LMP2 leader in the pit lane as through goes Anthony Davison for a moment three wide. And down into turn one. So LMP2, Oli Pla from uh, seventh position overall. Out he gets. Great stint from Oli Pla. Uh, we were very impressed early on in the race with the speed consistency of Alex Imperatore. He's dropped back a little now, crosses the line now to retake the lead. But of course, we'll need to stop. I think that was Julien Canal trying to try, uh, climbing aboard the car. First year in LMP, of course, for Julien, but a multiple champion. Uh, I think, was it three years on the drop, winning his class uh, at the Mont? May have been in four uh, in GTM Corvettes, GT1 Salines, four new Dunlops. Of the four. last GT1 victory there, it wasn't was indeed. it? In that last year of the class. All of his titles won with Marlboro competition. And uh, when will we see those guys back? Well, let's wait and see. I think they're interested in coming back, but uh, much seems to depend on the finances, as always is the case. It's, uh, Inside with the SP Racing Crew and now back with the, as we said a little earlier, the new LMP2 leader back into the lead for the 47 car, Alex Alexander Imperatori. The KCMG car. This car, of course, was the class winner last time out, John. First win in the World Endurance Championship for the Hong Kong based team. Hard fought and well deserved. They have been uh, coming on. Just back out onto the circuits. Let's go down to Oli Pla, who's with Luis. Olivia, an eventful but good uh, stint for you there. A lot going on. 
Yeah, the moment is not so bad. We lost a lot of time in the first stint behind uh, Imperatore, especially uh, with Rossiter, uh, who was uh, quite slow with uh, P1. So um, as we are a little bit down on straight line speed compared to the Eureka, it's difficult to pass. But uh, he made a small mistake and I could take the lead. Um, but uh, after the pace was good, the car is really good, not, uh, not uh, using the tires too much. I can, keep, I can be very consistent with, uh, with the tires. So at the moment it's looking good, but uh, it's just the beginning. Thank you. The only thing that stands against Oli Plar, of course, is his height. Uh, a little. I know Louise not, is no, diddy, not, but... Yeah, he's not, he's not that tall. Uh, by the way, uh, prediction with the weather forecast spot on, John. We've got uh, bright sunshine over parts of the circuit now. Um, you'd never guess it from his accent that he's French, would you? No. Now, we've got a pit caller That's diving the into the pit lane. It's the CLM run by the Lotus team, and that's a nice swift entry as well. Here comes Heidi. Hi. And... is the G drive and SMP. That is a part of a position. That is indeed. That's second position in the P2 class. And that is Nicola Manassian going past Julian Canal. Julian just getting up to speed, having Nick, come out of the pits. Nick will be due into the pit soon, though. Yeah. So that's the professional in the number 27 car ahead of the gentleman, albeit an experienced one in the number 26. And the 27 car course, John, in team and in driver terms, is the leader in uh, the championship at the moment. Nice use of the draft from the seven car. Sarazan by former teammate, in fact, of Nick Manassian. By Nick. Let's go on board with uh, Stefan Sarazan. Clear track ahead of him as he heads down towards Dunlop. A bit of sunshine there, exactly as uh, the weather forecast predicted. And first time... We had some sunshine on Thursday, it was quite warm, a bit overcast on Friday. Oh, Sarazan just riding the kerb a little too eagerly there, coming out of turn 13, which is called turn 13, corner 13, actually. The Frenchman, who has pretty much done every form of motorsport, both on and off-road. Absolutely. Multiple factory drives to his uh, CV at the moment. Is there about to be another one, perhaps? Yeah, some speculation about where Stefan's uh, overalls and helmets and boots will be hanging next year. It's, uh, currently, of course, stalwart of the Toyota Racing Team. Before that, we've seen Stefan in uh, Aston Martin factory cars and, of course, with Peugeot Sport. But uh, right now, well, he's running championship as well. <laughs> he's done all sorts, hasn't he? On board with the 92 Porsche. This is the one that's had all the issues. Fred Makaviki not used to holding up the field. He is strongest driver at the moment because he's got 26 guys up above him. And in fact, uh, that is Stefan Mucker coming to put another lap on him. Not a banner day for two of the leading lights in LMGTE Pro. No, there is, they are. This is playing into the hands of the championship in terms of the 51 car. Yeah. Even with their trials and tribulations, Tony Veland is still in third position in that category. And Porsche will be desperate to get Ricard Leitz, uh, which leads ahead of Tony Veilander. Aston Martin doing all they can with uh, Alex McDowell leading the pro cast class at the moment in the 99 car. Yep. In Am, it is uh, the Dane Train, the 95 car, running third best of the GTEs and leading the Am category from Paul Dallalana despite that incident for Paul earlier on. The lap time is coming out now from DHH. He had that little bit of a. a uh, rotation, but uh, fending off the challenge of uh, Tony Valander at the moment. It's no mean feat. No. I do like the way that the GTE Pro and AM classes have virtually become one now. Yeah, I mean, obviously now we've got some of the gentlemen drivers aboard, you'll see some, uh, some uh, slower lap times, but not ridiculously slow. There you go, that's uh, the view of the start, the 1.4 kilometre straight here. There is the overall the middle. G the GTE. <laughs> there's, there's the middle. One, two. Again, towards the end. <laughs> it's the number 99 car, the GTE Pro leader. This is the Kraft Bamboo AMR car in their first year at WEC, of course. First pole position, I think, for them. Absolutely. And uh, exciting plans ahead, I hear, for Kraft Bamboo. There's the second place car, the 71 of James Collado. Nice to see James doing so well as well. 
for a while we thought he might be able to bring into sports cars and just didn't quite get the brakes, but he seems to have found a home now with AF Corsa. Strong display from the uh, 71 car so far in this race. Yep. And that's going to be important moving forward. Need a strong two-car team in this World Championship. And uh, with James Collado and Davide Rigon, this, uh, they seem to have found it. Yeah. Another Davide, uh, another driver coming up from Formula Cars, Davide Rigon, which seems to be the way nowadays with a bottleneck at the top of the Formula Racing. Now, this is the battle for the lead in LMP2 going underneath our brave cameraman. I'm feeling yes, indeed. I was just about to say, I think Nick Manazian is heading for pits. He is. The other change, uh, the, the other factor we should mention, of course, in P2, this is the only class at the moment in the World Endurance Championship uh, which features a tyre battle and the number 27 car at the SP Racing Team. Uh, those two cars, 27 and 37, uh, are, feature Michelin tyres, whilst the remainder of the grid on Dunlops. It's the blue guys. We should, we should say that all of the classes could have a tyre battle because it's an open tyre formula. Uh, it's just It just so happens that happens, so one or other of the major tyre companies dominate. I think we're going to see a change in that possibly for next season. We'll watch and see what emerges from that. And uh, I think that's Maurizio Mediani is actually being bolted in. Now, he's come up through the GT ranks and has thoroughly impressed me, if I'm honest. Well, it is about, it's a very different discipline, as we've said time and time again, haven't we, John? Uh, between LMP and GT. Not everybody who's quick in one is quick in the other. Mediani, the two Mediani, and we've got both of the uh, the SMP racing cars on pit lane at the moment, with Julien Canal out on track, because, of course, he has retaken the lead of the class. Um, he's done well in both. Here's the 97 car. Getting four new boots. We can't see it from this angle, but uh, we do get an overhead shot of the car. Have a look on the roof here. We'll tell you a tale about what's to come for that car. Something different. Meantime, down at Porsche, Team Montai, the 91 car. It's driver change there too. Ricard Leitz is getting out of that car. Your Bergmeister, German George, is getting in. And what he's doing there is he's just extending the lap belts. Did you see him just pulling them there? on the far side, because he's going to push that seat a little further back. Because he's a little bit tall there. Yeah. And it does run on runners, as the Aston Martin does as well. Out comes the 37 car. Victor Scheitar has just uh, jumped into that one. Now, Nick is out. Quick Nick. So, see what he's got to say about the start of the race. Down, down with Luis. Yeah, it's okay. It was uh, it was tough out there. Not much grip, and uh, the pace wasn't what I expected. But uh, we tried to hang in there. You know, we just uh, there for the championships. We knew we didn't have the pace to start off in here. But um, if we hang in there as an endurance race and uh, score as many points as we can, then we'd be pleased. You know, I think it's still a long way to go. But I like to be a bit faster, obviously. <laughs> You're talking to the Michelin guy there. You say there's not much grip. What can you do? Not Anything? Much. No, there's not much you can do. I think you can play a bit with uh, tire pressure. Um, that, that's about it. You know, you cannot change the setup now. The car. Sometimes a uh, track when you just get more rubber, you just get a bit better for the tire for the car. So I think the important thing is to not make a mistake. Just do the schedule stop like we expected to uh, them to be. And uh, I've been saving quite a bit of fuel. I did about three laps more than the other driver. So that way we can try to do one less stop. Great, thank you. You've got to make that decision early, though. You can't make the decision halfway through. There's the number 35. This is the Morgan Judd. Gustavo Jakobin started that car. I think he's still in it, actually, as he goes out. Um, Alex Brundle's helmet in there, maybe. Let's have a look when we see it from the front of the car. They've not been the best of... Uh, Weekends for them, but they fought back up into uh, fourth position as in comes Audi number one 
from fourth uh, from fourth position. Mark Webber goes back through. There is Luca de Grassi coming down the pit lane, followed in by number seven, Stefan Sarazan. See, I'm forgetting to do this. This is lap 72 for these guys. The car on its blocks there now. The hybrid spooling down, if you like. Uh, attention to the drinks bottle. Very clever drinks system. Look at Degrassi. He's going to stay aboard. Just noticing there that uh, Degrassi's actually dropped off the lead lap. So the Audis have dropped off the lead lap. They don't know. They're taking tyres, John. Oh, they are. They yeah, are. they are. They've took tyres at each stop, 35 and 71. Well, it's a bit of a surprise after what we'd heard from Wolfgang Gorick. 35 and 72. So, an extra lap for the Toyota. There's a bit of a battle in the pits here between the two teams. They came in just underway apart. Number seven car at this stage. No, a lap apart. Yes. Yeah, yeah a lap apart, and, the, and that is the oh, Audi getting back out, yes. Well, the, lap, the Audi coming in at the end of his lap 71, the Toyota coming in at the end of his lap 72. So, advantage to Toyota at the moment with Audi not being able to get those tyre stops. Now, expect to see Mark Webber in in about 15 laps. Leader in the pits now, Anthony Davidson making his way down pit lane. And this will be end of lap 73 for him. That's a really weird sound, isn't it? <laughs> That was a bit of a lock-up for the number 98, uh, Aston Martin, in front of uh, Neil Yarny. So now, is it tyres for the Toyota? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I think we're going to see tyres at every stop now. Me too. I think it was only really Audi that had a prayer of making that. So fuel and tyres it will be for the number eight car. We wait to see as the two Audi goes below us here now. Where is Neil Yarny? It's so 37 laps for the eight car. And Neil Yoni is coming in pit lane, John. Uh, and that will be the end of his lap 73 as well. And that's also 37 laps for the Porsche. So let me see, have we got tyres out for that one? Isn't that buzzing? That's the, uh, Remember, the engine has to be turned off at this point, yep. so that's a fan that's cooling the batteries, I would say. Absolutely. There's Weber going through. So Weber, significantly, Weber does not retake the lead. Uh, he does not. Andy Davidson's already left, hasn't he? He has. But he does get go. back he's on the lead. behind him. Yeah, he's just got out. So he's, uh, Weber is between the two Toyotas at this point. But uh, remember, before the last stop, Weber led. So yep. more progress made in the last stint by Toyota, as opposed to the number 20 Porsche, Mark Weber. Yeah. Just realised that. In fact, Weber's just lost a place. Yeah. Number seven car has gone through. So and Stefan Sarazan on new tyres, but with a heavy car. And Mark will have a go around the outside at 100 oh, R. Drops the left at 300 R, rather drops the left rear Michelin onto the dirt and down into Dunlop. Saracen will go back up the inside, and Weber can't fight that one. But uh, we're coming round now, past the tight twisty bit to the bit where we know the Porsche has got an advantage. It has an advantage on an Audi. Does it have an advantage? It's not got the grip, has he? That, no. Uh, that just, just that. Uh, Tucking across the dirt, has not done any favours. He's got a little bit of traffic there. Ducked up the inside of the Pro Speed Porsche. That was and very we'll decisive. See. We know the Toyota is very quick in a straight line, and the Audi is too. Uh, can he close any of that gap? He's certainly not close enough to anything this time, is he? Paul Dallanana in from second in the arm category. No, hasn't gained at all. So this is Mark losing the position back to Sarazan. Just watch the back end of the Porsche as they go through the chicane there from the onboard of the GT Porsche. In fairness, Mark was pretty, pretty uh, fair there because he didn't shut the door at all on Sarazan. He could have. 
Nazaban playing percentage games. Hearing that the 9-0 car, Gianluca Roda at the wheel of the Ferrari is slow after turn eight, so halfway around the lap. 98, that's Paul Dallalana's car, as we mentioned. Well, there is the number 90. We said it was going slow. It's come to a halt. It's on the outside of turn eight. That's an incredibly fast corner. And Gianluca Roda still in the car, talking to the safety personnel. As into the pit lane comes James Collado. Second overall. From second in the GT category. There's the 81 car. Steve White at the wheel of that. His. Be advised, yellow flags double that T9. No overtaking before you pass the green flag afterwards. Yeah, that is. We can see that from our vantage point as well as from the TV pictures. We we'll have to keep our eyes on that to see if we go to a full course caution or possibly even a safety car. There's the option of two. Let's head down to the pit lane. Paul Dallalana, we saw him have a spin, but he brought the car in in second place in arm. Paul, oh, you're just having a quick word with your teammates. Sure. You're getting your breath back. Yeah, yeah, all good. You had quite a moment with the number eight, with Anthony Davidson there. Yeah, that's... Uh, they come up quickly, obviously, and we're in our own little battle with uh, 75 and I think 61 at the time. So, um, in any event, happy nobody, uh, nobody had big contact and everyone could continue uh, but uh, it's one of the challenges here I think it's just such a tight track and particularly in sector three everyone's anxious to get on with it so there's not a lot of room thank you didn't spoil anybody's wrist Paul that's fine now you may be wondering what I'm talking about when I say we may see a full course caution or possibly even a safety car have the option to have full course caution without the safety car being on the track and we have a couple of times this weekend seen it happen where the race director Eduardo Freitas has thrown that and he's been very particular Graham about making sure people slow down for that uh, very particular indeed there's a fair number of guys have had a bit of a warning about it and uh, there's no immediate sign of an intervention vehicle coming to take that car behind the barrier and I wonder whether or not we might get that in this week of all weeks uh, for this purpose yeah we might have seen in days gone by a snatch tractor heading out from behind the safety of the concrete walls that is an extraordinarily fast part of the circuit you come out the hairpin you change up 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 you don't break until the braking area for the Dunlop chicane at the bottom of the hill and in fact, if we want that, uh, well, huh? now, long piece of wire. And there is a gap in the fence there, as you can see, with the tow strop. And that car clearly, I wonder if we could just push it. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. A little bit of a helping hand. And here's the leader coming through to the final part of the circuit now and in about five seconds time that 90 car is going to be clear 
as long as he's got the lock to get in there. That's, it was pretty tight. I think what they've done there, Graham, interestingly, is they've put the double yellows out for a couple of laps so that people get used to seeing them and slow down there before anybody went out to move that car. Three wide in front of the leader, three GT cars. Oh, don't make it four, and Come on. <laughs> I'm going to the left, I'm going to the right, I'm going to the left again. Come on, I'm coming through. Excuse me, excuse me, coming through, excuse me. So Anthony Timerson gets past. He must have. What do you think when you're coming down? You know, you're doing the sharp end of 200 miles an hour, and ahead of you is a wall of GTE cars. Dashes, I think. Yes, or some, something similar. Single wave yellow now at turn nine. Not as quite the, clear. Not quite clear. As the barely the front of the 90, the orange 90 car is still seen behind the wall. Well, the, the difference, of course, John, is there's no marshals now beyond the wall uh, to the car only. That's correct. And the car is coming to be brought back. It is the problem with lock there. So slightly further back out. And I think they'll take a lot of approach. Anthony Davison pushing very, very hard indeed. And the back end of the Toyota beginning to feel the pain. Those rear Michelin tyres, excellent though they are. Some of the spectators, they are spectators by the way, not professional photographers, although you wouldn't know that by the gear that they've got. Uh, hour two, done and done. Anthony Davison will be scored as the leader as we move into the third hour of six. It is a timed race here, and this is proper sunshine. I'm going to owe Doris 10 quid, aren't I? Right, so. I did bet them there'd be rain on race day. And the Ferrari is behind the wall. Single yellows and gone. Well done. Nicely done. I like the fact of putting down the double yellows for a couple of laps before anything happens. Uh, faultless display by those marshals. Yeah. And, and also, you know, you've got to give the drivers some credit. They have to slow down. Be, otherwise, you can't go out there and, you know, and do it. But given a couple of laps, let them see where it is. No side-by-side -side action, nothing silly. Yeah. So let's give you a rundown then with another hour of the race just completed. Toyota from Toyota by uh, almost seven seconds now. Eight from seven. That's the right way around as far as the championship's concerned. Davison from Sarazan. Mark Webber is another ten seconds further back in third place for Porsche. Due a pit stop shortly, Mark, actually. Uh, 48. 88. No, I'm talking complete nonsense. Um, he's got about another... 15 laps, so come back to you on that. Championship terms, John, at the moment, uh, the number eight car, or the crew, or rather the two guys who are here this weekend, Sebastian Boemi. 285, absolute VMAX. 25 kilometres down, uh, per hour down on what we've seen from the Tota 310. Absolute VMAX for the Audi. Sorry, go back to the championship. Group. Championship points uh, with the pole position points yesterday. Uh, that Sebastian Buemi and Anthony Davidson are now 12 points for good ahead of uh, the number two group, the Audi group. Um, as we've got class leader in the pits, David Harmer Hansen brings an 95 car down pit lane. Uh, but that 85, 84, 85 for Mark Webber, by the so way. 97 points plays 85 for Ooh. the lead in the championship. It's going to go down to the wire again, this isn't it? Just. How many years are we into the WEC now? This no, is yeah, no. 12, 2012 was the first year. Uh, first round of courses at Sebring, 12 hours. And uh, we're at the end of what, uh, in the quick interview I did with Gerard Navarro earlier today, he said uh, the, the end of the beginning. Yes. The first three years, a strategic plan. Audi have won all of the championships in the, the first three years. This year, they're going to struggle to hold on to them. They are, It's uh, which is... You know, great, and I think they welcome that. I think they welcome the competition. Welcome challenges, there's their hashtag. All right, let's give you a rundown then. Toyota Racing by uh, six and a half seconds, as we mentioned. That's it from seven. Then Mark Webber still uh, has been in that car since the start of the race. Audi Sport hanging on there in fourth position and still just on the lead lap, as is Porsche number 14, but the six car has dropped off the lead lap. Rebellion uh, leading their category. 
LMP2, G drive in eighth position overall, but uh, only by something like half a minute, and it's still Aston Martin racing. It's the pros that have got ahead of the amps now with the gentleman drivers having jumped into the amp cars for the most part, 14th and 15th, uh, that being uh, the uh, Alex McDowell driven 99 car and the David NMI Hansen uh, driven 95 car. That car's just come back out of the pits. Jimmy Bruni uh, chasing hard. So it's 99, 71 and 51 in terms of the pros and 96, 88 Porsche and 81 for Steve Wyatt. It's, uh, I think, great, uh, great show here from Alec McDowell. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's not easy to lead a race. It's certainly not easy to stay in the lead of a race. He's never raced here before. No. Nope. He put the car on pole. Yep. With Fernando Reis. It's a joint effort, of course. Joint enterprise now. A little large of us. He's, he racing. There really is. You could put, uh, if you could stand Fernando Reis on top of himself, yep. he probably would only just be the same Scratch height. Chin. Yes. Um, the. There is the Aston Martin Vantage number 95, David Adamaya Hansen, the Dane Train, as Graham likes to call it. Although they've started putting the, the, the Danish Express, I see, is written on the back of that car now, so they've kind of... Uh, no, got, we're, we're having Dane Train. Yeah. Sorry, we're not having that nonsense. Going back to Alec McDowell, though, I mean, front-wheel drive expert in the past, uh, driving small touring cars, and he still finds the transition to rear-wheel drive bothering him um, although he and Fernando both like a car that's a little bit understeery yep. so they've been able to find a compromise in the setup now clearly it's not bothering him that much because as, as I said to him you know the, the times you're putting in but he's still he, he was keen to not to uh, underplay the difference that it's made jumping into a uh, a rear wheel drive car from a front wheel drive car, which I thought was interesting when I spoke to him yesterday. The other thing is, he's learning and he's clearly learning very quickly. He's set pole position, the team are leading the race. It's going to be pretty tight, by the way, when they uh, get out of the pits from their pit stop, which must be due soon. But uh, it's going to be very tight at the, the lead of GTE Pro with uh, Davina Recon second place by about a minute 24 seconds, but uh, with Jimmy Bruni just 10 seconds back. That was the Brains Trust at Aston Martin Racing, mm -hmm. Aston World. Yeah, four garages together in the middle of the pit lane. It does look like a theme park to Gulf Racing Aston Martin. And nothing wrong with that. No, no, there'll be plenty of people who would like to visit such an establishment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And judging by the uh, sales of merchandise behind us and the amount of people who are wearing 10th anniversary EMR Branded Repl uh, replica, stuff. replica kit, yeah. I keep thinking they have signed a new Japanese driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very good. Here we have the 99 car make its way through some GTM traffic. That is the gorgeous liveried Pro Speed Porsche. It's uh, another um, newly delivered last time around first race for this car in the hands of Pro Speed Competition. It is, however, a car we saw racing at Le Mans in the hands of Pro Speed Competition and Dempsey Racing. And uh, Patrick Dempsey, another man who's been linked with the potentially a WC programme next year, John. Now, would that be as a driver or bringing the team across? Because the, uh, they, they've sort of been rumblings. popping in and out of, uh, of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, pre prevented by the terms of the legal action taken against me by Patrick Dempsey. He's, I'm such a big fan, stalking. Uh, no, I've not spoken to Patrick about it. My guess would be as a driver. Right. I've had a couple of words with a couple of people I think might know. There's certainly been some talks on that front. No decisions. As for yet. a full season? I'd have thought quite possibly. I know he signed up for Grey's Anatomy again. And when we talked to him at the end of last season, he said this was the last season he wouldn't do any more. Presumably, ridiculous amounts of money were dangled in front of him and the rest of the cast to go on for another couple of, or three series. Um, he is quite honest about, as we've seen Porsche getting ready for the stop and uh, Timo Bernard, he's quite honest about the fact that he, his acting career pays for his racing, but he would like to do more racing and be known as a racing driver. And he's clearly a very, very good gentleman driver. In comes Mark Webber then. Let's watch Mark into the pits. He's, oh, he's so quick. That is ridiculously fast into the pits, but he gets him dragged down to the pit lane speed limit then. Uh, joked, didn't we, about uh, the nonsense talked about Mark retiring oh, yeah. when he left Formula One. But he finally does retire from motor racing. He's got a heck of a career with a mini cab driver ahead of him. Lap 83 then for Mark. 
Oh, scratch that, John. That's lap 84. So that's 36 laps. I did say 84, 85. I've team, just, just realised I've started writing my um, lap chart on the wrong way around on my pad. It is, what is it now? It is 12, well, seven minutes past one local time. It's Timo time. It is Timo time. Mark's been in from the beginning. And remember, these guys are a little bit off the schedule of everyone else because of that slow puncture that Mark had earlier on. But a 30... Six lap run for the Porsche is right on the money. We've seen 37s for the 14 car and I think the 8 car as well. Yes, the 8 car as well. The 8 Toyota have done 37 lap runs. Paul Trusswell's analysis of this is going to be fascinating because the average lap times are where this is being won and lost. We are talking now about tenths of seconds over 36 and 37 lap stints. And if you're talking about three tenths a lap round here, which is what we've been looking at in some of the breakdowns earlier this week, this is a 16 corner track. Yep. So that's hundredths in each corner yep. that you're talking about. Oh well, now, what's the CLM done? Oh, Heidi has spun. Yep. Oh, nasty, down the hill. Not as good at drifting as it is at sports car racing. Right. Clearly, the That's James Rosser there, there and coming back the other way. P101. I think they were asking about fuel that time around and where he had it. Now, Mark, unfortunately... Hang on, let's have a listen. Uh, they're talking about uh, going... And the tyres. Yeah. Only have tried, I heard yes. in the background there. Now, Mark Webber. His tyres. He's having a look at those. I Mark think they're wondering, John, whether or not they can have a, give it a go. For a man who's normally been used to doing an hour and 20, an hour and 30, he's just done two hours and 10 minutes. He doesn't even have the good grace to look like he's been in the car at all, does he? Just, please he's stop ridiculously it. fit. I suspect that was uh, Mark being asked whether or not to give Lu Louise a little bit of a moment. Uh, although I can see Louise uh, sprinting back down towards Porsche, from where we are now. Now, between Alex Wirtz and um, Jensen Button and Mark Webber in a triathlon, what do you reckon? I'd pay oh. to see it. <laughs> I mean, the levels of fitness of these guys, this is a 91 and the 95 car going head to head. This is for position overall, but not in class. But that does mean now we've got four pro cars line astern we do. on the timing screen at least. Oh, he's gone wide a little bit. Watch for the Aston Martin. Has he gone back through? Not quite. Oh, and here comes an Audi. And. That sprint up the pit lane for Louise has paid dividends because the affable Aussie at Aussie Grit is waiting to speak to her Porsche. Mark, you've had that for a good stint. That slow puncture at the start put your uh, stops out of kilter, but could that work in your favour? Well, we had a puncher, so we didn't want to stop like that, but uh, the first part of the race was going very well. Putting good pressure on that on the Toyota, and then the left rear, uh, we got a puncher, so we... We had to try something different, and then we tried the double stint of tyres, which didn't really work, so uh, we had to try a bit of a gamble when we lost uh, so much time. The car is the car is pretty quick when we uh, when we have, if we uh, single stint the tyres, but when we double stint, it doesn't look that easy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my apologies, because there was a short stop in there, wasn't there, for Mark. So, that's just what they were the, seeing. Uh, the tyre issue earlier on with a suspected puncture. Uh, in the meantime, back on track, here is the GT Pro Championship leading car, the 51 car. Jimmy Bruni still at the wheel of this car, as he has been since, well, about uh, 1973, it seems. So one of, if not the best GT driver in the world at the moment, reigning world champion to Audi, meanwhile, on pit lane, as uh, the 51 car comes around to complete another lap in pursuit of its team car. Got the two car, in car now on pit lane. This is 
is Andre Lothra from third place. And uh, he'll lose that almost immediately to Nuyani. On the stops now. Yes, guys, go to work. Andre climbs out of the car. We'll wait to see who is next in rotation. Meanwhile, Nuyani say back up into third position overall for the number 14 car. Podium, or is it going to be better for 14? Ben Montoya, you eight, for the number two. GTE Pro leader also on pit lane now, the number 99 car. As the tyres, we're going to see this, I think, at every stop now, John. Yeah. Changed for the number two car. We've heard both Audi and Porsche now say they've tried to double stint and it didn't work. So the only chance I think we've got of anybody doing that again is if there's a perceived potential advantage at the end of the race. You see the 99 car there, door open behind. It was number two car, lasting on lap 49. That was his lap 87. So that's another 36 lap stint. Ah, no, that's a 38 lap stint. Sorry, my maths is... It's not maths, obviously, you're with us. That's the longest tip we've seen so far. Andre Lotto looking not a bit bothered by the vast physical exertions that are involved in a stint like that. Waiting, by the way, as we watch the 99 car being serviced to see whether or not we get a Ferrari through to the lead. I don't think so. It's going to be tight. Just goes across the line. Now, there is the 71 car, just in the heat is. I think he's going to do it. As the Aston comes yes. out now and takes the second Ferrari that's in the picture there as well. So that is the new leader, the red, white and green Ferrari of Air Corsa. The 71 car of Davide Rigon has gone up into the lead. Also, it's a pit stop, of course. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. He's only done two stops. The Aston's done three. Uh, sorry, that's wrong. No, it's Jimmy no Bruni's done three because, because of the stop, stop go. go. This, this, is, yeah. this is the right position. That's the that's the Ferrari having made very good progress. And what we've not seen yet, John, on screen is where the 99 car is in relation to the 51. I think uh, Jimmy Bruni has gone through. Has gone through. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, there's the 92. Have a look. There is the 92 car, not in this fight, I'm afraid. Fred Makaviki. So look behind them. Is it Aston or Ferrari? It's Ferrari. Ferrari, yep, it's Ferrari, Ferrari one, one and two. two now. And I strongly suspect before two, very much longer, that the order of those Ferraris will be reversed. That would make championship sense, wouldn't it? Uh, should mention, meanwhile, car we've not mentioned for a while. We saw it go to the garage number 12 car, the Rebellion. It's back out and has been for quite some time. Way down the order, but still circulating. So the only car at the moment that uh, appears to be a retirement is the number 90 car. Just drafted out on track, yeah. Behind the barrier. And, uh, that's a uh, very well managed local yellow. Excellently managed. No muss, no fuss. More electrical problems, we think, uh, for Rebellion. They had a fly-by-wire issue yeah, yesterday. They've been plagued all weekend, I'm afraid, with electrical problems. Louise Beckett giving us that news from the pit lane. And running up and down like a spring chicken. I think all that, that I think obviously that gym uh, membership doing the world. I think it's slightly, <laughs> slightly unkind, dear, dear me. It's a quite a long pit lane to cover on your own, I've got to say. And she's only got little legs, in fairness. There is the 99 car. Fernando Reese back up to speed, but now in third position. Didn't Fernando start the race? Yes. Then Alex got in. We've not seen Devlo Young now. No, we have not. So the rotation there puts uh, Fernando Reese back in, presumably because uh, there's going to be a bit of a fight here with the Porsches. There's James Collado there. Yeah, taking a breather and some rehydration. And there is the Kraft Bamboo car. Been a tough year for them as well, hasn't it? It has. Uh, missed their Le Mans, of course, after a substantial shunt for Fernando. Right, let's head down to Audi. Andre Lotterer awaits.
Andre, we saw from qualifying that you may not have had that speed, um, but surprised to see the two so far back. Sorry? Surprised to see how you're running. Yeah, I think uh, the strength is our, uh, our race pace. We can use the tyre quite well, and when there's more rubber coming on the track, it's better for us, so that's the case. Uh, but still, it's a, it's a little bit of a long way to the top, but we're fighting. What was that at the beginning then, a bit of frustration just making your mark? Uh, I kind of forgot to control my, my fuel consumption there. I got excited. Uh, there was a lot of things going on at the front and I was just focusing on grabbing opportunity and didn't watch my consumption. I'm used to race on this circuit with uh, my Formula car and not, not worrying about it, so maybe I thought it was the wrong car. Thank you. Well, as we surmised between the two of us, I thought fuel could be consumption straight away. Uh, that, that, that's absolutely priceless. Bless him. Bless him. Yeah, I, I, I love that. That's uh, you know, it's it's the racing driver took over. Yeah. Oh, the, I saw a chance of getting into the lead. Yeah, from the fighter pilot. It's uh, you know, that's the. And then the big orange lights flashing. Yeah. And he thinks, if I don't lift off now, I'm going to spend the next two laps of an average going uh, down to nothing. A significant uh, action on the front straight there as the leader, Anthony Davison, is putting a lap on uh, team on, on uh, Luca De Grassi. Oh, and there it is the 88 car going off right in front of that. In fact, that was Stefan Sarazan also putting a lap on the number one car. So now just the top three on the lead lap. And Neil Yarny hanging on to that as best he can. He's coming across the line shortly. It looks like a long afternoon, doesn't it, for... Everybody running. who's not in a Toyota. Yes. This is... If they can pull this win off in a dominating fashion the way they are at the moment on their home circuit, and it is a home circuit, they're part owners of the track, and their R&D centre is uh, an errant wheel nuts throwaway from where we're standing at the moment, with the board members here, this is a massive fillip for their motorsport oh, absolutely, program. Absolutely. It, they've made no, um, they've made no excuses, but they've also made uh, absolutely. Um, just watching the number one Audi going past one of the GT cars and hoving in behind a Toyota at the moment, but the Toyota will disappear as if shot from a uh, cannon. A cannon, yes. Uh, yeah, they've, they've made. Uh, They've made it absolutely clear that their financial situation is not an unlimited amount of money as per uh, what you might expect from a manufacturer. They are having to justify all of their spend on an R&D level. And yeah. this kind of result here, in front of the size of crowd we've got here, and the sunshine, and completely dominating Porsche now, as well as Audi in this race, that would be big news back at Toyota headquarters. Uh, it would be big news and you know I know there's been a lot been said about the, the level of scale of commitment to the program. They are designing a new 2015 car. Uh, we do believe though at the moment the plans are there will only be two Toyotas at Le Mans next year. Uh, so potential for 11 factory cars next year at the Le Mans 24 hours with uh, the newcomers out, uh, Nissan promising third car. Porsche appear to be looking for third car. How do traditionally do at least three cars? Um, could that make a difference? I don't think it will, but it's a nice thought. So this is how it stands. Three hours and 37 minutes still to go. Anthony Davison leads by 11.1 seconds from his teammate, Stefan Sarazan. It's Neil Yarny. And one minute and 16 seconds back from the leader. Those three are on their lap. 94 at the moment, everyone else at least a lap behind, including in fourth place Luca de Grassi in the first of the Audis. Timo Bernhard is 16 seconds back from Lucas, battling for fourth and fifth position. Ben Trelluer another 30 seconds further back from that in sixth position. In P2, Julian Canal leads for the 26G drive Ligier from Matt Housen, who's 30 seconds uh, further back in second place. And Maurizio Mediani is further back, in fact, he's a full lap back. Uh, and uh, not gaining at the moment in GT. Davide Rigon leads for 1-2 for Ferrari with the 71 and 51. Jimmy Bruni at the wheel of the 51, catching the leader at the moment, and that gap down now to just over four seconds. Third place for long-time leaders, Aston Martin, and Paul Sitters two. Another three seconds or so behind Fernando Reese, having just taken over that car. In 
the AM category, it is Aston Martin, uh, and it's uh, Aston Martin by two, as David Enemeyer Hansen uh, leads uh, Christopher Nygaard, so a 95 from 98. There's a minute's gap now there, and I think a lap ahead of the third or fourth place car. Yes, a lap in a sector. So Aston dominating the AM category as Toyota are at the front. That's how it stands with uh, just over three hours and 35 minutes to go. There is Matt Housen in the second place KCMG car in that uh, LMP2 battle. And he is just about hanging on time-wise, but half a minute in arrears. And this is the central portion of the race that is so important to get right. Your pace, your fuel consumption, your tyre wear. Remember what Nick Manassian said, they're going to try and save a stop. He eked out three laps more than the other guys. And that's marginal, but it's normally a splash for the P2s at the end of this race. If they don't need that splash, that's a trip to the pit lane in their favour. Might not give them the win, but it'll put them up there. I think there's going to be a lot of thinking done by a lot of people after this race, and in particular, the thinking at Audi, because uh, they've been so far further off the pace. In particular, they tell us, uh, they've told Louise down in pit lane uh, to do with the straight line speed of the car, but that doesn't quite explain why it wasn't necessarily the case at Le Mans, does it? Because there you've got straight line speed. Okay, there's a difference in terms of where and how much you're allowed to use your hybrid systems, but uh, I think there's going to be a lot of thinking done as a result of what we're seeing in the first half of this race, John. But meantime, back down with the LMP2 pack, there is a number 47 car. Uh, and Matt House trying to get on the terms with Julian Canal, but Julian Canal is putting out some great times here. Uh, 134 last time around, 135 for the number 47 car. 26 and Ligier leads the way. Ahead of him, he has got. That's the uh, 37. That's uh, Victor Scheitar in fifth yep. position, so that's not in the battle, but that is. And that is a change, no, is it? No. no, that is the battle for first. In GT Pro, David A. Regog, who was three, four seconds up the road. Jimmy Bruni, as Jimmy Bruni does, has inexorably closed that gap. It was a slow lap last time around from uh, David A. Regog. And uh, was that <laughs> traffic enforced or was that tactical? He's losing grip at the rear end of that Ferrari. And here, comes Jimmy Bruni, multiple and champion in Europe. That's what a V16 Ferrari sounds like. They are very, very pretty cars. Right at the end of their development now, and Jimmy Bruni, well, it's 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 a matter of when, not if now. And Regon fighting a rear guard action, oh, squeezes Bruni me. right onto the kerb. That's not, that's not in the script, is it? That'll be a word at the air, of course, at Christmas party, won't yeah, it? It will. No, you can't do that there, Jimmy. Oh. You're going to have to wait. He'll take the wide entry, forcing David Regon, and uh, Regon lifted. Regon yeah. lifted. He let him go. Realised there was no point. I think Batty, the, uh, the of course, the team manager is probably on the on the. Um... <laughs> Jimmy is considerably quicker than you, David. <laughs> do you copy? Uh, I think. That was uh, discretion very much being the better part of Valor there. Yeah. OK. Now, what's that done to... Uh, and don't forget, that's the right way around for the championship as yeah. well. That's Can the I thing we should point mention. Out that that's actually allowed uh, Fernando Ruiz to close within the four seconds of this. And that uh, will also be something that was being yeah. watched from the pit lane. And there is Fernando Ruiz in the shot in the background there, closing in. Something like seven seconds back before that little tete-a-tete -tete happened. A Testa Rossa. Ah, very good. Testa Rattessa. Actually, Reese is closing at them at a rate of knots at the moment. He, he took a second and a half out of them last time around. And he's going to be on the back of the 71 car, Regon, very, very quickly indeed. So it was a good move for David A. Regon, whether it was his own decision or one that was uh, <coughs> made for him. Team Team order's perfectly allowed, by the way, in sports car racing. Not only allowed, indeed encouraged. This is a team sport, and as soon as you've got more than one car, you can't help but think 
that you want to put them in the right order to benefit the team as a whole. So we've had, what, uh, two and a half hours of running all bar 90, 90 seconds. seconds yep. And the top three in GTE Pro, two, the three cars, two completely different uh, makes a model of car, very different looking, sounding, uh, configured cars, three and a half seconds ahead. Well, we're talking about GT. Let's go down to Aston Martin. Craft Bamboo Racing. Alec McDowell is waiting to tell Louise all about his stint. Alex, sorry, I'm disturbing your lunch, so I'll keep it quick. Uh, we've just seen the Ferraris battling it out there. Can you get, get back up the front then? Yeah, the Ferraris seem to be really quick um, as soon as they got on the new tyres. I know the, the Ferrari behind, I think it was Collado, was catching me. But I knew towards the end of his stint, he'll start to struggle. So. They're quick at the beginning, work quick midway to the end. So theoretically, we still, we've still got the pace, even though they're probably setting the fastest times. Uh, no, it's still looking good. We're not, we're not scared at all. Great, thank you. A man from Cumbria, born in Carlisle. Don't mess with the Cumbrian. No. But, uh, uh, you know what, she's a brave girl for disturbing his lunch. Don't get me trying to in his lunch either. I think she was disturbing my lunch, actually. Uh, P2 leader on pit lane, and uh, it is... Julian Canal will stay aboard the Ligier Nissan. Another great-looking livery. Uh, this car, an addition to the championship for this team, at least, from the Circuit of the Americas last time out. This car raced for a racing uh, at Le Mans of a proving run for the new on-rock automotive, automotive designed and built coupe. That means the number 47 car goes through to lead the class again. Not quite nip and tuck stuff in LMP2, but by we had a great battle, didn't we, the lead of the class in the opening sec uh, the opening couple of stints. Chile Canal back out again. Tippy toe, I should think, while he gets the Dunlops up to temperature. So quick word about the teamwork. We were talking about team orders there, potentially, Graham, but we should also mention teamwork because, as well as the drivers, and particularly for the teams a little bit further down the order who aren't manufacturer funded, a lot of these guys are weekend warriors. A lot of them work all the time, but it's a pretty good job that they're doing. Right, let's have a look at a few of the images. Well, one of the other stars of the early part of the race was Alex Imperatori, led LMP2 under extreme pressure from Olivier Pla, and he's down to talk to Louise now. Alex, of course you had that little bit of a, a mess up in your stint, but that was superb run from you. Well, uh, yeah, it was a nice battle. Uh, I can't, I can't lie, I quite enjoyed it, but it was quite unfortunate, really, to have the Lotus in the mix. I mean, he was really getting in our way, and uh, it was quite tough because I couldn't, I couldn't get away from him. And at the same time, I had Olivier Pla behind me, and he was pushing hard. So it was uh, really balanced not to lose the lead. And I was kind of getting frustrated with the Lotus, and eventually in traffic, uh, we managed to get ahead and, and stay ahead. So from that point onwards, it was a bit easier, but I'm sure the spectators enjoyed it. More to come? Well, hopefully, you know, now we're second. Uh, the Ligier is obviously very fast. Uh, we'll see what we can do. So it was the end of the stint, we are losing a bit of uh, rear tyre performance. But uh, hopefully as the track rubbers in, we're going to pick up some, some lap time and uh, we'll see what we can do towards the end of the race. Great, thank you. Oh, and all sorts of action going on at the final corner. And that is Victor Scheitar, fifth place in P2, damage to the right rear of that car. There was a clash with the Lotus, John, going through it. Uh, Victor Scheitar trying to take the, uh, the 37 Oregon Nissan through. Just when we were hearing about the Lotus getting in the way of the P2s it, earlier. Was there. Well, I'm not sure where else he could have gone there. Uh, well, Shaitar's on the outside and he's 
tracing the outside line, isn't he? Yeah, uh, but there is some damage. The right rear, uh, they're preparing the section for the car now. So I wonder if we can see it from a ball out. Let's see. Oh, that large part of the rear bodywork has come off on the right rear. Now, uh, I just wonder whether or not we might get a yellow flag period here uh, for marshals to take that, because it is a place where you've got to go. It's the it's the pit entry. Well, it's it's been blown across out of the way. Oh, that's good. And it's actually on the side of the circuit at the moment. Well, that's that's uh, very good news. KCMG car in and out, which will put Julian Canal back into the lead. Trying to look that far There's back. There's yellow turn. flag a pit in for that debris. Yeah, green just before they get to us. And the SMP racing car goes into the pits in the box. That's a shame. That CLM chassis not quite up to pace yet, is it? No. Um, and as you said before, frustratingly, is very fast down the tubes down the straight but does not seem to have the handling balance there is the offending piece of carbon fiber i think they want to get rid of that um because you're not allowed across that line mm -hmm. true somebody could just nose it out of the way please that'd be very good and you can see the victor's not very happy there shaking his head um, just hearing though interestingly just hearing imperatory alex imperatory just uh bemoaning the fact that the Lotus was rather getting in his way, the Lotus team car. Well, we saw that, didn't we? I mean, I think the reality is it's got clear strengths at the moment, huge straight line speed compared to the P2 cars at the very least, but uh, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of the, the handling, the balance of the car. And there's not a lot on the, the even the, the, the drivers, the very high quality the team have got to do about that. That just needs testing, it needs time. Yeah, that looks like it might be nothing more than that rear section and being replaced. I think they've got away without any suspension damage. They'll be worried about radiators and things in the side port. If you, if you have a listen, uh, we get a chance. We're going to see it again now. Right, you can see he sees him. He's right on the outside. And James Rossiter is not... Oh, it's very unlucky, actually, that he just clips the rear end. It's a shame we didn't see that from above. Yeah, see where James' line was. Mm. You do let yourself breathe in the middle of that corner in James's defence, but there would have appeared to be enough room to get both cars through there. The question is, bearing in mind we know the restricted vision from a coupe, did James know he was there? It may well have been in James's blind spot. I wouldn't be remotely surprised to hear that from James Roster. The nine is in. In the meantime, if you ever listen to the SP Racing crew, you'll hear a lot of Italian voices because this is, of course, another car run by of Corsa. And uh, next year, um, the plan is that we won't be seeing SMP racing running Oricas. We'll be seeing SMP racing running SMPs or something similar. Oh, really? They are having a brand new car built. P2. P2 car. Two cars for the WEC, we were told, at Le Mans. Full course yellow. First time we've seen it. Now, this is not a safety car. This is FCY. And everybody must slow down immediately. And this is what we're seeing now. Must maintain the gap. And... One or two people are not taking enough note of what's going on. If this was a safety car, that would say SC and not FCY. Full course yellow. This is what's called a quickie yellow. Eduardo Freitas has deployed one of these at Silverstone a couple of years ago for some body work. He will not put the safety car out here. Think of this like code 60 in the Creventic. That's the perfect use for it. Out comes SMP Racing number 37. That car will back on the run at the moment now any time now we will see the full course yellow be brought in we don't have to wait for a safety car to get back to a line or the the leader to get back to the line we haven't had to do any wave rounds pass bys whatever and we will get back to racing in the merest hint of time i know this frustrates people but i think that's a good use of it and so far he says eduardo freitas and his team have played a blinder this afternoon. The irony now would be if Victor Chartel was pinged for spinning on pit lane, wouldn't it? But no, uh, actually, he'll be fine. He knows he's coming out to a full course caution. Look, he's joining in. 
We said before, John, that you know this is an area of uh, race operations, the way in which you handle... Audi number one in the pits, Grib, sorry. Yep. The way in which you handle these kind of situations, uh, that really there needs to just be global best practice looked at. In car now, number one, as it, it grinds down, I think it's fair to say, to its pit box. And we'll then hear that spooling down as it finishes the spin cycle, That's a goes short, to rinse. That is a short, short run for Degrassi. He was in last on 71. He's only done 32 laps there. I wonder if the full course caution has given them an opportunity to come in. Now, the, uh, the debris is gone. I just wonder whether or not there's something else they want to sort out while we're under this caution period. Can't see it. Uh, the full course caution will be removed at 13.39.30, right? So everybody knows. Five seconds. That's five, four, three, two, one. The yellow lights come in now. And there is everything. You hear the noise go up, the green flag goes out. And that's to coordinate. The reason there's just a little moment at the end is just to coordinate everybody. Although some people not up to speed there. As the leader gets up to a gaggle of cars going through turn seven. And again... Sorry, guys, but that's drivers not looking. That that was... Uh, because there was green flags out there. That was. There was a to I think it was a Toto looking to get by it one was of the Aston Martins. It was a Porsche trying to get by the Aston Martin. It went to make the move, then then, then basically that checked was, up. That was Timo Bernhard trying to stay on the lead lap, I think. Yeah, checked up so, so heavily that actually was nearly collected from behind by one of the Totas. But the reason that they give that just that minute or so more, there is a time set about a minute or so into the future. All of the marshals know it, and everyone on the pit lane knows it as well. It's which, displayed on the timing screen. Which means they can communicate that to the drivers and count them down to it. So we've had a full course caution without the safety car. The debris has been removed. Nobody's had to do wave around. We haven't had to rebalance the field. And the marshal was able to run out safely and grab the piece of debris. Result. And that took how long? Two laps. How on it, Lantern? I, it's, I like the fact that Eduardo Freitas and the FIA WEC team, along with the ACO, are prepared to move with the times. When they introduced the slow zones at Le Mans uh, this year, that was a, a hybrid solution, if you will, uh, using a, a hybrid of uh, the slow zones at the Nürburgring and Code 60 from the Creventing events that we've talked about, and this full course caution is much like a Code 60. Well, look at Degrassi was right in the mix earlier on, wasn't he? He's just got out of the Audi. Tom Christensen has gone in. Lucas, you just handed over to Tom. How was that for you? Well, um, uh, quite a good uh, track to be driving, but. Uh of course, we, this track faces some challenges for us, bigger than, other, bigger than others, but um, Audi is a great team. I'm sure the race is still a long time to go, so we're going to do our best to, to achieve the best result possible. Thank you. Smart for those guys. Uh, I think they were two or three laps early there, but they're 1 minute 22, 23 seconds in the pits, part of which was under the full course caution, full course yellow. The lose less time, simple as that. As the leader, Anthony Davidson, stayed out. I reckon he's due in about three laps time. Beautiful drift from Ant and the air to car. High speed cameras now are just great. Into the pits comes the 35. Alex Brundle had taken that car out. He's from third position. Dude. And there is uh, Sebastian Buemi waiting to be reinstalled into the lead car. Built a decent working relationship, haven't they? Down at uh, Toyota with uh, driver pairings or triplings. Yep, it was, uh, you know, you're never sure, are you, when you've got a, a new works team, and they pull together a squad. Sometimes it works, sometimes it took Peugeot saw... a little while, didn't it, it? Did. to get Peugeot. the right people in the right yeah, car with the right people. A lot of people that appeared for a race or two and we never ever saw again. But uh, it's got to be said with Toyota, they, they did a very good job right from the off. Now, I think, as I say, Anthony, if he wants to, could go to lap 109. That's uh, 
He's on 107 now. Now watch the difference in speed here. We saw the Audi barely cracking 285. And already 300. 38. 39, just. 309 kilometers an hour, which is uh, 191 miles an hour. It's quick enough, isn't it? That do me. Look at the G-loading on the left-hand side as well, the little green dot. 3G. Again, talking to Alex Vert for Toyota Tech Talk on RadioLeMond.com uh, this week. Just seeing that they are pulling similar G-levels to Formula 1 cars. Not quite as much because the cars are a little heavier, but very similar. And considering these cars are half as heavy against an F1 car and have less power, the kind of performance that you're getting out of the mark is quite remarkable. It's worth listening to uh, to that. We'll have it on the archive for you on RadioLamont.com in the next uh, few days. Impressive stuff again here from Toyota. Uh, 3.2 seconds, the gap between the two cars. And uh, very considerably ahead now of Neil Yanni. In uh, LMP2. See there, 3.2 is a lap ahead now of the Orianni, so just the Toyotas at the moment on the lead lap, job. Tom Christensen sets a 29.8 early in the stint for the Audi. No, I think Neil Yanni is just on the end of the lead lap. Is he? No, he's, no, not. he's not. He's lost a lap. He has. It's just the two Toyotas separated by four seconds, three and a half seconds, that are on lap number 108. Neil have complete lap number 108. Neil Yanni will come through in a moment and we are expecting a stop. Seven car. It should be the seven car first. Yep. It's, uh, and Alex Vert stalks out. Now, if they're... Alex with his trademark different coloured boots on for... And trademark blue balaclava uh, with his bank robber look, I think. With the piece up the middle, yeah. Yep. I've got one like that. My new Adidas one doesn't have the piece on the nose. On board with Stefan Saras now. So, is he coming in this time? This will be lap 100 and the 109 for him. That would be a long stint for the seven car, although we have had that full course yellow for a couple of laps. That would be a 37 lap stint for the Toyota if it comes in this and it time. Comes in and to it pit does. In now, let's see how quickly Stefan makes this pit in. Pretty quick. Yeah, they've all been they've all been watching Weber, haven't they? Yeah, certainly. They we weren't doing that in the early part of the week. Weber and Lotterer were astonishing. Street circuit accuracy. Yes. I would expect Andy Davidson in at the end of his next lap to have also done a 37 lap stint. Might try to stretch it to a 38. And then next in should be the 14 Porsche. Did we see the 14 Porsche in? No, we didn't, did we? No. Well. Let's have a listen to see if they could have called him in now. This is Neil Yarny on the phone back to base. Yeah, Neil, two laps to go, two laps to go. Maybe three, maybe three before driver change. Hmm. Well, there is the number eight car right up behind him. So he is just still just on the lead lap. Yeah, I thought he was. It's just literally that amount of time. But he's got a pit stop to come. But as has Anthony Davidson. I think Anthony Davidson will be in at the end of this lap. Give the Porsche to get some breathing space if he can. Watch him punch away. Andy Davidson will pull, peel off to the right. He does. And on lap number 110, the end of lap 110 for Davidson, he'll be in the pits, and that is a 37-lap stint for him. Now, the question is, does the Porsche get back by the other Toyota? It's going to be close. This is not a battle for position. That is to get back on the lead lap. Spurts pulls out. Actually, that was a battle, a battle position. position. 
that is Yarny taking the lead, isn't it? Yeah. That is Neil Yarny going through into the lead for Porsche, no. which he will hold for a couple of laps. No, it's not. Sorry, it's not. Because Davidson's already Correct. in the pit lane. He's gone into second, though. That is a proper that is a proper battle for second now for a couple of laps, whilst the Porsche is out there. And it depends how Alex Verts, how hard Alex wants to push. But we saw it the start of the race at Texas. He liked to go around the I outside. Think I think reasonably hard there. Yeah. <laughs> I think he didn't want to hang about, did no, he? Uh, they're, they're looking to make progress. Well, also, there's a battle between the two Toyotas, and that uh, common thought that if you can get your pit stop done first and get a good in and an out lap that you can make here. It was only two seconds, remember? Yeah. Tyres going on now in pit lane. On it's going to be close. Eight car, and it's rolling. Mm, not that close. It's not going to be that close, is it? But they've made a little bit of progress here. The lead car has, yeah. I think they have. Because it, they're about halfway down the pit lane. It's such a long front straight here. Where's Alex? Here he comes past the start finish line now. And there is the side by side picture. And I would say that the eight car net gain there. In comes the 14. Uh, definitely. Uh, four course yellow speeds are under investigation. Oh, well, there's a few people who need to have their hands slapped. Yep, we hear from Mission Control and Race Control over there. It's another 37 laps in. 37 seems to be the magic number. Certainly, I spotted a couple of GT cars that had just not seen the full course yellow as they came past us. Well, you know, if it's going to work, it's got to be adhered to. The only way you're going to make people adhere to it is make it hurt for them if, if they, they don't. don't. It's your job as a driver to be aware. There can be extenuating circumstances if somebody's spinning or upside down and fire in front of you. It was actually a very easy way for them to tell, which is you take a lap chart, mm -hmm. which they've got access to, mm -hmm. the lap before, mm -hmm. you take a lap chart, lap after, mm -hmm. and if there's a dramatic difference, someone needs to come in for a meeting with our biscuits. Well, Al, Al Kamel, who are our timing partners in the WEC, can give you a breakdown on sector. So as you've gone across the lines of various sectors, they'll be able to tell. And uh, this being a top quality circuit, WEC only races on Category 1 circuits. Yeah. I'm prepared to bet that amongst the cars that uh, might well be... Oh, now this is interesting. Out comes the Porsche. Is he going to hold on the lead lap? No, he's not. And that is him going the lap down again. Indeed. But that's a lap down to Buemi. Uh, he's still ahead on track of Alex Verts, isn't he? So he's not a lap down to Verts yet. Correct. And it's the team of Bernhard Porsche, Porsche, who is in in third position at the moment. Still very bright out there, misty across to the mountains in the distance. Yeah. He's dropped down to fifth position with that stop. Roman Dumas now be behind the wheel. Seven. 51 and 98 for improving under yellows. Turn nine. And I wonder that if that was when the Ferrari was... Uh, uh, I think it is. Uh, so that is the number seven. Or was that under full course caution? Uh, 7.51 and 98 under yellow in turn nine in the full course yellow. Uh, and none of the turn nine incident. Yep, there we go. Yep. So okay. that's the preview. That was when the Ferrari was being pulled behind the wall. Well, John, that is the second place overall car. It is the leader in GT Pro and the second place car in GT Am. So yep. all three significant players in this race. And we were talking about how important it is for the drivers and the teams to play their part here. And doubled wave yellows at a part on the circuit. If you're not going to respect them, then you'll have to expect the consequences. Now, we'll wait to see how this plays out. I'm not pointing the finger at any of those cars or the drivers that were on board at the time. However, if they are found to have improved under yellow, then they will get punished. And, uh, and I it has to be that way. I, I think it, it's going to be something fairly considerable. It will be at least, at least a drive-through. Oh, I think it'll be a stop and hold. I think it'll be a stop and hold. Um, I haven't uh, got the rule book with me. I'm remiss of me not to have brought that with me. 
We're at seven minutes, uh, six and a half minutes now from the halfway point in this race, John. It's flown by, hasn't it? Into the pits at the moment comes the number 97 car. This is the Aston Martin Racing. This is the car that's had the problems from early on, and Darren Turner brings it back in the pit lane. Remember, that car is the one with the eye patch on the right-hand side. And the solar panels on the roof. Oh, we said it out loud. Mm. Interesting uh, bit of tech. This. We'll have a look at that and remind you about that when we see it later on. Meanwhile, down the pit straight now. Not seeing that dramatic difference in pace here, that number seven Toyota. Not really closing at that stage, but now the additional straight line speed comes into play. Ducks out from the toe behind the number two car, under braking. Goes by with ease. Verts then, with the Audi number two behind him, of uh, Ben Trollier now behind the wheel. Now Verts will be pushing, it was just on two seconds, it's gone out to six and a half, the gap between he himself and the leader. Look how close he sits to the wheel there, none of your straight out arms now sitting in these cars as you would a Formula car. Alex looking across the corner again there. You can tell it's a left-hander because he's looking across looking at his exit point. There is Ben Trellier behind him. The seating position in these sports cars now, much as a Formula car, which means your bo bottom is very low and your feet are out in front of you up higher. It's like sitting with your feet up on the end of a bath. Well, this was earlier on today. The crowds have come out in force here at Fuji, and they're being well catered for, both in body and mind. And no matter how young or old, there is something for everyone. Some more successful than others. The WEC area in the fan zone behind us. Stickers, hats and flags have been all the rage. A fantastic array of 43rds and 18th scale models. And the opportunity to watch on the big screen as well if you've stepped away from the action in the grandstands. There'll be a lot of people now waving at themselves on that big screen behind us. This is the number eight, the leader, Sebastian Boemi. Just the two drivers in the eight car this weekend. Not reading anything into that. And Davison and Boemi. Bit of personal problems for their teammate, which has kept him out of the car, but uh, Toyota very keen to point out that that is purely an issue and for their driver, and that uh, his contract for next year is confirmed. Let's have a listen to Mathieu Linnell talking to Seb. Gap is 6.4 on Alex, 32 on Bernard, one minute on Christensen. Good job. Situation under control. Mathieu Linnell. Situation under control. Situation under control. Like it. Well, it's that's what you want to hear as a racing driver, isn't absolutely it? Absolutely impressive stuff here from both Toyotas. The team as a whole, eight seconds between the two. And a country mile between them and anybody else. Well, only the number 20 Porsche holding on at the moment now. They're out of sync and they will do, be due a pit stop in. Uh, 114, 117, two laps time. So they'll drop back down, and then it will be Tom Christensen who is the best of the rest. Worth saying, John, we mentioned uh, Toyota's stake in this track. Toyota don't test here, of course. No. Uh, the team based in Europe, what they will have is pretty faultless simulator data. Oh, yes. Uh, and that, and they've sure got a very good simulator, as oh, you and I both very, know. very good simulator, uh, which uh, certainly will play a part, but uh, there's certainly no unfair advantage about racing here for Toyota. They just happen to be pretty good at it. They've got a car that clearly delivers with the, well, the very different aspects of this track. Across the start-finish line for 
Sebastian Boemi. And uh, he's lifting there, but barely slowing down, and he's not breaking. There are the Toyota supporters. Here's Alex in second place, Alex Verts, with just 90 seconds to go to half distance. And Alex tantalizingly close to his teammate. Still within striking distance, should there be a fumble? I think that's... You know, eight seconds sounds a long way, doesn't it? But all it takes is to get offline. Third position at the moment, then, is Timo Bernhard Dewey. In a couple of laps' time, the 20 car. I think close enough here, John. I think the tactic now is don't put each other under pressure. Do your own thing. But uh, from Alex's point of view, if there's any kind of issue whatsoever for the leader, he's right there. Uh, meantime, up to pit lane at the moment comes Jimmy Bruni from second place in GTE Pro. And this, of course, one of the cars that we're going to see is going to get into problems here. And again, just on the 292, 293. So that is a considerable speed disadvantage that Audi have here. And over at Ingolstadt, soon moving to Neustadt. Audi Sport moving to the new town where they have everything under one roof. Now, Mark Webber's done for the day, isn't he? He's in his civvies. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So they're going to double stint, double stint, double stint. So it'll be Brendan Hartley in to finish by the look of things. Well, let's have a listen to see what the Audi plans are with regard to Ben Trelluay at least. OK, Ben, how is the understeer now? And, uh, yeah, it's a bit better, but it's not really good. Uh, if I break hard, I feel I'm really stability. There's Lena Gade, the chief engineer for the two car, talking to Ben Trelluay. Sounds like they've got real handling issues there. Understeer, yeah, yeah it's bad, and if I break them too hard and too deep, the back breaks away as well, is basically what Ben was saying. So I've got a car that doesn't want me to point it the way I want it to go. They're not having a very good day, really. I think this is the part of the problem is it, when you're having not a very good day, smaller problems can feel like bigger problems, and bigger problems can feel overwhelming. And uh, well, The yeah. Audi way is to just keep on trucking, Absolutely. isn't it? There is the 26G drive Leisure Coupe. Uh, GTE leader in the pits now. This is the number 71 car making its way down pit lane. That's the leader of P2. That's uh, Olivia, uh, Julian Canal rather, back in that car, in that car. Hearing, by the way, that whilst we've been talking about the tyres in P1, and none of the team's able to double stint them, that all the Dunlop runners are double stinting their tyres yeah. in the LMP2. That's the classification at the halfway point. Toyota lead significantly from a Porsche that will pitch shortly and leave that huge gap back to the Audi. Toyota dominating this race with Porsche in fifth and Audi in sixth position. The leader in P2 is that GV Jive car you've just seen. Aston Martin back in the lead of both of the GTE categories, but pit stops uh, due there as well. Shortly, we'll shake that up again. It's a great battle between Aston Martin and the two AF courses in the Pro category, and Aston Martin at the two, and a Ferrari and a Porsche uh, in the AM class. So a half distance of the fifth round of the World Endurance Championship, the FIA World Endurance Championship here at Fuji in front of a large and enthusiastic crowd who enjoyed the pre-race and enjoyed the first few laps of the race, I'm sure, even more, because what we had was a barnstormer. Sebastian Buemi from the pole position in the eight Toyota, coming under pressure immediately from Mark Webber in the 20 Porsche. The Audi's getting involved as well. All three manufacturers, almost unbelievably, would lead at some stage on the first lap of the race. Weber got through, but behind there was uh, Aston on Aston, blue on blue uh, incident, which saw the 97 and the 99 car coming together. Darren Turner just unable to get out the way of his teammate. Well, Porsche led, then Audi led, Toyota had led off the line. The battle in LMP2, Alex Imperatore making a slight mistake while lapping the 88 car. 
And today, the story for Audi about lack of straight line speed. Wolfgang Ulrich, Dr. Ulrich, clearly accepting that it was going to be a tough day. Tyre wear has been a problem. Mark Webber not adding, uh, not helping that rather, adding to it with a slight mistake. Paul Dallalana spinning the 95 car. No, that wasn't uh, Paul Dallalana, excuse me. That was Heinemeyer Hansen. We'll see Paul spinning in a moment. Mark Webber again struggling with braking, giving up a position back to the one car. Had a slow puncture earlier on as well, but he did come back to lead the race. Paul Dallalana spinning next to Anthony Davidson, who, with Zen-like capability, managed to avoid that. And the SMP racing car found itself facing the wrong directions a couple of times. Mark Webber having to give up the position there to the seven Toyota. In fairness, was due into the pitch shortly. We're going to pick up some, some lap time and uh, we'll see what we can do towards the end of the race. Great, thank you. And then the incident between the CLM Lotus, which caused a full course yellow, not a safety car. Everyone being told to slow down and hold their position and pretty well observed there. And am I handsome back at the head of the field, but it's been a cracking battle between Aston and Ferrari at the head of the pros. But now it's G-Drive that leads again in P2. And Toyota have bossed the head of the field. The eight from the seven, first and second now with Sebastian Buemi and Alex Wirtz back at the wheel of the eight and seven, respectively. So there is our leader. And the Swiss driver, Sebastian Buemi. Now, let's uh, find out what's happening with Timor. Should be in the pit shortly. Okay, hey, mate, the plan is fuel and tyres the next stop. Fuel and tyres is the next stop. Leaving him in, presumably, I think, Graham, there. I think so. Now, there's that 20 car should be in uh, 84. Now. We're on lap 22. <laughs> yeah. 21 for the Porsche. Yeah. He's due in any time now. These, it's amazing to me how well the ACO and the FIA have done in terms of... He's not coming in this time of balancing the performance of these very different propositions, these different drive chains and hybrid systems. You know, you've got a big diesel engine, you've got a very small turbocharged petrol engine in this Porsche, you've got a bigger, normally aspirated or uncharged, be it supercharged or turbocharged, gasoline engine as well. You've got three very different hybrid systems, and yet, and we're yet. seeing them, yeah, yeah. We're seeing them do remarkably similar lap times, remarkably similar on their fuel consumption as well, because they're getting roughly the same amount of laps. And what? just look, is, is this not poetry in motion? Uh, it is best looking in cars on the planet, the racing cars at the moment. And and you know, it is some very hard stuff that's done extraordinarily well. It has to be said, and you know, it's it's a pleasure to be able to say, John, that this is the first time we've seen any of these cars in level competition actually outclassed on the track this mm -hmm. season. And yeah. That's because the Audi simply doesn't have straight line speed. The when we first saw a couple of three years ago the draft regulations that have brought us to this point in sports car racing from the ACO with the FIA, it seemed very, very very, very complicated. Fuel level, fuel level low. Acknowledge and box, box now for fuel and tyres, mate, box now for fuel and tyres. And that's, again, exactly what happened to Mark Webber. It seemed to be almost uh, a late decision whether they would do one more lap or two. Let me just get this thought finished. When we saw the, uh, the draft regulations, they looked very, very complicated. Lots of figures, lots of equations. What it's turned out to be is a set of regulations that have produced different 
cars, still the variety that we love in sports cars, and great racing. Uh, great we racing. haven't had to talk about the regulations, it's just what we're seeing on the track. Well, I can remember the, the prologue test being asked in as we see the number 20 car being fueled right now, being asked just to bear in mind that we, you know, that the championship didn't want the way in which people at the, uh, the World Endurance Championship talked about to be dominated by the technology, or rather by exploitations of the technology, that the racing was extremely important. It's never been an issue, never been an issue at all this season. Which is great. Now, I, I, mean, I actually think the technology is part of the story, but I understand that if we're talking about cars that are 15 and 20 laps apart, and we're having to talk, oh, hello, little bit of a little bit of a two-step to get round the wheel, He's going to give his uh, partner a little bit of a hard time there, I think. Um, you don't want to be talking about why what you're watching is interesting. You just want to be able to see it. A rather untidy stop there by Porsche in the last third. Well, out goes Timo Bernard. Now, will that cost him track position? Uh, Trelli, uh, Roman Dumais' teammate has gone through. Trellewe has gone through as well. So, yes, it did cost him an extra couple of seconds. Yeah, that was about five seconds. You know, it doesn't look much, does it? Well, that was five seconds longer than it needed to be. Well, count to five, uh, loud, mm. while you're watching one of these cars. See how much ground it covers. Exactly. Mm. And it's uh, certainly true, John, that uh, you're dealing in you know, with these cars, as evenly matched as they are, we're dealing even with the Audis, we're talking here about tenths. Uh, you lose a second or two or three or four or even five in the pit lane, that's a big deal on track. That's the kind of gap you're going to struggle without an error from uh, one of the cars involved to, to make up an stint. Stay on board here with the number two car for a moment. That's, uh, you just see how hard these guys are working. The number two Audi now. Making its way through. Onto the start, finish straight. This great camera angle we've got here. The final turn. Yeah, from up above Panasonic. Now, Jimmy Bruni has uh, got out of the Ferrari that has been such a main part of our coverage because it's been fighting at the head of the field. Currently sits in second position with Tony Volander at the wheel. That means we can talk to Jimmy. Jimmy, you've been a busy man this morning, all day in fact. Uh, how was it for you? Uh, it was very good fighting. Uh, I start fifth, uh, and after I went up to first, but apparently I get a track limit, and uh, I get a Tony. Uh, he did a drive-through penalty. I went back to third, uh, 16 seconds behind the leader. I catch him, I pass him, uh, and after I was in the front, and I don't know. No, it's OK. It's a bit of cat and mouse between you and the Aston Martin. Can you uh, keep ahead of them? Hey, they're fast. Uh, we'll see. Still uh, three hours, uh, less than three hours to go. We'll see. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I managed to smile at the end. I don't think he was overly happy about the... Drivers are never happy about being penalised. No, no. Jimmy does tend to wear his heartless sleeve, it has to be said, uh, but he's been around the block enough to know the rules are there for a reason. And, uh, world class driver and a world class team and a world class car, and indeed a world champion. Mm. He will accept that and move on. And, uh... Now that is an Audi coming in. That must be the number two car. If it's on schedule, yes it is. That will put him out of fifth position, his fourth pit stop on his lap 124. And we presume full service again. And that's a 37 lap stint for that car. So 37 is the number. We thought Toyota might, and in fact, we have had the 14 Porsche and the eight Toyota do 38 lap stints, but those are the only two so far. Yeah, there's tyres going on, shiny new Michelins. That very distinctive 
sheen on a brand new Michelin. And the reason for that is because the moulds that they're making them in has tiny little bits of silver as a relief agent, as a silver oxide. And that's why they have such a sheen on the Michelin tyres. Out comes the number two. Ben Trallier rejoins the action and will come out in sixth position. So we are now looking at uh, Tom Christensen as the best of the Audis, who has stealthed up to third position. Absolutely. And got himself ahead of the two Porsches. And that was because that car came in a tad early, remember, three or four laps early, but whilst the full course caution was out. Yep, that's exactly as you said, John. That's a smart piece of thinking by the guys on the pit lane. Kyle wilson Clark and the rest of the team would have made that decision. The other thing about full course caution is the pits don't close. No. At either end. No. Full course yellow, excuse me. Basically, you're under a, like a code 60. And your pit lane speed limit is pretty much the same speed that the cars are going on the track, so the only loss is the absolute time that you're stationary. So that was a smart thing to do. And indeed has uh, put him into a potential podium position now. Which I don't think they would have been expecting earlier on. Well, it's made him, uh, but he's given a 27 second gap now to the 14 Porsche. Which has, took, which has been taking about half a second a lap from him. Table burnt hard a little more, about a second a lap. But, you know, that's the better part of a stint to make that back again. Absolutely right. Clever, clever stuff from the always clever Audi Sport guys. So well, even with the advantage they've got, they've still found an advantage somewhere. And, you know, talking about Timo Bernard being a second a lap quicker than Tom Christensen, but the five second fumble in the pits means that's five second, five laps more that it will take him to catch him. Yep. And that's exactly what you were saying in terms of time lost and gained. The only problem for the uh, the early sports team is, is in championship terms, it's the wrong car. Because, of course, it's the two crew that at the moment are riding higher. Yes, fair point. But still, that will be at least some soccer to them. Well, it's been a very difficult day indeed for early sports. Back on board now with the number eight car. This is the lead car, of course, Sebastian Buemi. Great shot of this. There's still packed stands there. Go past the wave flags. Toto flags, not yellow flags. Well over 300 kilometers an hour before he gets into the braking zone. Looking for the apex. Just about perfect through there. And at this point, it must be feeling Pretty good for Toyota. It's been a spectacular first half hour, wasn't it, John? But then mm. after that, once things started to settle down, and in particular, once the Toyotas seemed to get the measure of the Porsche, and once we'd all settled down to realising that, no, you can't double stint the tyres, mm. then it has very much been Toyota's day. Roman Dumas behind the wheel of the 14. He's been talking to the pit wall. I have no power. I have no power to the lead. No power. OK, copy, Roman, copy. Now, we heard that exact message at Texas. And he's just done a, minute, a 1 minute 34 uh, lap. He's in trouble. Exactly the same message we've seen from this car before it's he's got no punch out the corners John watch the car as it accelerates out of the corners or doesn't as the case may be we've seen Roman Dubai doing a full hard reboot of the systems at Spa before Le Mans this season we've seen the Porsches have a result taken away from them effectively at Coulter when they could well have done well very well indeed there might even been a win on the cards let's hear how this uh, Situation is developing. Yeah, try to manual boost, try to manual boost. Doesn't work, doesn't work. No manual boost. 
Yeah, driver had already tried that big lock up in front of Roman Dumas in the turn one. But he's far more concerned about what's going on with his hybrid. Now, look at the hybrid. The hybrid's not being used, Graham. It's staying fully uh, charged. And uh, just to confirm what uh, Roman was being asked to do, is a manual reboot, wasn't it? And he said, I've tried, it doesn't work. Mm. And, uh, the, the net effect on the timing screens is he is a full four, five, six seconds slower than the other factory cars at the moment. And it's not going to be very much longer before he's reeled in by his teammate. Timo Bernard at the moment is, what, something like 15 seconds back. But this pace, that's about two and a half laps. Before Timo Bernard, in the number 20 car, is on the back end of the 14. And the question is, how much longer can they afford to leave him out like this? Because he's got a way to go in his fuel still, is he not, John? Uh, the 14 car was last in on lap 110. So, really, he should be looking at another 10 or 12 laps. Yep. And here comes the 20 in pursuit. Timo Bernhard and Roman Dumas for such a long time, teammates in both GTs and prototypes. I think he may have managed to get some of this back. If we see the, um, the onboard telemetry again, and my guess is because he's just put in a 131. That's rather more like it. But still off the ultimate pace. But uh, he may have just got that back for part of a lap. So I wonder whether or not another reboot has done the job. Do you remember they left him out at Spa with the car crawling around? They yep. didn't bring him in, which we thought was odd. It's more like a 434, wasn't it? At mm. that stage, it really was. I mean, oh, white, white flag territory. But as one of our sage listeners and viewers said how would he know if it was fixed if he didn't fix it out on the track let's hear what he's got to say now okay to walk again to walk again that was relief <laughs> and there you go it's managed to come back what was that we were saying about these ultra reliable systems well I'm going to say something here. It's warmer than it has been any other time in the weighing games. You're absolutely right. And the battery packs on the Porsche are prone. Look, yes, he's been using his hybrid there. Look, you can see the little green tower goes down. That will recharge as he goes across the line, not because he has found a whole load of electricity somewhere, but because he's allowed to use it again. And there it goes. He's back up to full. Yeah. I'm expecting to see that boosting a little bit there. Wow. 300 kilometers easily there yeah and uh, it just you know it, it is this kind of almost resetting of their expectation isn't it they, look they've got something like five six hundred horsepower under their right foot three or seven for the 20 car but of Seymour Bernard but if you um, so it's not quite up to speed yet but uh, if you remove that boost now it's something these guys have adapted to they've got used to and I wouldn't quite well, say power is addictive. There's no doubt about that. You know, you can't take away two or three hundred horsepower and not notice it. These guys are good enough to notice 20 horsepower going missing. Never mind 10 or 20 times that amount. I think that was the point. Was there was a degree of I wouldn't say panic, but uh, oh. real, real concern. Help! And you know, the reality was he was losing four or five seconds, and not 25 seconds. Mark Webber still has the fastest lap of the race. That was way back on lap 12, 127.75. The, uh, the issue, though, temporary though it was for the time being for Roman Dumas, has allowed his old sparring partner, well, his old teammate uh, in the Audi that uh, won the monocourse together before going back to Porsche, Timo Bernhard, to close within 13 seconds. So it probably cost him. 15 seconds or so. Let's hear what uh, Toyota is saying to Seb. Good job, uh, good job. Uh, Seb Gap 19 on uh, Alex and 1 minute 20. For the second set, you will join him in two laps. Just the gap being talked about. There, it's uh, comfortable stuff at the moment. 
But uh, always struggle to say these kind of things. When we look at the, this is Keiko O'Hara, climbing aboard the 35 Morgan Judd. Boat racing with this car in the WEC for the next three races with a varied driver crew. The only Judd engine, to be a BMW based engine, the Judd, in the WEC for the moment. And uh, as we look at the 35 car, we see the class leader, Julian Canal, into the pits. Now, my guess would be this might be time for Julian to get out, wouldn't it, will it not? And that will mean Roman Rusinov is due aboard. So, on ropes, last product, the Morgan chassis, open chassis with the Judd engine, replaced by this car. This is the 26 car, this is the Vigier JS P2. This and V8 engine in the rear of this car. Fueling now. Looks like it's uh, ready for the Dunlops. At the end of another double stint. You can see up the side of the engine cover there. Bits of rubber. Absolutely. That, see why they call them marbles, can't you? They do look yeah. like little squashed bits of rubber just peeling off the faces of the tyre. New set of Dunlops there. They are literally sticker tyres, look. They had a sticker on them to say what they were. Yeah, so the Dunlop runners doubling their tyres. Interesting. Oh, a little bit of a problem on the right rear. But it does fire up and go. That is achingly pretty, that car. Not only have we got the best technology and the most relevant technology and the most forward-thinking technology in sports cars, we do have some good-looking cars, don't we? And Coupes are leading the way. Nothing against the open-top cars. I do like them. I do find them. They look very aggressive, but there is something about a closed-top prototype that is otherworldly. One blue lights on the side of the and meantime, the KCMG car, last time to win it, win it last time out rather, and it's going to be Richard Bradley. Brit Matt House uh, hands over to Brit Richard Bradley. There's something we're following here mm -hmm. this neck of the woods. Dar was, sorry, go, go ahead. Darrell or Young got into the 99 car. I think that's yep. his first time behind the it wheel. Is, and from the lead of GTE Pro, and uh, rejoins in third position behind the two. They, of course, are Ferraris. Here comes Richard Bradley on track now. I think made his WC debut here last year. And, uh, the car they're looking to try to beat in points terms is the one we're looking at now. This is the number 27 car. This is the SMP Racing Orica Nissan. Michelin tires for this car. Second place overall at the moment in the class. Right now, Maurizio Mediani at the wheel. Sergei Zlobin still to come. And it is Sergei that is the points leader of the championship, courtesy of a bit of mix and match amongst the cars which shuffled the order rather for them on. And the 27 car we're looking at now, the only finisher from the WEC full season cars at the Mon after woes for all the other cars we've been looking at so far. This race. 99, this is Darrell Young aboard the car for the first time. The shareholder in, Craft Bamboo. Mm. And uh, long time racer in GT's WTCC, I think Darrell did for quite a while, did he not? Yeah, he did. In Chevy's and various other things, he's driven uh, Asian Carrera Cup. Regular at the Asian Festival of Spain and Macau. Said it'd been a tough year for Craft Bamboo Racing, not just in the racing sense as well. They lost one of their founders, Nigel Vol Volcard, had a bizarre and tragic mountain biking accident that he eventually succumbed to earlier in the year, just before Spa. In fact, it was uh, the Friday of the Spa weekend that uh, Nigel passed away. A very big character, much missed. Meantime, the number 75 car, this is the Pro Speed car. We're talking about the 
Really rather wonderful livery on this car. It's nice enough when you see it uh, just in profile, but when you see it as a whole, it just flows. And uh, the 75 car, what is that, uh, fourth position in GTE Am, Emmanuel Collard brought the car in. This is how pretty a GTE car can look. It's a 75, a 71 car, how I do apologize. How flat the curbs are. You want to be absolutely curves. nailing those, don't you? This is Jim Ricardo. It's art. It's not just motor racing. Two seconds, the gap between Collado and Villander. Stone again. Here you get the opportunity to see the difference in uh, in uh, straight line speed between an LMP2 and a GTE. The answer is not much. And all too often it's the GTE that is the quicker when they get to VMAX. Big power. So the championship leader. The 51 car leads this race. That'll be bad news for the rest of them. And it's got a rear gunner this time around. Yes, it does. Good point. It's actually great to see the two running in formation. It's been a learning year for James Collado. He's learned quickly, though. Hasn't he just? Still very much uh, a young driver, James, and with the background that he has in uh, single-seaters and now GTs. Just wonder what his next move will be. He's 25, well, there you go, 25 years old. James Collado, plenty of life in him. Tony Vilander burst on the scene a few years ago. I remember him coming across to the States and planting a car on pole position the first time he'd seen, he had seen uh, Lime Rock Park, which is pretty remarkable for those of you who know that circuit. It's a short but very fast and committed lap, and the fin took to it like a duck to water. And Collado must be, uh, I think, looking 10 years down the road at someone like Vreelander and thinking, I've got a decent career here in sports cars. It's more or less a conversation I have with both him and with Sam Bird, who was with the team for a couple of races this year. The two of them uh, had a shootout for this seat. It is a, a factory Ferrari drive. Their employer is Ferrari, not here, of Corsa. Sam Bird, another driver, you know, really. How has he not got further on? A fantastic single-seater driver. No lack of talent whatsoever. Remember uh, being told that Sam, I think I'm right in saying, produced uh, in his uh, first race at Daytona, the 24 hours this year, in, a, in an Orica LMPC car, 11 of the 12 fastest laps. Meantime, on pit lane, this is the 37 car again. It's had somewhat troubled time. Victor Scheitar is getting out of that car, which must mean I think it will be Anton Ledigan. Because uh, I think we had Kirill in earlier. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. 23 seconds now, you know, at the front of the field. 32-5 last time around for Alex Verts. That's traffic. And there's the answer. Clumps traffic. of traffic all over the place. Christensen, 31-1. But a 28-9 from Buemi, he's pushing on again. Now, he needs to just... They're coming to the end of their fuel stints, aren't they? Yeah. I think we're expecting Tom Christensen any time now. Christensen's due in on... Uh, 139. 139, correct. Uh, the seven car will be on 146, and the eight car will be on... One forty-seven. If it. they continue doing their thirty, that's a quick seven lap laps time at this distance. stage from Sebastian Buemi. He's just got to be careful, though. Remember what happened in Texas. He just there are places here that you can get on the power a tad early. There's this Ferrari eight-wheeler, almost. How long can the four-five-eight keep going, Graham? I've said before, it's the oldest of the. The designs here, not quite. No, the Aston has been. Aston, yeah. yeah. I mean, the uh, the 458. The Aston's been 
improved and changed quite a lot. Well, the let's four, not five, it. It hasn't it's, really. it's running one two against you know a world class field. Uh, it is the most fuel efficient of the cars, um, and I think what will govern uh, how long it goes on is going to be actually what happens with the Ferrari model range. It's as simple as that. We yet to see what's going to happen in the future with GT regulations about you know. Uh, we're not getting too much into it as we see the 27 car coming down pit lane now with Maurizio Mediani at the wheel. From second place in P2. Now it's this time for Maurizio to hand over to the championship leader, Sergei Slobin. One would think so. Well, what's the rules about how much he's got to do then? I uh, don't think in this one there's anything like the rules you've got. Not the complexity the... of the no. ELMS. But uh, this one, uh, we'll just have to wait and see what the big man has to do. A super character is Sir Guy Slobin, with many a, a live tell to tell. The most dramatic, I think it's fair to say, of which John is the reason why his hearing isn't very good. Mm. And that reason is that, uh, rather unfortunately, someone um, tried to blow him up. Button. <laughs> It's a, it involves a car bomb, I'll say no more. Tom Christensen on pit lane now. So Thomas pulls to a stop now uh, on lap 139, as uh, predicted, and is staying aboard. That will mean that the number 14 car will go through. It does now. Uh, Roman Dumat through turn one. And uh, pretty soon, I think, has uh, we got Simo Bernard about to take? No, he's a little bit further back, isn't he? Yeah. No, sorry, he has gone through. He's gone through too. So we're back to Toyota, to Toyota, to Porsche, Porsche. Audi, Audi. We like it neat and tidy. I don't suppose Dr. Ulrich feels the same about it to see it this afternoon though. They've got a really good chance of still of getting third position. And that would be a pretty decent haul, given how they've been struggling on the front straight here. Chance for a little bit of a look at the, the, uh, the CLM, the Lotus there, just in front of the number one Audi. Just going through the turn now. Still a handsome looking thing. Just not very quick. Just not very quick yet. Quick enough in a straight line. Yes, as we saw, that's true. But, uh, still, mind, having said that, you know, it's still an 11th. And, you know, it's splitting the two rebellions after the 12 cars have problems. But Pierre Kaffer, who can pedal a bit, I mean, that car hasn't done a great deal in terms of time. It should be doing something around the 30s. Yep. 33, maybe something like that. Bad car news. 27. Yeah, that's bad news for them. That's the championship leading car. We've just seen uh, in with Sergei Slobin confirmed aboard the car. Uh, reported to Stuart's for pit, speeding in pit lane. That will be at least a drive through. That might just allow the Morgan Judd to get into contention for that third position. At the moment, the, uh, the Ligier in full control of that class. Here's the number seven Toyota, the second place car, still in the hands of Alex Wurtz, of course. 21 seconds down now on the leader. It's a little closer than it was. So that Anton Ladiga coming back into the pit. Uh, yes, it is. Hasn't he just been in the pit? Yes, he has. And, uh, so on board with Alex. As you say, that uh, trademark blue balaclava. Excellent hel helmet design from Alex. Which he stayed with for quite some time. Having a drink there. Just, gonna, just a little bit of an impression of the kind of braking forces. His head just ducks forward, just a, under heavy braking. Look at how quick the speed goes up. G, just, you know, two and a half, three G. In various directions as well. You're turning and bringing.
again, watch his eyes, looks across the corner. He's in the, I reckon he's in the Dunlop chicane there because he takes more curb than anybody else. Now heading up the hill through 13, and 14 and 15, next two left-handers. And then looking across the corner to his exit point, a little bit of correction as he goes over the brow. Now setting the car up for the final corner, I think. Saved a bit of boost. He'll use all of that. And is this him coming past? Did I get the right I'll, part I'll, of the track? I'll tell you in about ten minutes, but he <laughs> it is indeed. Yep. No. Why didn't I just look at the graphic on the right hand side of the <laughs> screen? <laughs> Down in the braking area, brakes early, lifts. Thank you, graphics department, for helping me out there. Teamwork, it's all teamwork. Seamless. Let's have a listen to his teammate, Sebastian Buemi, leading the race. Again, this is all just placing the guys on the track. Don't panic, guys. Just keep doing what you're doing. And, and this is important, isn't it? Because you're not always racing a guy door to door in this type of racing. No. There's no, the Ferrari's he, he, he wants to know. He's going to be aware that he can see something, somebody at similar pace. And he just wants to, to know, because he knows the gap to the second place car. It's, is this something I need to be worried about? What do I need to do? Just trying to mentally process that while he's actually got the capacity to do it. That's the uh, P2 leader. And that, at the moment, is Roman Rusinov, is getting uh, through the P, the, sorry, the GTE Pro lead pair. And having passed the 71, he's now looking to do the same with Tony Verlander. So let's head down for another interview. Kirill Ladigin is with Louise. Kirill, we've seen the 37 come back into the pits. What's the problem? Uh, what's the problem? Uh, to steering wheels, uh, downshift, uh, button to broken. And of course, it's uh, very well. expression said it all it's a downshift button on the steering wheel which has cost a lot of time it's been a troubled trip several hundred times around this circuit for them so far this weekend there's the car now that's on Ludigan now at the wheel that's uh, probably one of the better runs it's had so far into it it's been managed to get regular running it John uh, it's not been an easy start for the 37 crew. You were talking earlier on, and we got sort of sidetracked about the SMP concern, which of course is a Russian bank, um, the SMP racing team. Having an SMP car next year, what does that actually mean? Does that mean something that they will design and build, or will they commission someone to do it, or will they rebadge? something else that's been done before think of the morgan well okay what we know we don't know a lot is it's a new car it's uh, we don't know that it's going to be called an smp first but there's a new car confirmed to us coupe? a coupe uh, absolutely a coupe uh, it's uh, will be we are told two entries with nissan engines for the wec next year with this team uh, and designed i believe by paolo catoni uh, now that's a name if you're listening to the app just open up another, you, you just go and have a look at uh, his heritage. The second little rumour about uh, SMP is that they've shown some interest in LMP1. Sergei Slobin says no, uh, not with the way that the factory teams are going at the moment, we're not interested in that. They'll concentrate on their new car. That new car should run, should test before the end of this year, but I'm told the first time we will see it will be at the Paul Ricard Prologue next year. Another good reason to go down to the south of France. Here is your leader coming into the pit lane on his lap 146. That's a 36 lap stint for Sebastian Boemi. That seems to be somewhat metronomically correct. 
we should see the seventh car of Alex Vertin next time around. Now, Alex will briefly take the lead, of course. Watch to the right-hand side of the picture. Oh, no, he's coming in on the same lap. They're double stacking them. 136, and Alex is getting out. Now, this is interesting. So that's a, just a 30... Car comes to stop now, and it's Kazakajima. So that's a 46 lap stint, 36 lap stint for the eight car, 37 lap stint for the, the seven car. So they have pulled a lap back there with the tall fella behind the wheel in terms of, of fuel mileage. And effectively on the same strategy now, of course, down goes the seven. Alex got into that car, he was two seconds back. That's perhaps the cost of fuel efficiency, John. Possibly. Right, no further action for cars 7, 51 and 98 after the potential issues at the turn nine. So that's clearly been looked at very carefully indeed. It's a wee while since we were talking about that. Two hours and 15 minutes to go. Arm is led by the 95 Aston Martin from the 98. Aston Martin in second and the Andrea Bertolini driven Ferrari number 81. Pro, Vlander, Collado, Darrell or Young, Ferrari, Ferrari, Aston, 51, 71, 99. P2, Rusinov, Bradley, Zlobin. Hmm. There's an interesting mix of names, isn't it? 26, 47, 27, and it's Toyota and Toyota at the head of the field, and Buemi stayed in. Nakajima got into the number seven car, so Buemi has stayed in and has got 26 seconds of a lead. Roman Dumas leads the Porsche charge in third position uh, ahead of his teammate, Timo Bernard. Eight, seven, 14, and 20 at the head of the field. There's the 14 car. It does, again, bring straight into sharp focus, doesn't it? When we talk about a world championship, it's not just about the places we visit and race, it's the people who are involved as well, John. And uh, what we've got at the moment leading the race, it's number eight car. Here's number 20 on track at the moment. The number eight car, that's a Swiss driver in a Japanese car, built in Germany with a French team helping them with logistics. And that's just a snapshot. 14 here. And there's the 20, and these two cars now, what, uh, just under four seconds apart for what would be a podium position. Second incidence of the car 27 being reported to stewards for spinning in pit lane. Now, we've not seen a penalty levied for the speeding yet, have we? This could be very bad news indeed for the 27 car. Sitting in third position at the moment in the P2 battle. Stewards tend to uh, take a dim view of multiple offences. They do. I mean, worth saying at this stage that in race terms, of course, that would mean it, it, it risks losing out on a podium finish, which matters, as we have, I think, one of the Porsches coming into pit lane at the moment. We do. It is the 14 car on pit lane now. So, Romain Dumas. Makes his way down pit lane. But in championship terms, just without losing my thread on the P2 issue at the moment, the one that they'll be interested in is the 37, because the 35 car will not take championship points away from it if it finishes ahead. Now, that was a 37 lap stint again for the Porsche. That puts Timo Bernard up into third position and takes that position as uh, Romain Dumas locks up at the speed limiting line. Still going in. And up the car goes. And the ball is suited ballet starts again. Number one Audi will be looking to impact here, already ahead of Romain Dumas and up into fourth position, Tom Christensen. 42 seconds back from the sister car, the number 20, so it's eight from seven. Still a total one, two, as it has been for a long time now. Then the 20 car, still a Porsche, but now the other Porsche in third. 
we expect that car in any time now. And then the number one Audi, still in the hands of Tom Christensen, 14 back out on track. Just watching. Oh, that's the, I thought there was a 51 for a moment. That's a change of position in, uh, certainly on track, and not for overall position between the two AM class AF Corsa cars. So a bit of a formation run here for the two. Roman Dumas stays aboard the number 14. You get the feeling, don't you, that uh, the 61 car isn't trying to overtake at this point. Well, 61 cars had its uh, little woes a little earlier. In fact, we've got all four. Uh, of course, uh, red Ferraris in shot there with the two still very close on track, aren't they? In fact, James Gallardo closer than ever now behind the 51. So all four, of course, are liveried Ferrari 458s with the two pro cars catching their two AM buddies. But in addition to these four, of course, another three cars handled by Marta Ferrari's squad with the eight-star car, the orange 90 car, that's uh, the only retirement we've had thus far in the race, and the two SMP Racing Oracle Nissans also run out of that garage. Talk about Aston Martin World, it's a Marta Ferrari universe. Something ridiculous, like, is it 60-something cars they've got, or 50-something uh, cars? Lots of Ferrari Challenge cars, lots. Yes. I mean, it's uh, astounding, and they produce such good race cars. As they've run out of one facility, Grim, do they? Uh, well, uh, until fairly recently, they certainly had at least part of the, the fleet uh, at Paul Ricard, at the old JMB headquarters. But that, uh, I read, in fact, wrote, has uh, now been taken over by SRO as their new technical centre at Paul right. Ricard. For performance balancing and such like. For performance balancing, testing for teams, my guess is some degree of commercial activity will take place there as well, which is only sensible with a fabulous facility, the Mistral Room. Well, Anthony Davidson put in a great stint in the Toyota when he took it over from Buemi. Buemi back in the car, just the pair of them uh, in the lead car this weekend. How much, sorry? How much are you watching the moves of the number seven? Uh, well, they keep telling me that uh, everything's under control. I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, yeah, I was out there just pushing every lap, and um, just you, you just got to take your time through traffic and not make you know not take too many risks. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's pretty tricky around here. Just, but you're feeling confident without saying too much. Yeah, I mean you can. I don't like that word, confident, um, but we're in a good position at the moment and uh, the car's running well. We knew before the start of the race if, uh, if, if we just had a nice boring race that we would be in the front and uh, that the car was pretty good on its tyres, so that seems to be happening. Um, yeah, so if everything keeps running as it is, there's no reason why we can't win. Um, but, you know, Reliability is always a is always a concern, especially when you're in the lead of a race. So keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. That's funny. Uh, when I spoke to Anthony for the poll interview for radio for our pre-race program over on our sister channel RadioLeMond.com, he said pretty much that that he would be very happy if it was a bit tedious. I went, oh, shock then. Anthony Davison wants boring race. He went, yeah, no, it's not great for the spectators, but that's exactly what I want. We've got the Ferraris in team formation and the Aston Martins. This is first and second in the AM class. And this is the lead battle. Yeah, yeah, that's first and second in the AM class, side by side. And it changes. And that's Nygaard up. Absolutely. To first position. That's a dangerous. Oh, no, no. Now that is a dangerous. Yeah, Chris and I got, of course, part of the uh, dangerous effort last year in '95. Switches to the '98 this year with Pedro Alami and Paul Dallalana. Pilsen doesn't look 38 years old, does he? How annoying is that? I irritating, really. Chat with uh, my guards. 
yesterday as well after his poll he was very very happy another Aston in the background Three there Astons. so it's, uh, it's the time when clearly they're huddling together for warmth <laughs> Now, which one will that be then? That it's 97. Be, you be you can see it's, uh, yes, it is. eye patch. This yes, we can. That's still struggling around yep. towards the back of the field, although he's, he's on the first 24 now. Uh, and he's in fifth position, of course, in the pro category because the 92 Porsche is behind it. That was the car that, uh, I'm afraid, got involved in that first corner incident, and it's those two With cars. With the 99, ironically, yeah. Uh, they went to post 97, 99 and 92, and uh, it's the two cars that were delayed in that, uh, in that or because of that incident, that uh, are nowhere near the train. Because apart from that, John, those lead four cars, separated by just over 30 seconds, the top four in GT Pro. And there you have it, line astern, three Golf livery to Aston Martins, with an interloping Porsche there. Just ducking, ducking in and through. Yeah, the amateur photographers here at Fuji will be having a field day right now. Coming down to the end of another hour, Graham. And this is the time when people are starting to back time from the end of the race, starting to get into the last couple of three pit stops. Just looking at the lead cars. It's going to be seven pit stops for the lead hybrids. I was wondering if they might be able to get through on six, but I don't think they are. Uh, it's going to be more than tight, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And you're now looking, aren't you, for the battles that lie ahead. So just over two hours, a third of the six hours here at Fuji Speedway to go. A lot of tyre debris offline on the start finish straight. As the 27 car has been handed a 90 second stop and hold penalty for speeding in the pit lane. Second offence we are told. And that will take the car out of contention for the moment at least for a podium position and could very much bring the 35, the Morgan Oak, Kiko O'Hara at the wheel of that, to Sharon with Gustavo Jakobin and Alex Brundle, that could bring, bring that car into a podium position, which after its travails over the weekend would be remarkable. Uh, yeah, actually, Keiko putting in time is, I think, broadly comparable at the moment to Sergei Slobin. The, the key uh, point here is I don't think it's going to do much to affect their point standing. Uh, because you would have to guess, wouldn't you, that if it came down to uh, a tight result between the two SMP racing cars, that they would cede that to the 27 car. But either way, it's more than a slap on the wrist, isn't it? That's going to cost them a lap. Yes. There it is, I guess, love it. I'm sure that uh, wasn't very well received. There. I've oh, just saw a white flag being waved there, the and there is car. the reason. The number 12, this has been the car that's had the problem, the problems for Rebellion this weekend. They have been Legion, electrical, fly-by-wire, you name it, Nico Prost now, and it's a yellow flag at turn 15. 
No, he's not that far. He's moving, he's moving again. It's control, alt, delete, I think. It's not the first time we've seen that happen. No. And Eduardo Freitas clearly has as long a memory as we do, and he realised that that was the issue and gave them time to sort it out. Again, great officiating this weekend. Is Nico going to head for the pits, or are they going to go back around? He is coming back around. around. It's a bit dangerous, isn't it? He's got. He's weaving this to uh, scrub his tyres clean. Yeah. So, great officiating again. 60 seconds until we've got four hours completed. The lead actually has come down rather. Down under 20 seconds. 18.3 seconds the lead. Well, that rebellion's not well, Graham. I'm sorry. It's not the team car, I think, just diving into the pit lane there, if I'm not mistaken. It is the 13. Just into the pits now. There's the GTR battle once again. The two Astons. Nagard from Pilsen. All Danish, all the time. It's good to see Aston doing so well. They've uh, invested very heavily in this race programme. I suspect we've got the Rebellion for the trouble. Yellow at turn three and four now. White flag. Big shown. And I expect to see. There's the 13 going out after a regular pit stop. Uh, Andrea Paliki stays at the wheel. And uh, we see the 12 is still running again. Oh. Off again. Oh, uh. That's at three. Uh, what he's done there is the engine's died and he's gone out of there to get out of the way. Yes. 27, meanwhile, is on pit lane for its stop go. Back up to speed again. Yeah, this is really in. frustrating, isn't it? This is now almost it's a safety issue now. He knows he's going to have to come in at the end of this lap, I think. Being told by our colleagues in London, and there's the confirmation of the 27, that Matt Housen, by the way, is the official racing driver mascot of the Isle of Wight Festival. I have nothing to add to that information. I just thought I'd pass it along. Do with it what you will. Really? Nothing at all I can say in response to that. Here's the 27, soaking up the 90 seconds. The Isle of Man or the Isle of Wight? Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight. Okay. And Eve's old pan, pal John Giddings, who runs the Isle of Wight Festival, has confirmed it, and apparently that's why he has Isle of Wight signage on his helmet. Eve being an, an ex-rock chick. Absolutely. I'm cowed by that level of information. Don't know where they get it from, I don't. Yep. In comes the 98. This is a scheduled stop for Christopher Nygaard, coming out of second place. He extricates himself from the Aston Martin. That's interesting. That's a different design of door bars from the earlier cars. It's got a little kink down in it. I only know that because the cockpit in base performance, Darren Turner was... Uh, was the first Excellent car. simulator was the, an early car. Yeah, the, uh, the, the current spec of car had that. The 412, by the way, has come back into pit lane and has been wheeled back into the garage. Uh, Paul Dallana was uh, climbing aboard the 98 car. We see the Aston Martin racing guys now going to work. Tell me about the door bars then. Uh, the 2014 car, uh, 20, I think 2013 specification, wasn't it? A radical redesign and did include a completely different roll cage structure. Right. Uh, in particular, to help uh, access and egress. I can just about get in to the old style of ones. Yep. It's not easy at no. all. It's a fundamentally different car. 51, meanwhile, on pit lane. This was the class leader, when it Tony came in. So now James Collado will leave in the 71 car. Darryl Young goes up in the second. Now, this is the battle of the pit crews because how much time did he have ahead of Daryl or Young. And now to pit lane, as we've got a flurry of significant GT stoppers. This is the number 95 car, the young driver AMR car, was running second in GTE and pits from the lead. Christian Pulsen at the wheel. Is there going to be a driver change here? And we look to see. I think not. No. No. Christian stays aboard, and Christian's another man with uh, wheel touring car 
Yes. Heritage. Of course. Very popular crew here with the fans of the Dane train. Data card, I think that was, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. And the 98 car will retake that lead. I'm not sure because uh, I wonder if they're going to change tyres or not, or they are. I'll just tell you that happening in the background before we saw it. Oh, we've got a cameraman who likes to get close to the action. My friend Morrow in the States, I used to think, was the nuttiest pit lane cameraman I knew, but maybe not. We've got a second contender there. Great shots without okay. getting in the they, way. They are going to take the lead here. I think they are, yeah. That's been that old. Uh, In and out lap, it's sort of them. Have a look on the right hand side of the picture. The 98's halfway down, crossing the line. It's just there in the is. background there. Now, this is going to get very close very quickly because that's cold tyres. No heated blankets allowed here, remember. You can't have a tyre warming cabinet that is uh, has warm air through it. That is in an excellent uh, end of the stint for. The 95 car. I have to say, there's also an issue there for the 98. They've not changed the driver. Uh, it's still showing as Christopher Nygaard, and it isn't because Paul and Alana got into that car. Right. Are you sure? Uh, there's certainly a driver change for that car, and I'm pretty certain that Paul and Alana's helmet is a dark helmet with flecks of. Horizontal on it. Let's have a look at how it stands. Toyota, Toyota, Porsche, Audi, Porsche. And that's just changed on the timing screen as well. Uh, Rebellion leading their category. And the leash here, Roman Rusinov leading the 26G drive. EF Corsa were leading uh, a moment ago in the GTE Pro category and uh, James Collado's just brought that car to the pit so Tarlow Young will take that over in the 99 Aston Christian Paulson from Paul Dallalana in the 95 car uh, the two Astons leading there and there is James Collado in the pits so there is our new leader So Collado out we shall in and again the of course the boys go to work they have a lot of cars, but actually it's a very tight crew. Not huge numbers of people today, of course. Eh? Oh, yeah, they work across team, uh, across cars as well, don't they? They do. That's, that was the first of a very nice set of Ferraris. Was that only one side of tyres? I think he started the engine before it came down off the jacks. Right. Expecting the uh, number 20 in in a moment. It's Timo Bernard. Time for Timo. And we haven't had Brendan Hartley yet in that car. It would be about his time. Uh, 121, 51. Yep. Yep. And uh, 20 car goes by us now as we watch on screen. 71 getting up to speed. Back in on board now with the number 20. Timo. Stops now. Eight lap stint again for that car. Brendan stalks across. He's a good lad, hand. isn't he? He's a tall, slim lad. Oh, look at that. Only Porsche would do that. Embroider Brendan. Embroider Brendan and Porsche on the seat insert. That is fantastic. He's, he's growing into his role as a Porsche factory driver beautifully. But it, it hasn't compromised his own character. No, absolutely not. He comes from a motorsport obsessed family. Mm -hmm. His brother still holds the mini land speed record. And by that, I don't mean the, the small one. I mean the one for a mini with a barking mad piece of kit. Uh, I think we're self-built, but uh, Brendan now just about to pot around. And he has been, he's caused a phenomenon in sports car racing, the Hartley factor which is uh, a young driver struggling to make his way in the single-seater career, trying LMP2, being picked up by a factory team. Yeah, and that is going to be the same sort, in fact, it already has been, the same sort of interest and attention that 
Kimi Raikkonen going straight out of British Formula Renault into Formula One. So everybody then dives into British Absolutely Formula right. Renault. Ben Wattrelli is the latest LMP1 man on pit lane as we look at the Porsche guys with Mark Webber crunching data on board now with Benoit. Which is number two Audi. And is this going to be time for Marcel Fessler? Take a look here. The guys again go to work. Complete the screen. Indeed it is. And uh, Benoit out of that car like a scalded cat. That was only a 36 lap stint there. Now, is there still any tricky strategy? Bullets left in the gun. Not sure. Marcel. Getting himself as comfortable as you ever could be in a car like this. But, uh, it's the office for him, of course. Mm. It's amazing how quickly you can get used to that confined space, and it is very confined and can be quite scary, even for seasoned drivers. I heard, uh, Started that on the jacks as well. I heard a um, conversation overheard a conversation with Jensen Button saying that he still has to just mentally calm himself down when he's strapped into the car because it's constricting in it and you know and you just for that moment yeah Leader is Sebastian Boemi with under two hours to go, and the gap between himself and Kaz Nakajima coming down with every sector down now to under 17 seconds. But it's the right car leading Graham, and as much as it would be great Absolutely. to have a Japanese driver win here, they've got to think championship. We talked about tactics within the team earlier. Yeah, but I, think, I guess, uh, what are we looking for here? Do I think that they'd manage that? I think they probably would manage it. But uh, I think they're going to go on board now with Timo Bernard. I'll go to pit lane with Timo Bernard. Timo, you're back in front of your drive. I'm hearing there's boost issues in the 20. Yeah, well, in the beginning, we had uh, our car, we had a puncture. So we had to do that extra stop. I hope that at the end of the day, uh, you know, that luck, maybe we can save that stop again at the end. We'll have to see. I mean, at the moment, we're fighting with a sister car. I, will, I hope we can get uh, back to the podium. That would be really good. I mean, we had the pace, and uh, we were really good in traffic. I think, uh, uh, yeah, we're fighting for that podium. Yeah, we've heard on their team radio they're also having issues, so you're closing in. Yeah, I don't know exactly, because I just got out of the car of the number 20 car, and uh, um, I actually, I don't know. I saw, suddenly, uh, I saw Roma in front of me, and I was closing in, but uh, I, I don't know exactly, and he pitted in front of me. So at the moment, I don't have the info, but... And for the 20, everything's running OK? Sorry? For the 20, everything's running OK? With the 20, everything runs well. I mean, at the beginning, we tried to do a double stint, which I think was, yeah, on the limit, probably. And, yeah, at the beginning, that puncture, that really cost us a lot of time, but uh, we tried to catch back. I mean, the leading Toyotas are very quick, but, uh, I mean, at the, at the beginning, it was really a nice fight with the Toyotas, but we have to see. I mean, it's still uh, two hours to go, and we keep pushing. Thank you. Louise Beckett asking the questions for us again down in the pit lane. And Brendan Hartley then will bring this car home, the young Kiwi. And nothing sorted for the Porsche drivers for next year. Um, it was a similar position this time last year when I was talking to the GT drivers as well. So I don't think we read anything into that. I'd be surprised if the... Um I, 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 I can't believe that 
expect terribly many major changes to that driver squad simply because of where they are in the development curve for those cars. Two new Porsches there of the GT variety. Pro Two of the prettiest cars on the grid, I think. Pro Speed on the left and the 88 behind it. Both the 991s, of course, uh, the 88 Proton. That uh, orange, black and white colour scheme that extends down almost across the windscreen, certainly across the shade band, is a work of genius. And I do like the black rear end on that car as well. It really makes that fat rear end look even broader. And behind the, uh, the black, grey and silver livery, an Andy Blackmore livery on that car. And, uh, is that an Andy Blackmore livery on the uh, 88, is it? it? Is. Oh, well done. That's At Spotter Guides. And Andy producing the goods on every WC race. If you don't, if you haven't, aren't familiar with Andy's work, give yourself a treat. Yeah. And fire up the printer. Canada El Cabezi at the wheel of uh, the 88 car at the moment. And his progression, his career progression going nicely. Oh, yeah. He I've was in good form earlier this week when we had a chat with him. Uh, he was. Uh, yeah, I thought he did splendidly at uh, Cota in very mixed conditions, but uh, uh, he's looking forward to, I think, a couple of more local outings for him. One at the Golf 12 hours in December, then the Dubai 24 hours, where I think we both first came across him, didn't we? Yeah. And, of course, he's gone back in before then for WEC. Absolutely. The penultimate race of the season, under lights. Uh, uh, so I've just said, are we under lights this year? Are the lights for, for Barry? Yes, we are. Okay, yes. There's the two Aston Martins. And this is 98 and 97 this time. The 95 car is, I think, a little way back, isn't it now? Not, uh, no, no, the 95 oh, cars no, ahead. ahead. Yeah. Apologies. 95 leads the class, 98 is second. 97 is we're, we're down laps wise. But uh, Darren Turner will not be wanting to give any problems to Paul Dallalana, given he's in a podium position in the AM class. Oh, Paul, and what have I just said? He's too busy looking in his mirrors. And a little bit of a lack of concentration. Missed his braking point and then drives across the track, across the grass. Now that doesn't look serious, but what you've got to worry about is what's got up underneath the splitter, what's been pulled off in the pit lane. Third place in LMP2. Kiko O'Hara was in that car. Now, is it time for Alex Brundle back aboard? Oh, sorry, it wasn't Alex start, it was Gustavo, wasn't it? It was Gustavo that started the I car. I think uh, Keiko is staying aboard that car. I think you're right. Uh, Another great livery, isn't that? I mean, it's so like the uh, the Batmobile with yep. the pink stripes around the wheel arches. I'm hearing, by the way, from Radio Le Mans, the Spoking Data Centre. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit like GCHQ, only with more aerials. Mm -hmm. Uh, that only the two P1s that made early stops are likely to need seven. OK. As we so watch uh, this... So which two are, the, are those, do we that think? Was the, so uh, the 20. The 20 and the... Which? Who tried to double uh, the two car. It was the two car, wasn't it? All right. On board with the eight car now, as he goes into hunt mode and tries to put a lap on Marcel Fessler. See how quick Fesler pushes out the corner? That works all right. Now, watch as Toyota... And look, flashing. the red light's flashing. That was harvesting down the main straight there. That, I think that was the, the, the headlamps of the, uh, the Toyota behind. It's got the uh, LMP2 leader on pit road now. This is a regular stop for the 26. Why isn't it moving? And it's followed in. Oh, look at that, he's already passed him. <laughs> followed in by the 47. Second place car. Christensen then in third place. That was the uh, number two that we were watching of uh, Marcel Fesler going another lap back. He's good at the twisties though, isn't he? Oh, yes. But look how much ground that, that Toyota made up there. That's astounding, isn't it? Well, that's what 20 clicks will do for you, though. Strongly suspect there's going to be a great deal of work done back at Audi. As we see, get out the hacksaws, fellas. We yeah. need to uh, <laughs> the stricken 12 car. 
Well, a shame this car started its career with impressive reliability. The Rebellion R1, Nico sitting impassively aboard. And that's interesting, because that is steering rack. That's not... Is it, well, power, is it a power steering problem? May have to be taking the rack out, maybe, to find something else under there. But that's what he's doing. And we're trusting the floor, and the steering rack's right behind there. Pedal box, as you can see, as well. That's the clutch cylinders and the brake slave cylinders as well. And I wonder if they are... Are they just bleeding something? Well, it, it could be electronics, John. It could be electronics in that. You're working in such small tight you spaces in these packaging carbon fibre. That's an issue for these things. So, in the classes, an hour and 40 minutes remaining, it's uh, Sebastian Buemi leads teammate Kaz Nakajima, eight Toyota from seven Toyota. And that pass, of course, was the second lap being put on the number two of Marcel Fesler. Yeah, at the moment, uh, completing the current provisional podium positions is Tom Christensen in the number one Audi R18, Etron Quattro. But on lap down uh, in P2, Roman Rusinov leads ahead of Richard Bradley. That's the 26 Ligier Nissan G Drive car, the only coupe in the uh, P2 field this time around. They were expecting another one to be added for the final round in Brazil when the Straka Nissan, uh, the Dome Nissan arrives. Really looking forward to seeing that car in the carbon. Absolutely, Richard Bradley in the KCMG Orica Nissan that uh, one last time out. Then Keiko O'Hara has taken that third position courtesy of the, uh, the uh, lengthy stop and hold penalty for pit lane speeding for the 27 car which is 20 seconds ahead of Sergei Slobin at the moment just getting that by the leader that 27 car in uh, continue to watch Sebastian Buemi do a very good job of carving through traffic here Darrell Young now leads GT Pro in the 99 Graf Bamboo Aston Martin 149 laps complete there and he's got a 45 second advantage over Jimmy Bruni in the 51 Ferrari with the sister car, the 71 car, now in the hands of Davide Grigon, about 10, 12 seconds behind. Well, let's go down to the pit lane. We're going to Ferrari land. And a new Ferrari driver this weekend. Hadn't even driven a Ferrari road car. Found that hard to believe, but it's true. Here's Jerome Blake, come on. Jerome, hello, it's lovely to see you. First time here in WEC and first time in a Ferrari. How is it? Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's uh, really nice to be with A, of course. Uh, uh, I've been racing against them a lot and finally with them. Uh, the car's running well. Uh, I think for a moment uh, we were the quickest GTM car out there. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. We've lost a bit of ground, so we're, we're hanging sixth. Uh, it's going to be tough to uh, get to the podium, but you never know. Still, uh, yeah, one and a half hours to go. Now we'll go in next and uh, we'll push hard to the finish. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, this is for now a one-off, but uh, I really like it uh, to be with them, so hopefully I can come back. Yeah, he was very positive when we spoke to him on Thursday afternoon and evening about uh, doing some more WEC work. As indeed, I think, uh, uh, Brett Curtis and uh, Mike Ski, who is the third driver in that car, and invited along by Brett, and uh, I think Mike's uh, a man might see a little bit more of it. Well, Mike's one of these drivers who perhaps won't be well known to our viewers, but who has made a very good name for himself uh, driving out in the States. And, he, and he's a sil the thing is, he's a silver driver. You need to have two silver drivers in that class. That's the trick, isn't it? And uh, because he's been under the radar, he's been doing Pirelli World Challenge racing uh, this year with an Audi, last year with an Nissan GTR winning races this year with the Audi, Dick Pike's Peak in the Nissan with uh, the most barking mad aero package you've ever seen in your life and a gazillion horsepower. Uh, but before that, he's done all sorts of things, including, I think, a bit of NASCAR truck racing. Um, but it's good to see new faces. It's good to see the WC making new friends. I have a feeling, by the way, uh, that Jerome may have done another WEC race, possibly the first race we went to Sebring. 
but uh, he certainly is interested in, in uh, you know, doing more with this package. He was clearly very impressed indeed with the AF Corsa setup. And uh, on board again now with Sebastian Buemi, trying to make good his escape, but uh, that lead steady now at about 16 seconds. 99 yeah. here, this is Daryl Young. Doing a pretty good job at the moment. Yeah, holds a, a lead of something in the region of uh, 40 seconds. He does. Their issue is pit stops. Yes, fuel mileage on that car. And it's the speed with which they can get the fuel into the car, of course, because that is another thing that's regulated and somewhere where they took a bit of a hit with the balance of performance. Lots of different ways you can balance performance with these cars. Fuel load and fuel flow rates. So what, about a third of a lap there in hand? Yep. That's what 40 odd seconds means. That's the sound of a V8 Aston Martin engine rumbling. Sister car. Now, Darrell or Young is due in any second now, of course, so we'll see him relinquish that lead. Yeah, he's done very well. Thank you, Louise. The uh, Kraft Bamboo team mm. will be mightily pleased, pleased with the progression of the team so far in the second half of the season. And uh, there you've got. Our boy Lollipop from Aston Martin Racing. Another driver waiting, is that? So I think might have been Fernando Reese. That's interesting, because he's done more stints than anyone else then. Because it was Fernando, Alex, Fernando, Daryl, Fernando. And then Alex to finish off. Uh, maybe, maybe. Good to see so many families here this weekend. And plenty of sports car fans of the future. On board with uh, Tom Christensen, the most successful driver ever at Le Mans. And shows no sign of giving that up anytime soon. In fact, still trying to add to his tally. Down into turn number one. Won 30.9 oh, last time in around. Richland are breaking for Tom. I don't think that Audi's been playing ball today with any of the drivers. It's just looked, hasn't looked its poised self, has it? Just looked a little bit difficult. They've just like had... Like a sulky teenager. Yeah, I know all about that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, if it's that bad, it's really bad. Note on the screen there that the 12 Rebellion is back out and running. It's like uh, Darrell or Young came in a little bit early, had three more laps of fuel in that 99 car. He's in the pits now. Counting back, maybe? Possibly. Expect the number one in in three laps time for Christensen. There is the confirmation. That's Alex McDowell who's jumped in. So he'll jump in and I wonder if Fernando will finish or whether Daryl will finish. That is the tall Cumbrian. There is the second placed car now, the first placed car on the pit lane rotation. And, uh, some of the depth that uh, Aston Martin Racing can actually put together here. They gave Alec Uh, McDowell a couple of 
uh, out into the British GT Championship to help hone his GT racing skills. Back on board again with the leader. And again, he's got yet another LMP1 car that he's looking to put a lap on. And this time it's a Porsche. And that's Brendan Hartley. His car led early on in the hands of Mark Webber. In fact, twice led. Once at the early, early stages and then picked up the lead again later on. Still has the fastest lap, Webber, of course. 127.7, back on lap 12. Seems a very long time ago now, I'm sure. Does it just? It's been a long race for them as well. And uh, Mark having a suspected puncture, which required an early stop. And then uh, later in his stints, his double stints, uh, suffering a few problems of braking at the end of the pit, st the pit straights. 37 car makes its way out. The 27 car just finishing fueling and go. So dead double stint stinting there. Michelin's by the look of it. Certainly giving it a go. So this is another lap about to go on to Brendan Hartley. He will not be happy about that in a car that set the fastest lap of the race. That would say to me that it has not all been plain sailing for Porsche. They'll keep their cards close to the chest, the men from Weissach. We certainly know that the 14 car had an issue. There was a radio message from Brendan as well that I think he's had had a problem as well, which Timor didn't know about I didn't want to talk about yeah absolutely Ooh, come on Brendan blue flags yep there they were of course the workers the marshals out here are very efficient indeed all of the anyone in uniform here has been very helpful and just so efficient this weekend it's, it's always an absolute pleasure to come here it really is. You got a salute so on the way in this morning, didn't we? You know, we did get saluted, and so it's nice of Gerard Neveu to do that. It's not really necessary, a man of his position. Here is the number one Audi, Tom Christensen, in on lap 175. And Tom getting out of the car. You like Duval getting in. Indeed. Uh, so that's... Uh, It's a 36 lap stint again for Audi. And another driver with the hashtag Fonts Jules. Tight knit community, professional racing drivers. And uh, that will mean that both of the Porsches again go ahead of the Audi. And uh, the lead of the two of them at the moment is Ramon Dumas. Brendan Hartley some 13 seconds back. Let's get this uh, Audi out of the pits. And there is the 20 of Brendan Hartley. Got up into fourth uh, position. But this is going to ebb and flow on pit stops. And just having a look at the pit stops there for the 99 Aston against the two Ferraris. Ferrari Reese opened with a 38 lap stint. McDowell did a 40. Reese did a 39 in his second stint, and then Darrell or Young did a short uh, 36 lap stint, yep. whereas the Ferrari 51 did 29. That was a stop and go, of course. 37, 37, 36. And Ferrari 71 also did a short first stint. 30, 37, 37, 37. So McDowell's got the longest stint. And yep. in, in fact, the two were... Uh, so, talking about the, the fuel, is it's all about fuel flow getting it in rather than it using it more. That's well, interesting, isn't it? We're on board now with the 91 Porsche. We're heading towards ducking out this pit straight behind one of the AM Ferraris. I think that's the 61 car. But uh, now looking here at one of the gaggle of Aston Martins, this well, that's a battle for position. Well, that is the car he's trying to catch because that's Alex McDowell. There is and Bergmeister is trying to chase him down. There's some significant bragging rights actually on offer here because coming into this race in WEC history, 14 race wins for Aston Martin Racing, 14 race wins for AF Corsa. Ah. So, and two classes, of course, to play with here. So, this is Jörg Bergmeister. 
Corvin interview behind Alex McDowell, who is just a little bit caught up at the moment between behind uh, Khaled El Kaibersi, the 991 Porsche, the GTE version, proving to be a stout competitor. So let's see uh, what Porsche team Mantai is saying to Jörg. Jörg, that is less than two seconds. Less than two seconds. Keep pushing. Die, die. He said that's a battle for second, didn't he? He said less than two seconds. Oh, less than less two, two seconds. seconds. So Got Jörg Bergmeister looking to make inroads into Alec McDowell's advantage, but not being helped at the moment because, uh, rather ironically, it's a privateer Porsche in the way. And that's the Proton car. Still Khaled al at the wheel of that. And you would guess that, uh, broadly speaking, in a straight line, there's not going to be much between these two. And indeed there's not. But uh, Same York's, car, of course. York is finding the slipstream helping. No Super Mario flat required. That is just pure aerodynamics. Makes a big hole in the air, though, a GT car, in Absolutely. fairness. Not to be over, overly critical of uh, our open-wheel cousins. The numbers have been crunched in that GTE Pro battle, and none other than the Wizard of Walking says that Aston can't win it if uh, it also remains the same. They'll have to pit about 25 minutes before the end of the race. So it comes think. down to reliability and whether or not there's any incident here. Even if they only went fuel only the 25 seconds, they would save, wouldn't get them it back. The ground on the Ferraris. So McDowell has to push, push, push now. Every lap has got to be a qualifying lap and we know there's pace in that car to do that. So if they're going to have any chance at all, they have got to be pressurising the Ferraris when they make their fifth uh, and what will probably be their final stop. Yeah. But uh, from seemingly nowhere, all of a sudden, the 91 car in contention for a podium finish. Absolutely. Math Mathieu Vaxivier comes in from third position in the 75 Pro Speed Porsche. Third place in arm, that is. That uh, is Pierre Kaffer. No, not that one, the one we saw earlier. <laughs> it's a different lifestyle entirely if that's Pierre. Mm. Still busy, busy track out there, isn't it? It's uh, Ooh, fastest first sector of the race for Kaz Nakajima. Just still hovering around 16 seconds behind his teammate, not literally hovering, of course. The Time is staying. That, that would be extraordinary. And oddly enough, the uh, team car, the leader, just a tenth slower. Say so slow, 19.1 seconds for the first sector is hardly slow, but you get the drift. But uh, this is a quick lap from Kaz Nakajima. He's currently on. And we'll see him by us any time now. Pierce just not in the Audis, has it? Not at all. So 128.4. Take another half a second out of Guevara's advantage, but uh, still around that 16 second mark, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Two laps to go for both of those cars. Remember, they pitted on the same lap last time, that was uh, lap number 146, so they should be in on lap 183. There's the Kaz Nakajima fan club. They remember him, well, still competing in Super Formula, of Absolutely. course. I think he's still vying for the championship, if I'm uh, not mistaken. He's in a pretty heavy three-way fight at the moment for the championship. There is Anthony Davidson. Let's see uh, what uh, the leader is saying back to the pits. And box, box, lab, speed confirmed, the driver 24, Anthony. And that was the call from Mathieu Linnell and Kaz Nakajima dives into the pit lane. Anthony Davison is waiting. He heads up the Super Formula standings at the moment in a great battle with Andre Lotterer, Lloyd Duval, 
had João Pablo de Oliveira, who was here, Who's here this and, weekend. And I'm not entirely convinced we won't see more of him in the WEC. Yeah, he was shaking hands earlier on, and he's been touted by a number of people as another driver like Cars, like Andre Lotterer, like Lloyd Duval, James Ross are the same, all have proved themselves out here in Formula cars and GT cars. And is that an LMP driver of the future? João, Pablo, uh, João Paulo de Oliveira, He's the driver Lola, in the dim distant past. And uh, he is just uh, five, four points behind Kaz Nakajima in Super Formula at the moment, the Brazilian. Remember the name? I think you may hear more of him in the future. So, I've spoken to here who watch more Japanese racing than I do. He is very highly thought of. Out goes the number eight. Ah, now down in the pit lane, we hear that Mark Webber is back in his race togs. And Brendan Hartley, 29-2 for him last time around, chasing his teammate Roman Dumas, 31-3 for Roman. In comes the number seven car, I guess this is. It is Mac indeed. has done the extra lap. Andy Davison led, uh, excuse me, um, Boemi led for 133 laps there. He's probably getting bored with that, so yeah, came so he in came for a in. change. But yeah. no, it's, it's been very impressive indeed by both Toyotas, particularly the eight car. But uh, Brendan Hartley closing in fast, isn't he, on Robert Demar at the moment. As we watch the eight. Extra lap for Track. the seven car again, uh, by the way. So to Luminaries. Now, didn't I just say earlier on that all of the board members unusually were together? And uh, also, Akita Toyota is around as well. So no pressure on those guys this no, weekend. No, really. no. Take a breath there. Davison speeds underneath us. Is he going to get the lead? Yes, I think he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. But that's what they need. That's the car that's leading the championship. And comes number seven. Stacker Jimmer aboard still. This has been a, the boring race that Anthony wanted. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I wouldn't argue. Yes, it's not what I would call boring. No, no, but but, uh, but he wanted not any uh, drama, exactly shall we say? The so. drama-free race, I should have said. There you go. I he mean, used the word boring when I interviewed him yesterday. But um, he's a racing driver; he has limited vocabulary. Sarah's on there in the pits with the race suit round his waist. It's um, it's been impressive, and it's been. Great to see, as we've got uh, the 35 car, that is a driver change, that's Gustavo Yakaman getting back aboard the car. I think we'll see a lot more of him in sports car racing. Got a bit of a reputation as a crasher in the States, in uh, Grand Dam. I think he's put that behind slightly him, unfairly in some cases, and he has put that behind him. And a lot of people have sat up and took notice of the performance that he and Alex Brundle put in at the circuit of the Americas race. Gustavo waiting to see what the plans are in 2015 for Oak Racing. And that may or may not be linked into what may or may not be the future for Olivier Blanc. Yeah. I'm just so surprised that Pla has not got a plum works and drive. He has shown time and time again for me that he has been, certainly in times over the last three or four years, he's been far and away the best P2 driver. And I dare say if you 
plugged him into a P1, he would have been right up there with the best P1 drivers as well. Skiko Ihara then, out of the car. He's the owner of Vogue Racing and on Rogue Automotive. He's just told her there that they were sitting in third place, and I don't think she knew. I think uh, she should be pretty pleased with herself with that display. Never saw her doing anything extraordinary or bad. No, the, the, the lap times were perfectly good enough to justify a position on track there. Uh, the car loses third position as a result of that stop, but then again, we must be expecting Sergio Slobin in. And uh, Gustavo Jakobin, it has to be said, is an altogether different proposition in terms of pace than Keiko. And he's only 17 seconds behind getting back on the podium. There again is Ant Davidson, the man who was born in Milton Keynes. Excuse me, Hemel Hempstead. Oh, a little bit of a lock up there from the Roman Dumas number 14. Now, 147. He's coming in on 184. Now, Roman out of the car. 37 laps did for, for them again. The very familiar blue helmets, uh, double blue helmets of Mark Leap. Climbs aboard the car. Mark, a hugely popular signing in the panic to this effort. Yep. And has justified the confidence shown in Absolutely. him by Weissach and Porsche Motorsport. Absolutely right. Very much a product of the Porsche factory. Harks back to a different age, doesn't he? It does, and it's great to see. It uh, was, I think, was unexpected, uh, but I think they've made the right decision. You would have guessed Timo and Roman. I mean, I think yes. anybody would have said Timo, Bernard, Roman, Dumas had already P2 experience with the Spider, of course. Uh, P1 experience with Audi. Indeed. But uh, but no, great to see him aboard. We're back on board the Audi now, the number one car. This car lying in fifth position now, Loic Duval. Yeah, let's have a look at his uh, lap times. He's going to go back position. into fourth now as he passes Romain Dumas. 29-7 last time around for Loic, so that's not so bad. Uh, but Anthony Davidson is the man on the move at the moment in lap time terms, under 28, 128 now. That, I think, is the second fastest lap of the race. Certainly the fastest lap for that car, 127.8. Just finishing off a point that you made earlier on, actually, about Porsche. They've actually pulled a very coherent squad of driving talent together very quickly indeed. You mentioned it earlier on, but they've used a nice mix of guys that they've promoted from within, uh, effectively what they already had, the assets that they already had, yep. and lending out Lieb, uh, lending out uh, Roman Dumas and um, Timo Bernhard to Audi was not the, the most ridiculous thing in the world to do. Yep and they've brought in a nice mix of drivers. Neil Yarny's coming in again, I think. You with a bit of a P1 experience with Rebellion, of course, and yeah. some success there. Snagged Mark Webber when he stepped away from Formula Racing. Yeah, and I think the, for, for good reason. The maturity there, experience, knows how to develop a car. Absolute dream in terms of, oh, dear me, and that's a uh, Tokyo Drift there for number 14 car. Don't want to be doing that in your first lap out on new tyres, do you? But um, but Mark Webber, not just for his pace, but for everything else as well. And then Brendan Hartley, we were talking about earlier. Uh, you know, a young hope. Are you surprised they haven't won yet, or do you think that was we were being we people were being overly confident um, just because it was Porsche that we were talking about? They've got such a heritage in the sport, don't I'm they? I'm not remotely surprised they haven't won yet. It uh, would be great when they do. But uh, that's a cracking shot, isn't it? Look at that. Our cameramen and our editing staff have been on fire today. Not literally. No, that would be bad. Pleasing, yeah. No, I, I, it can't be long before Porsche win a race. I don't think they feel the need to this year. I think they'd like to. Yeah. I think they would have liked a better Le Mans. But as I was explaining to someone from Porsche only yesterday, they gained a lot of respect in the pit lane as well as with the paddock for getting that car back out at the end and not just packing up and going home. They really understood it. Good job, Anthony, good job. Gap is 20. Don't take too much risk. The situation is under control. 
You will do one feet and eighteen laps. That's uh, kind of blight where we're saying, OK, sunshine. Slow down now. Slow down a bit. No need to we're push we're, so we're hard. a bit frightened. Yeah, we've seen your lap time. That's fine. Yeah, I think uh, the, the Porsche mentality, you know, it could have been pulled down the two garage doors, pack up and go home. They didn't. They got a car fettled. They got it back out there to do a lap at the end uh, just to say, hey, we're here. We're back. Our mission was the return, and we've fulfilled a part of that mission and I, I think that was a big statement and I think there would have been other teams and other car companies who wouldn't have done that. I think you're probably right there's uh, the, one of the great things of course about Porsche is that they've got what not say unique respect for because that would be incorrect but they've got full respect for what these races mean yeah. what these championships mean and it's great to have them back. Great to have Toyota doing so well as well still quite a young program let's not forget for the Toyota team uh, let's head down to the pit lane Louise with the questions Richard we're just taking a look at your poorly elbow it's on the mend and you're gonna get back in the car then say again you're going to get back in the car so the, the elbows holding up Yes, uh, thanks for asking. The elbow is not too bad. I mean, it's six weeks since the crash in America. And uh, so far, the elbow hasn't uh, done any problems. So I'm really happy that it's uh, still lasting and I can do the third stint and the last stint for the car num number uh, 91. And um, it's a little pain, that's for sure. But definitely, it's not, uh, you know, avoiding from driving and everything is OK. What happened? Just tell us what the, what the injury was. Um, well, the elbow itself, uh, it, bro it was broken in a lot of pieces. So a Corvette came on the passage on the on the door and uh, hit my elbow and just uh, yeah, it was all cracked up. But uh, it stayed in the correct position, so there was no surgery, and it was just a blast for around three weeks. And now it's six weeks, uh, uh, you know, from the crash. So I'm really happy that it's going so good, and I'm able to drive here in uh, Japan. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, he's rather downplaying that. He yeah. went off at VIR in the Tudor Unite, Tudor Unite at, uh, Sports Car Championship in one of the practice sessions. Uh, hit a wall pretty hard that wasn't protected by a tyre barrier, concrete that's wall. That's impact one. Right, that's impact one. Fortunately, didn't think about getting out of the car because uh, a couple of seconds later, Jan Magnussen went off on the same bit of fluid, say a couple of seconds, about a minute or so later, Jan Magnussen and puts the Corvette C7R into Richard's uh, door panel, smashing his elbow in eight different places Correct. at least. He basically said to us yesterday, it was like the elbow bone exploded. Now, the good news was, and by the way, Jan Magnussen missed a race and missed a chance of a championship because of his concussion. That's how, how hard of an impact it was. Um, and the good news for Richard's elbow was as he said it stayed in place it didn't need to be pinned yeah. or anything just a plot an old-fashioned plaster cast for three weeks or so and uh, we saw him yesterday can't quite straighten it yet and he's still in a bit of pain but it's a remarkable comeback uh, well let's face it I think you or I John would struggle to drive a car uh, like this at pace for an hour in these kind of conditions I speak for yourself oh uh, come on I think we all would <laughs> but uh, he's, he's driving it competitively he's about to get back in uh, it's it, it's extraordinary stuff it's uh, a GT it's, car it's only a GT car oh dear uh, but it's uh, not like driving a classic Aston Martin with no traction control you know uh. <laughs> no I know it's, you know what, it's not about, It's not even just about driving the car, as we said earlier on, all joking aside. It's about getting pushed around. It's, it's the about violence of it. It's, it's, and this is, it's violent. If it's you're doing it properly now, there's no rolling... Right, at this level, endurance racing, at the kind of endurance racing I do, which are six-hour races for national-class cars, you are looking after the car, you are rolling on and off the throttle, you're trying to do as few gear changes as possible, save the tyres, save the brakes, you're not clobbering every kerb, and you're certainly not jumping on the brakes. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I got the chance to do a sprint race in a GT4 car, and these are very, there's the uh, only retirement that we've had so far, the Star Motorsport number 90 
Ferrari. Chandler Aroda was at the wheel when it was pulled off at the far side of the circuit at the exit of turn nine. That car just came to a whole dead stick. Nowadays, these guys are driving the GTs and the prototype cars the way I was trying to drive in an 18 lap sprint, which is hard, very late braking, hit every curb, drive it like a touring car, and basically the cars are built to take that. And it is a very, first of all, it's a very different mindset of driving, and one that I'll be honest, I found it very difficult to get my head into, um, because it just seems like you're abusing the car so much. And when it's someone else's car, perhaps you don't want to do that. Anthony Davidson not having that problem at the moment, although he has been told to slow down just a <laughs> tiny bit. But it, it, it is an interesting point that you make about that, uh, Graham, because the style of endurance driving has changed out of all proportion in the last eight to ten years. I remember speaking to... Uh, it's all been a little much for one or two of them. Um, oh, no, no, he's going back to sit down again. Talking to Sir Sterling Moss at Le Mans a few years ago, saying... He never liked Le Mans. Anthony will get some uh, hybrid back as he crosses the line now. There it is. Um, so just the 306 kilometres an hour. And so Sterling said he never liked Le Mans because he hated being told not to drive flat out. He would love it now. Oh, yeah. Because you go out there, if you're a works driver, you go out there with a gun to your head. You are told your lap time and you better be making it, fella. Yep. And, that, and that hasn't changed because of this new technology, far from it. It just means that you're having to think of more laps and more things around the laps. Uh, before we move on in that point, John, just a quick catch up on the administrative side of the race, because there, were, there was one investigation we hadn't seen the conclusion of, and that was the conclusion into multiple cars over at speeds uh, under the full first of the thing, of, uh, it was the full course yellows. No further action for that. So I think people are being so, given a little bit of leeway and so that's both of the yellow flag infringements have yep. been NFA'd. So I think what's going to happen now, almost certainly, is there'll be another uh, chat about this the next driver's briefing when we get to Shanghai, and uh, there'll be further tweaks made. But it clearly, you know, in terms of the way to run and manage a race, that looked good to me. As far as you're right, John, in terms of the, the way in which these uh, these cars can be raced, can be driven now, um, it's the is. whole character of the race has Absolutely. changed, haven't they? I mean, it's, it's changed it just in the kind of relatively short time that I've been kind of covering sports car racing. But uh, and the thing that changed it, to be absolutely honest with you, was Audi. That's a swap for position. 35 and 27. That is Gustavo Jakerman going back into third position. Not quite. It's a decent bit of defensive driving by Sergei Zlobin. Oh, oh don't put him off the track. These cars are so well matched, aren't they? And remember, Sergey is. Oh, he's hit him! He's hit him, and that is a, almost a very big off. Thank goodness for very wide areas oh. for runoff. As Schlovin comes back in, there's going to be a bit of carbon fibre there. Now it all looks good here. Jakerman goes around the outside. It's a tough one. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, uh, unfortunately, I think that was all about Gustavo going where there wasn't room, because if you look before the contact, Sergei was already on the curbs there in, in, in avoidance. I don't think there was room around there. Now, let's see, who does this benefit? Well, well it could be the SMP 37, Anton Ladigin. Laps down on well, they're both still running. I was expecting there was a bit of carbon fibre flu, wasn't there? Yeah, I was expecting uh, there's uh, a problem there. I think Let's have a look. Sloppy. It's a tough one to call, you know, because you've got to get round the corner. Having said that, it would have only took Slobin to lift off a tiny bit. He didn't need to run into the rear corner, now, but did. Come. Oh, and there's a bit of. They're both coming into the pits? No, no, neither of them coming into the pits. They're just trying to clean off the tyres there. No, Graham, yeah, the Sergei Slobin is not a happy bunny. Uh, I think he felt there was a little bit of a, uh, elbows there along the start-finish straight. And, oh, dear me, there's, uh, I'm not quite sure what that gesture actually meant. Uh, maybe it's been something in Russia. But uh, it wasn't friendly. It's not, I'll see you afterwards for a beer, my friend. No. Well, they've gone round again. This is the... Aston Martin leading its class. This is the Dane trade, isn't it? 
This is Christian Poulsen getting out of that car. Let's have another look at this. I, th I think he's passed him though, Graham. I think, he, I think at that point, you the corner, no, sorry, Gustavo Jakerman turns corner, in. No, the corner was Slobin's corner. But, it, but he's driven round the outside of it. And he hadn't Slobin made the corner. He hadn't made the corner. I disagree. I think I think Jakerman there has driven round the outside of him. And at that point, Slobin's got to give up the corner. He's got to just lift. Because Jakerman can't see where Slobin is and can't drive off the track. Slobin can see where the guy in front of him is, who's nine tenths of a car in front of him. Good stint there, clearly. Christian Poulsen being congratulated by David Hammer Hansen, the guy in the middle there. And who's the chap next to him? Uh, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of the surname. He's another one of the team. He's, he's, he's the young driver, uh, team yeah. owner. Yes. And of course, they've got background with Aston Martin going back to. Oh, trouble here for the 81 car. That is uh, Steve, Steve Wyatt. Wyatt, and that is uh, third stopping. place. It stopped. Third place in arm. Third place in arms just disappeared. That's turn two and three. Yellow flag at turn two and three for that car. The car is stationary. And uh, next car that would profit from that would be Francois Perodo in the number 75 Pro Speed Porsche. So it would be Aston Martin, Aston Martin, Porsche in those circumstances. As we're just 20 seconds away from the final hour. Oh, yes. Should mention, by the way, when we get a chance to see the 27 car, you can see there clearly no dive planes now. On the right front. Yeah, got on the right front. Lucky both of the guys there, whichever way it's seen. I'm sure it'll be being looked at. Our leader is Anthony Davidson. His teammate, Sebastian Buemi, led for a remarkable 133 laps in the middle of this race. And now we head into the last 60 minutes of racing for round five of the 2014 FIA World Endurance Championship here at Fuji Speedway in Japan. John Hangdorf and Graham Goodwin watching what has thus far and I'm allowed to say this, but Graham isn't, because he really is cursing people today. Has been a dominant performance by the Toyota Hybrid Racing Team at home ground. Mount Fuji in the background provides a perfect backdrop for that graphic, which says that Toyota are outclassing the German opposition and doing it in style on their home patch. Eight and seven lead from the uh, chasing Porsches and Audis in GTE, AF Corsa for the moment leading uh, in Pro and in Amit Aston Martin. Don't think the Aston can get this one back. There's a podium for the 99 of Alex McDowell who's just pit stopped. He will need one more stop before the end of the race. The Ferraris can go on one more pit stop. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. By the way, P2, Roman Rusinov now at the wheel of the G-Drive Ligier, who have done a pretty good job today and have led the majority of this race, having had early on a great dice with the 47 KCM G-Car. But today, it's all been about the number eight. Just dominated the whole race from the front. Well, the festivities at the start of the race were bringing in the big crowds as well as the promise of a fantastic six hours of Fuji. And even after the disappointment of no racing last year, the crowds have been huge. Sebastian Buemi led off from pole position, but the action in the first lap of six hours was more akin to maybe a 10 minute sprint rather than the endurance racing with Mark Webber stabbing his authority early and snatching the lead at turn three. So Toyota led to turns one and two. Porsche onwards. Aston Martin 97 banged into its uh, team car, the 99. And having had a Toyota and a Porsche lead, uh, well, Audi decided that they would have a go as well. And into turn number 10, 
the pass was made. Used a bit too much of the fuel allowance, though. There's where the P2 battle was broken up just a little bit when Imperatori went around. Mark Webber, having led the race, did make a couple of mistakes, problems with the braking, maybe some tyre wear as well, trying to double stint the tyres on the 20 car. David Enemeyer Hansen, not immune from making mistakes, unusual low for him. Story of the day for Audi, no speed down the front straight. Completely and utterly blown away by the Porsches and the Toyotas to some 20 kilometers an hour at maximum speed. So anything that was going to come uh, for Audi's way had to be done by sneaky tactics. Paul Dallalana very nearly took out Anthony Davison when he was leading the race, but Anthony avoided that spinning Aston. But there's been plenty of wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing as the battles have continued right at the front of the field. Mark Webber once again just having to give best there to the seven Toyota as it charged back through the field. Mark did lead again after a slow puncture, put him off category with uh, off strategy rather with the rest of the field. Right, we've got a fire in the pit lane. And uh, so this was uh, the first full course caution. And we brought that out to get the piece of dam uh, damaged bodywork. The rest of the GT battles between Aston and Ferrari, very impressive indeed. And it's been going either side. And there, most recently, the issues at the head of the P2 field with the old car being tagged, or did it tag the SMP only? the officials will be able to tell us the full story. But it has been all day, all Toyota. The story, I'm sure the highlights and the headlines are going Toyota's way. Well, this was just a few moments ago in the pit lane. The CLM Lotus has burst into flames in the pit lane. And uh, there's been quite a lot of work trying to put that out. And it's burst into flames again. And that is those are live pictures now that you are watching from the Fuji pit lane with a pall of smoke that was almost out a few minutes ago. Drivers going through. We've got drivers coming into pit lane now at unabated speed. And uh, this is the Audi coming in, the number two car, right alongside it. But that car is not going to be put out. Once carbon fibre gets heated, it burns at a very, very high temperature. And there's been about a dozen or more it's fuel extinguishers fuel being put on it. And fuel now leaking out, I think Graham's absolutely right. And that is a very dangerous situation for those marshals who are doing a really great job in trying. Yeah, I mean, you can see the fuel now running out of that car. The fuel cell has gone. Driver is out of the car, we should say, John. Was out very quickly. Um, I'm not first, surprised. That was Christoph Bouchou, by the way. It's worth saying, John, first responders were the mechanics from the Rebellion team, who were yeah. the first, uh, who were obviously in competition or were with this car. But that is bad news indeed. That's a big fire now. And uh, with the position of that car, this is going to be difficult. We've got other dramas, by the way, on track because the P2 leader, you can see Christoph there on, on screen looking perfectly OK. I think maybe I've got a bit of smoke in his eyes. Yeah, he's... Uh, so, but uh, P2 leading Ligier, slow on the pit straights just a few moments ago, but uh, the drama at the moment is all about this Lotus. Did he not just lift for the flames? I thought that was the situation. There was a white flag shown with yes. the Yes. OK. Uh, and now we've got the fire tender there, and finally, with foam being sprayed into it, that has put that out. That was really, really... Good, great work by marshals with just uh, fire extinguishers and as I say a couple of dozen emptied on it now there is the number seven of Kaz Nakajima continuing to go around uh, drivers now being told extreme caution 60 kilometer line in pit lane yeah correctly so with marshals there still making sure that this doesn't reignite uh, 
second fire tender going to this into, to this uh, interdiction down in the pit lane. Let's head down to Seb Buemi. Led 133 laps today. Sebastian, we're just watching the drama down in the pit lane. Luckily for you, there hasn't been any dramas this race so far. <laughs> yes, exactly. So far, it's been going very well. So we hope we can uh, bring home this one too. That would be great for the championship, great for, for Toyota in Japan. So, um, you know, uh, I would say we, we wait until the end. It's better because we've seen in the past uh, that uh, anything can happen. Thank you. So, the number eight car continues to reel off its laps. And it's been anything but exciting for those guys. As we watch the on from on board the number one of Lloyd Duval and watch the Toyota just sliding away from him. So that is now two laps on second place, on third place now for Anthony Davison and Kaz Nakajima. Or Anthony Davison, yeah, Kaz Nakajima hasn't quite gone past Lloyd Duval. He's just behind him on the circuit, Grim. Yep, slippery surface flags are going to be shown here as uh, cars to continue to come in. This is the Ligier we saw going past at very slow speed onto pit lane. Uh, but it's Gustavo Yakiman now, still third position in that class, chain. Uh, John, uh, John. And uh, well ahead now, uh, Sir Guys Lobin. Yeah, Grim uh, just spotting the Ligier coming into the pit lane that was leading the class. It's still leading the class. Uh, yes, it is. Roman Rusinov has brought the lead car onto pit lane, but as Graham said, it was going very slow earlier on, slow enough to get a white flag out. It's been a great drive through the field for Gustavo Jakob, and there is the leader in class. I'm just looking to see if they've got a chance. The three laps back, surely they can't pull that back. Remember, they started at the back of the grid and got a stop go penalty for the uh, oversized restrictor. Here comes the 47, this is second place in P2. And that was quite a quick pit entry from the 47 and some, ex uh, some expressions of concern from the marshals there. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, a little bit of a message there that that's under investigation. Extreme caution is being urged. Well, as long as he's doing 60 at the pit line, he's not done anything wrong, has he? Although there's, there's now stationary uh, yellows out, being held out, and slippery surface flags and debris flag being uh, held out. That is an ex-CLM. Well, Olivier Pla has been plugged back into the 26 car to take it to the end. Roman Rusinov out of the car. Let's have a word with him. Well, let's Louise have a word with him at least. Roman, hot out of the car. What's more nerve-wracking, watching the last stint or doing the last stint? You know, I think it's most important to to watching because now I had a, quite a difficult one because we get a lot of degradation on the tires, and but I could manage it till the end. And then five laps before I get uh, the alarm from uh, from the radio that the full course yellow, but it was a mistake from race director I heard. So we lose 10 seconds in the operation. So I thought it's not going to cost us a victory. Thank you. Meantime, his car is back out and. Uh, Underway. Imperatori is back in the 47 car. Oh, hello. This could be interesting again. <laughs> Alex Imperatori will be set to stun. He's got about 50 seconds, 5 0 seconds to make up on Oli Pla. That is a tall order for anybody to do in the last 50 minutes. Uh, but when it's Oli Pla chasing down a victory or heading for a victory, then uh, you can only imagine how much more difficult that becomes through goes the number 20 of Brendan Hartley, passing him there, showing the difference of pace between P1 and P2. Not so very long, of course, that uh, P1s and P2s were battling for overall victories in 900 and 6.75s. Uh, Christophe Bouchou 
is out of a very badly burned Lotus. Christoph, we can smile now because we know you're okay. What happened and, and are you okay? Well, um, nothing special. I was driving the car and then uh, suddenly I could uh, smell some uh, bad smoke inside the car. So it was just the corner before the slack line. So I called the, the team and said just, okay, I, I pit because uh, it seemed like uh, it is uh, anomaly. And then uh, just exit the corner, I suddenly, uh, lot of uh, fire inside the car. Uh, and then uh, I turned my head to see what uh, happened. And then suddenly uh, all the cockpit was really in fire, like a uh, middle of a uh, big fire. So my, uh, my hair start to, to burn, my hair start to burn a little bit. I just closed my, uh, my visor and then take you to my helmet. <laughs> I think uh, he could save my uh, eyes and I just stopped the car at the entrance of the pit and the car was completely all in fire. Thank you. If you look very you. carefully on his left eye there, you can see his left, are gone. Yeah. his left eyelashes That's were singed. He's a very lucky boy, isn't he? And uh, cool, calm and collected. He, we saw him talking to a doctor and saying that uh, he was, I think, a bit of smoke in the eyes as well. The doctor was worried about smoke inhalation. Yeah. Quite clearly, he was asking to look up his nose. The, uh, and again, by the way, fantastic. That was, you know, the... The medic was right with him straight away. Yep. But uh, damping down still going on in the, in the pit lane entry for what is now a very ex Lotus. Uh, but meantime, back on track, and it's the number 99 Aston Martin we're with at the moment. Third position might be the best that they can hope for. The Ferraris. 20 seconds back for the second place car now is uh, Alec McDowell. 45 minutes, by the way, now remaining after the dramas in the last 10 or 15 minutes, and believe me, it was dramatic. That's as bad a fire as I've seen for quite a while. It was very on fire by the time it got to pit lane, and even though that was right in front of us, obviously we were watching the highlights at the time, so did see the car come in, but uh, two fire tenders, one got there first and the second one came from the uh, other side of the pit area. Now, what we didn't find out from Roma was whether or not it was linked in with the incident as to why the car slowed. I suspect it was. The white flag may have been for Roma it may have been for a fire tender. I, I just think that Roma saw what at that time was very thick black smoke and lifted off, not knowing where it was coming from. I have to say, he was passed at absolutely flat chart speed by one of the uh, Toyotas, who didn't lift one iota, but there was no yellow flags. I'm not saying that that was an issue. Well, there was a white flag at uh, start finish. That was the only flag I saw at that stage. Uh, clean up thoroughly underway now. And they're about, I think, to push that stricken Lotus out of pit lane. But meantime, we're still sticking with GT and LMP2. This is the LMP2 leader, Roman Rusinov, making his way by the second place GTE Pro car. It is Olivier Pla, of course, uh, now aboard the P2 car. James Collado in 71. So that is the leader in GTE Pro. Can they hold on to this? It's bobbed backwards and forwards between them and Aston Martin for pretty much the, the whole race. It will come down to when the last pit stops are underway. Jimmy Bruni. Now, is he smiling a bit more? He was a bit grumpy the last time we saw him being interviewed by Louise Beckett. Yeah, it's okay. We still have uh, 40 minutes to go, 42 minutes, so fingers crossed. Uh, Tony now is in the car. Uh, let's, let's see after uh, the checkered flag where we are finished. Just 30 seconds between the top three. It's close. Sorry? It's close between the top three. Yeah, but uh, we lost 30 seconds uh, for, for the drive through. Uh, so without that, we were 40 seconds ahead, so it's okay. Part of the race. Thank you. 
a bit happier. <laughs> Just he'll, he'll crack a smile eventually, don't you worry. Only when he's standing on the top very, step of the podium. It's like very many race drivers. Uh, uh, people have two psyches. The psyche's out of the car, and the psyche's when they're in race mode. And uh, it needs a lot of focus. Collado is closing down Villander at the moment, and that is a feather in James Collado's cap. He's taken a significant amount of time out of uh, Tony Vilander in the last few laps, and it's down to just over 10 seconds now. I thought just as we left that, as we see the 27 car on pit lane, this car running fourth at the moment. So goes Lobin, I think, staying aboard the car. But so I thought we were in the midst of a bit of a moment for Tony Vilander there. We'll keep an eye on that. comes the Pro Speed Porsche very slowly across the oil dry that's being put down there for the foam. I don't think that Lotus is going anywhere, mate, if I'm honest. CLM also coming in. Oh, that's Oli Pla back into the pits. That's drama. The 26 car, that's that drama. should not be back in. No, it shouldn't. So there is the Proton Porsche out on the circuit at the moment with uh, Klaus Bachler, fourth position in class. But uh, the drama is on pit lane. You're quite right, John, again. Uh, the 88 car, we see that uh, coming around in, what is that? Uh, that's fourth in GTE Am. But it's the P2 lead. And he's straight back out again. I wonder if he's just got a splash of fuel now to get him to the end. That's quite possible. In comes the Rebellion. The remaining Rebellion. No, the, both posted. Oh, sorry, both excuse me. Running. Excuse me, yes. The 12 car. As we watch the second place car in GTM, this is uh, Pedro Lamy now aboard the 98 car. Winner last time out, the 98. 30 seconds back from the 95 car. And the, these pair, of course, gave us a fantastic uh, end of race battle, didn't they? They went right down to the wire. As the number 12 car, by the way, is being pushed into the garage. Ali number one makes the pass on Pedro Lamy, sitting second place in Am. Pedro Lamy then to second place in arm. And just in behind its uh, pro teammate, there is the leader in the class. With Nicky team doing a cracking job again. And both the AM cars ahead of the 97 car, courtesy of its rather troubled early run. It's been lapping steadily, if not spectacularly. This is the car of the moment. With Nicky team. At the wheel at the moment, David Edemeyer Hansen had a little spin early on, very uncharacteristic for him, but it has not harmed the car's chances at all, and it still leads. David, you're watching closely. Nicky's just got to bring it home now. Yes, uh, now we just have to cruise around for another 30, uh, <laughs> what, 30 minutes, 38 minutes. The car's really been amazing. Uh, the Aston's been hooked up at this track. We had a little bit of a sort of scare perhaps in uh, in practice, thinking we weren't quite there, but in the race, everything has just come to us. The setup is amazing. The car is incredibly easy to drive. So it's been a real pleasure to uh, get to this point, but uh, not counting on our chickens yet. We gotta, we gotta get those uh, 38 minutes to count down as well. If that's what you call cruising, I don't know what you call going fast. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's interesting that the car is just so easy to drive that we can really keep a, a very fast pace, even between the, the gentleman drivers, me and Christian, that's actually quite close to, to the pros, which is really just the signal of a car that's easy to drive. When the car's hard to drive, there's a bigger split. When it's easy to drive, it's much closer. Great, thank you. Yeah, he's done a good job again today. What, uh, I think he's enjoying his time in GT, isn't he? He was, he was impressive in an LMP2 car last year. He's been very impressive this year in a GTE car. We've got the uh, 37 car on pit road now. He's good for a silver driver, isn't he? Oh, he's very good for a silver driver, but he's a proper silver driver. He doesn't make his, his living um, driving racing cars. 
This was uh, Anton Ladigin who brought this car in. I think he stayed at the wheel there, Graham. I'm not mistaken. I think P2 right. is heating up at the front of the field. We've got Emperor Tori leading again now after that short pit stop by Olivier Platt. But we'll need to stop. Well, will he? Will he? That's the question. 51 seconds in the pit lane for Olivier Platt. The, the danger is, of course, Quib, that if he does have to stop, the longer he goes into the race, the less amount of fuel you have to put in, the less amount of time you've got to stand still. Yes. It's great. And a lighter car <laughs> Absolutely. when you come out. So I think what they did with the, the 26 car is the moment they got to refill it and we can get to the end from there, they, they, put, they pulled him in. Here's the 20, Brendan Hartley bringing it uh, home and there's their teammates Mark Lee those two guys are battling for fourth and fifth position they're together I think is it a couple of seconds they are that they're right together on track Brendan Hartley catching Mark Lee now just two seconds behind and catching in about half a second a lap over the last couple now just hearing from Louise Beckett in the pit lane the reason the 26 came in wasn't tactical. They needed to change the left rear tyre. Oh, right. Oh, there you go. Did they? Feel, do we know from Louise whether they fueled it? The they will have put some. I, they must have put some fuel in. But whether whether it was enough, we don't know. And if, uh, I know Louise is listening. If she can ask if they if they think they could go to the end from here, or whether they needed another stop, that would be. Uh, that would be apposite at the moment. So the, the next most likely move to happen here, John, is either Olivier Pla catching Alexander Imperatori, deja vu, uh, or is it going to be Brendan Hartley or Mark Leib? Because those two cars were close together. On board with the 20, Brendan Hartley looking uh, through traffic. And just up the road, turning into the corner ahead of him, is his teammate. And that is what the gap looks like at the moment, and this is the battle for fourth and fifth. And don't forget, Lloyd de Val's only 20 seconds further up the road. Absolutely, it's not going to take much of an upset, is it, to turn this battle between the third, fourth and fifth place cars on its head. It's uh, still very tight indeed, 34 minutes remain now the race. And uh, it's beginning to get a bit gloomy out there, isn't it? Last pit stops coming for the front cars as well. They're, they are all of the top five have got to do another pit stop. So in comes the number one of Lloyd Duval. This will be the last stop for the Audi and he's the first of the leading cars to make his final stop. We'll update you on P2 in a moment with some information that Louise Beckett has uh, tracked down for us. No thought of Lloyd Duval jumping out of the number one. Now, will it be tyres or no tyres? That is the next big question. No, no tyres. No tyres. That's the dice rolled. That is how he's saying we want third position on the track and third position on the podium. Wow. They didn't get away with it earlier on. I wonder if it's just cooled down enough. The tyres were there. The tyres were there, Graham. Absolutely. And they've waved them off, like Duval, with 33 minutes to go. If you remember, the last time we tried this for Audi, they got about 10 more laps, and that's not enough from here. No, and uh, that will have saved them about 30 seconds on the pit stop. 25 so seconds, yeah. It's all now about whether or not they can actually of balance they had 20 seconds on the Porsche before they stopped okay the Porsches will also have to stop the Porsches though have one advantage and only one and that advantage is they've got two cars, cars close together so they, can, they can afford to do a split strategy for the final stint if they, they can think it's possible. they can throw a new set of tires on one car and not on the other and set them both to full rich and when they are full rich my goodness aren't they oh, quick good grief, aren't they and we've heard as well that Mark Webber's back in his race suit down in the pit lane. So would you pull out 
one antipode in for another at this stage. I think at this stage, you do a short fill as, as little as you possibly can. Leave the, the one guy in it. Don't don't risk it. Right. You could easily get a safe belt caught or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. There's Mark Webber, and as I say, he's back in his race suit. He was in civvies earlier on. Well, let's see what Brendan Hartley is saying, or what is being said to him, at least, from the team. When you catch a mark in front of you, you're clear to pass, you're clear to pass. OK, copy that, copy that. Well, there you go, cleared to pass. Mark Lieb ahead of him. Remember, they're on a different strategy this 20 car, they can go deeper into the race. And they are chasing a podium position. Both of these Porsches with different strategy, chasing a podium position. It's all lit up again, Graham, it at the front of the field. It's, it's going to be Toyota 1 and 2, and it looks like 8 from 7 with 21 seconds between them. Then we've got uh, three cars within 40 seconds of each other two of which, the two in the lead, have got to make a stop. I've got to stop. That was almost clear there in uh, Brendan Hartley's response there, wasn't it? But he's got to get to him. Did you hear yeah, that? Absolutely. He's not going to pull You're over. to pass. You've got to get to him. Not you're going to be allowed to pass. You're going to be given the gift of it. You are cleared to pass. So it's it really is, again, endurance racing delivers in the final part of this race, doesn't it? It's closed up there. We've got a close battle for a podium position in the... G, uh, the, uh, for the overall. We've got a live battle right now in LMP2 for the lead because Olivier Plage has put in the fastest lap of his race uh, and that car's race was closed within the three seconds of that lead. We've got a battle still in the way for podium positions in GTE Pro and we've got a battle in the way for GTE uh, GT and podium positions and we've got 30 minutes left. It ain't dull, is it? No. Still so much going on and here it is now. Now, it's changed. It's that's changed, changed over. Yeah. That's what happens when you get close enough. So what will we expect to do? Well, it depends on what their figures are telling them. If their figures are telling them it's tight, they'll, they'll go a, di a split strategy, surely. At this, this stage. Uh, because if I remember rightly, the, the Audi did 14 laps of a second stint and the tyres were gone. Mm. I don't think it was that many. I think it was 14. I remember the word, the, the, the 14. Okay. We're now about 14 laps, are we not, away from the end of this race. It's a massive gamble by Audi and fair play to them because, you know, they've put it all on the table. It's all, if this was a poker game, that's all in. And, and the best they could have hoped for today was a third. I, I don't even think at the start of the race they, they would have expected that. They might have thought if somebody had broken down, they, with a nice piece of tactical thinking when the full course yellow came out, got themselves an opportunity to be third. They've held on to it, and now they are trying to make sure that they nail that one down. But they are gambling. There's no, they have not played this safe. Uh, absolutely not, but uh, but the, the plus for Audi at the moment is they're managing to match the lap times of Mark Lieb. So myself, uh, sorry, Lone Deval rather, is matching the lap times of Mark Lieb at the moment. And that may be all he needs to do. So uh, it, the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes of this race are going to be crucial in determining what happens for the final podium position. And what does that mean? Well, at the moment, it looks as if Toyota are going to come away with the championship lead for manufacturers and for drivers. Uh, but it's a matter of just how much damage is done to Audi's campaign here in terms of the points haul that Toyota take away. And a third place, let's face it, is better than a fourth and a lot better than a fifth. In the manufacturers' championship, I'd agree with you. The drivers' championship, it's the wrong car, of course, because it's the Marcel Fessler car that is the best of the Audis in terms of the drivers' championship. Now, here's that battle at the head of the P2 field, we've seen this before. And look at the body language of the two cars. KCMG, open top car with Alexander Imperatori. Leans his head over a lot, Alex. Even at the start of the race, it looks like when you see him now that he's tired at the end of the race, but he does that all the way. It's, that is his thing, <laughs> the flashing lights from Olivier Pla. But my goodness, that KCMG car, that's Orica. He's quick in a straight line, and Pla has not got anywhere near. In fact, he's not going to get past the Ferrari. Into the pit lane comes the leader. The last stop for Anthony Davidson about to take place. 
Gets on the brakes, passes the stricken Lotus CLM. And this means that Kaz Nakajima will go through and take the lead, which he does now. Now, no earthly way that that number seven car is going to be allowed to win this unless there's a stutter from the eight because that doesn't make championship points. But I expect a formation finish from the Toyotas. That was the point I was going to make, which was uh, Kaznaka Jr. in particular. Uh, we want to stay close because if he's not going to take the win, he'll simply want to be in the picture. Yeah. Great performance here with 26 minutes to go from the Toyota team. Well, the, the performance that they have been threatening to put in all year. We've known they've had the pace in the car. They have been thwarted by the most ridiculous of things. It, it was a snap connector that was worth about a pound, a euro um, at Le Mans that cost them, and cost Kaz Nakajima particularly. The worst thing about it was they saw on the telemetry that they had an issue but the, by the time they uh, tried to tell Kaz, the issue would burn down the radio loom and they couldn't tell him to come in the pit. And then he couldn't get round the, the remainder of the lap. Absolutely. So, Matt Davidson back on his way. And we're hearing from Louise that Mark Webber, although back in his race kit, doesn't look to be doing any more work this afternoon. And uh, as we watch the LMP2 battle hotting up beautifully now, this is Oli Pla right with Alexander Imperatore. This is the same battle we saw at the start of the race. It was a cracker then. We wind six hours and we were watching this very battle. And here comes Oli Pla. He'll have a look down the inside, surely. No, Imperatore makes that very, very difficult. They were close there, but these two raced very fairly early in the race. And surely they'll do it again now. We're thinking that the second of these cars is fueled to the end, but they are marginal. The KCMG car, the blue and white car ahead, who knows? They're playing their cards, or keeping their cards very close to the chest. As they come down the straight, and once again, Imperatori has survived the twisty bits. Now, he gets the advantage on the straight, just uh, taps the brakes there to make sure his brakes are, brake pads are on the discs because at the end of the straight you don't want to be doing that and finding that your pedal goes long. Trust me, I know of what I speak. 236 kilometres an hour and a pedal that goes to the floor. It wakes you up. Now there is the final Toyota stop, and that will be for Kaz Nakajima, and it's going to be a driver change, Graham, as well. Yep. Nakajima unplugging, loosening belts. Turns off the engine beforehand and comes in on electric power only. And Stefan Sarazan yep. will climb aboard for the end of this race. Gustavo Jakobin into the pits from third place in LMP2. With still this phenomenal battle going on between the two Toyotas. Tire change as well. That will ensure that Anthony Davison gets back ahead of them. Needs to be rolling now if he's going to beat his teammate out, and he won't. Sarazan, safe pair of hands to bring the car home, and Anthony Davison crossing the line now, and passes his teammate now, and retakes the lead with a 127.868, the fastest lap of the race for that car. Still Mark Webber with a 27.759 is the fastest lap of the race. Out comes Jakobin, and out comes Sarazan too. Obviously now back into second place, Brendan Hartley. Third place now in the 20 Porsche. But needs to stop one more time. And here we got a, 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 oh a gaggle. This is the two Audis involved with the lead battle for LMP2. That gap half a second when they came by us just a few moments ago. And it's closed up again. And absolutely together. 
round the outside oh, for Plymouth. Oh, that's going to be a great run. Going to have to go either side of the Porsche. Oh, and Plark goes down the inside of the Prospect car and makes the mood. Puts it into the lead with just 22 minutes to go. Had to make the choice early, made it. And whoever is in the 75, it's Manuel Collard. How lucky that it was someone as experienced as Manu Collard. And a big lock up there for Pla. That gives Imperatori to a chance to get back in. We just don't know was the answer on fuel from KCMG and from G Drive. They are both giving it a go here. Olivier Pla, the Frenchman. Leads the motor race in P2 with 21 and a half minutes to go. What an overtaking manoeuvre. What a piece of driving from all three of those drivers. Uh, very good stuff. He was, uh, I think uh, Olivier read that beautifully. The Oak Racing Morgan quite correctly lets him go. Rumble the same like that. What a great move on the outside. He saw that, didn't he? He, he, he thought, oh, look at how much of the dirt he was in there, Graham. Absolutely great stuff. Olivier Pla really didn't know which way to go there. Not the, uh, sorry, uh, Manuel Collard didn't know which way to go. You've just got to hold your line. Played it beautifully, uh, but it was just enough of a balk, if you like, to give Olivier Pla the run. Now, we've got the one and the two Audi together now, and this is interesting. Uh, laps apart, though. Yeah, together on track. I wonder if they can work together. There's still a chance, you know, for Loic de Val to be on the podium. It looks unlikely at the moment, but those two Porsches, I think, have got to come in. And there we go. There's there the first one. 14. 14 coming in on lap. His lap 219220. That's a 36 lap stint for that car. Now, tyres, no tyres. They can't put tyres on. They, 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 if they want third place, they can't put tyres on. They haven't. Oh, this is going to be very tight. This is going to be very tight indeed. Here's the number one coming down the straight now. Remember, it was... What did I say, 20 seconds? Uh, it was... Uh, but, but the gap just then was about 45 seconds. Uh, but... The Porsche has got out ahead. The 14 Porsche has got out ahead of that Audi. That is battle for third place on the track at the moment. They're not in third place, but that's how it would start. But the gap between the two Porsches before the stop for the 14 was about three seconds. So at this rate, we're going to have all four of these cars we can see on uh, screen at the moment. Uh, we're going to have all four of those cars on track together with one of them not on the lead lap. Yeah, agreed. Not the lead lap. That lap. The lap for third. Yes, indeed. So Brendan Hartley still has to stop. That's an, that's an astounding turnaround, though, for the two Porsches, given that there were 20 seconds in arrears of the Audi before the Audi stopped. Thank you, Overtake. Thank you, Now, uh, I think what happens now with the 14 is going to be very, very interesting. All sorts of tactics have got potential here, including slowing the, up the, port, the the Audi. Correct. I don't think he needs to. I don't think he needs to. I think if Brendan puts in another couple of quick laps, and Brendan did a 31 flat last time against Lloyd Deval's 31-3, then he's going to have enough time to get in and out. And you need one lap less of fuel than was put into the other uh, Porsche to do it. Another very quick lap, by the way, as we watch the 14 car come thundering down, start finish straight, with the rebellion between him and the two Audis. Very quick lap indeed from Anthony Davidson at 127.8 again. At least the fourth 127.8 I've seen out of a, a, a Toyota this race. Interesting doesn't times, come in. Hartley doesn't come in. He's trying to build up an extra little bit of a buffer for him. And he's doing it two, two seconds a lap at the moment over the 29.4, yeah. Audis. And what's not helping the Audis is the rebellion between them because it's so quick in a straight line they can't get by. They've got to deal with that car 
before they can start thinking about getting involved with Mark Lee, who's already two, got two cars between him and the Audis. I think they expected Mark Lee to come out behind them, and that's why the number two is sitting in behind the number one. That's an extraordinary run in the time that it's taken for the Porsches needed to take, to take their last pit stop. They've taken 20 seconds out of the Audis. Yep. Out of the lead Audi. So great tactics there for Porsche. A real attack, an attacking move from a team that's been under a lot of pressure here. Led the race, as John said a little earlier, twice, but eventually didn't really have the answer to the pace of the Toyotas. And now it really is about Audi seeing what they can salvage from this. Their chance, I think you're right, John, short of absolute drama in the last 15, 16 minutes. The chance of a podium appears to be gone. Five seconds, the gap now between Lieb and Duval and Hartley is trying, and there he is, to get that situation even better. Are we going to see Toyota, Toyota, Porsche, Porsche, Audi, Audi? Is that how they're going to finish? Here is Brendan Hartley and back on board. Move Brendan to grandstand view of Loic de Val's attempts. But I'm afraid at the moment they're in vain. He's two seconds off Brendan Hartley's pace. Mark Leib's pit stop was 44 seconds against Loic de Val's 53 seconds. So there's. Uh, you know, nine seconds of it there because they simply had to put less fuel in to get him to the end. And of course, if Hartley has to stop, and we think he does, he'll have to put less fuel in still. Correct. And he's 50 seconds to the good now. Lapping consistently with the 129s. It's about 25 seconds down the pit lane. A little bit more than that. That's what you lose. So I, I think any time now, Hartley will dive in and take the fuel stop, and then it'll be about whether he gets out in front of Mark Lieb or behind him. There must be concern down at Audi. Let's hear what they're telling their driver. OK, Marcel, if you're close enough to Lloyd, when you're coming up to start finish, you get by. The Porsche is ahead, but they are double stinting. Now, that's the tactical move now, John. They now know they are likely to get the podium, so they need to salvage points for the car that's doing better in the championship. Well, unless they're going to send uh, send Marcel Feisler after the Porsche. It's points. We're down to 14 minutes now. Yeah, but don't forget, he's a lap back on his teammate. Feisler is a, a, a lap back on his teammate. So he's got to get past him and get past him again. That's a fair point. You won't tend to wonder what that's all about. Is it just about pressure? Because at the moment, neither of these uh, Audis are showing anything like the kind of pace they need, with Mark Lieb disappearing up the road, nearly six, seven seconds to the good now. And Lieb at 29.9 last time around, Duval 31 flat, Fesler 30.4, 30.6 for like Duval last time around, 30.8. They're just not in the same ballpark as this car, and indeed its teammate, and it's very, Few times we've said that Audi have won races before not having the fastest car. Audi have won races before not having the most fancied car. But this has not been one of those days. Toyota have had the fastest car and they are going to win. And Porsche are going to get another podium in their first season. There you go. And to give a comparison here, OK, with Audi having double stinted or put the tyres in for a, for a part stint, a second stint. They're running consistently 130s, 131s. Anthony Davidson has just put in another 127.8. So four seconds quicker at the moment the Toyota than the Audi can manage while in attacking mode. Uh, it's not been a good day uh, down at Audi Sports. They've had plenty of good ones. This will not go down in the history books as one of their favourites. We've got a yellow, meanwhile, at turns three and four. Double yellows, in fact, there. So, Somebody, and no, nope, they go. It's fine. Well, 
I don't think that Fesner's close enough to make that pass. So now we, uh, it was the 13th Rebellion, by the way, Don Kreheimer. Still those intermittent issues with the drive-by wire. They've had a terrible day in terms of... Uh, it's terrible all weekend. electrical as well. It is, absolutely, and that's the most frustrating thing for the lot. So the two Audis close together, but not, as we've seen in recent times, running at the front of the field. Go on, Eduardo. Stop at T4. I have a car stopped at T4. Yellows at T4. We have a car stop on driver's left. He's resuming. And that was Dom Kreheimer. Well, Fesner's closer than he's ever been here. This will not be for position. He will stay in P6. The gap between Duval and Lieb has gone out to eight seconds. Does he think he can... I don't know, is there a drafting something that they can do? Two cars should be able to run better than one. It's down the front straight. It's too late. Uh, we're down to 11 minutes remaining now. It's just too late. Still haven't seen Brendan Hartley down pit lane. And he's he still running 129s. He last came in. I can't tell you because I forgot to write it down. And here we go. Is there going to be a pass? I don't think so. Unless the one car lifts off. Or maybe. And away goes the number two car. Pass number one, as John said, not for position. But all that can be done now is to apply pressure. And away goes Marcel Fesler, ahead of Lote Duval. On the older rubber, unable to mount the attack that they would wish to. And at the head of the field, it is Anthony Davidson. Headlights cutting through the gloaming that we have now. That's coming up on 10 minutes to five here in Japan. Well, this has been a race of races for Toyota. Arms folded in the Toyota hybrid racing pit lane. Anthony Davison will get another 3.1 megajoules. He's got it. 300, me 300 Ks again. Still a huge number of people in the stands here. Oh, well, look at the car race. parks, Graham. Car we, parks we can still see. Ramped. They're going to see a home win. And. Remember how they clapped and cheered last year for a win that came behind the safety car? Imagine what this is going to be like for the podium ceremonies tonight. Pole position. Most laps led. The only thing that the eight car doesn't have is the fastest lap. That is Mark Webber's and then Porsche number 20. And I think for a moment Anthony Davison was thinking of going for that. He got within a tenth of it more than once and then was politely told that perhaps it might be time just to think about getting the car to the end of the race. It's not stopped him putting his foot in, though, has it? It's been... Uh, what would you expect? I, I, I've been interested in seeing how many laps he ran in 127.8. I think it was at least five. He was having a go. I think he was having a go for the fastest lap so they could do uh, Paul. Would you like to be the first person to ask him whether or not he's not quite as fast as Mark Webber, or should I? What a shame you weren't as quick as Webber to do. <laughs> Stefan Sarazan will bring the seven car home in second position for him and his team. Two hundred and thirty six laps we're expecting. Uh, that will be three laps longer than the 2012 race. In fairness, three laps were behind a safety car then, although we've had two and a half laps of full course yellow here. And it's so appropriate, isn't it, John, that we've seen Toto have such a great race this weekend. Uh, we've, again, from the FIWEC, had a fabulous welcome at Fuji International Speedway. Absolutely everybody clearly delighted to have the championship back here.
and uh, the home team, as it were, delivering a pretty faultless display. In the classes, Nicky team has the arm category wrapped up with 36 seconds of a lead between the Aston 95 and the Aston 98. Emmanuel Collard for the 75 Porsche, the Pro Speed team in third in the Pro class. James Collado is still closing down Tony Vlander, not quick enough, so it's 51-71, and Alex McDowell's put in a great run, but the Aston is not going to get there. It will take third position, though, after a fantastic pole position for Grant Bamboo. He'll be on the podium. In P2, Oli Pla in the 26th, there he is. The G-Drive racing car has pulled out now to six, nearly seven seconds on. Imperatore, Alex Imperatore. And Gustavo Jakobin with Kiko Ihara and Alex Brundle will be in third position in the 35 car. And that is the result of all results for me. And that, uh, that's the <laughs> chef de camp, Jacques Nicolet, with Robert Brissonneau behind him, uh, showing that he's still <laughs> gripped by this race. Olivier Pla pushing on. Uh, it's all about closing a points gap there. We look again into the Oak Racing and G-Drive carriages. But uh, it's about closing a points gap. And this effort this weekend, if it stays like this, will mean that Olivier Pla, Julien Canal and Roman Rissinov's effort, the 26 car, will close down a further 10 points into the advantage held at the moment by SMP Racing and Sergei Slobin. Uh, before the race, 95 points for SMP Racing played 69 points for the G-Drive team. That should close in by a further 10 points with three races remaining. It's going to be a grandstand finish in LMP2, whatever happens. There is your second, uh, your leader in GTE Pro. And they already have a pretty substantial lead. This is going to be very good news indeed for and that's the right car for here of course it as is well, the right car it? for Corsa. that is the championship leading car underlining their championship leading form by winning here on a race that they might not have fancied and interestingly aston getting better mileage and distance out of their long runs here than we've seen before but a not quite having the pace. But a new still for A, of course, so it's the wrong Porsche that's actually uh, ahead on the road. Yeah. And this is a body blow for Porsche here. Yeah, for their championship aspirations, both in drivers and in uh, manufacturers. Anthony Davison comes up to the turn 15. Still getting a bit of wheel spin through there. He's got behind him. I think that's three, oh no, that's the 97 car you can see from that overhead view that they'd had the panels on the roof. There is the 95. Nicky T, I was going to say that was three class leaders in one shot there. It's not far off, Nicky. It's not going to be far off a 50 point lead for the 51 uh, squad at the end of this race with three races remaining. That's big courtesy of uh, let's look at the rebellion there. This is number 13 car. With its class, of course, in 11th position, but with four P2s ahead of it, that is not the result that Bart it's and been, the rest of the guys want to see. It's been a poor day for the P1Ls with troubles for both rebellions and uh, dramas were altogether more dramatic sort for the number nine Lotus. And evidence of no one able to double stint is the amount of rubber littered around the front straight not where you're leaning on the tires <laughs> and there's some places particularly you watch here as we see Klaus Bachler having a little look for third position on Collard it's not all over yet as you rightly said Graham and uh, this is going to go down the line this is the closest battle on the circuit at the moment and this is for the final podium position Manu versus Klaus Bachler two guys at opposite ends of their career this matters for prototype competition in contention at the moment for second position in the class. Uh, class standings, championship standings at the end of this race. 
It's an Aston Martin 1-2 at the moment, looks like staying that way, but this will likely put Proton Competition ahead of the AF Corsa team. Well, let's chase the Aston Martins, but we're back aboard the leader now, John. Well, let's have a look at that battle for position from Anthony Davidson. And Anthony Davidson has just put in a... No, he's not, he's put in a 28-7, not a 27-7, apologies. But another very quick lap, way quicker than anyone else out there. He steams past that battle for third place in GTE Arm. And they are a distant memory already. Just feathering the throttle there. This will be his penultimate lap, won't it? This will be one more after this. Yeah, 36. We're expecting, we projected 236, which will be three more than the first race here. But we did have three laps under a safety car. But I would say we had some full course yellow here. And that once again underlines just the technological advances with more efficient cars going as quick if not quicker as far if not farther on something like 25 percent less fuel absolutely oh look at the understeer that has been induced there by anthony as he comes out the final corner hopefully there will be an official with a board out or a finger out that says one to go so it goes across the line no there wasn't but it is the final lap. It is indeed the last lap. We'll keep an eye on that battle for... These stands are packed, John. We'll keep an eye on that battle for third place in GTE Arm. As the crowds have come out to welcome home the local heroes, led by Anthony Davidson. Seb Buemi, just the two of them. And here's that battle. Backler is the second of those two. Porsche, Emmanuel Cullard, with all his experience, is going to have to hang on for another lap. They've just been passed by... Fortunately, they've just been passed by this man. It would have been another lap as well on top of that. Time has elapsed. We have given you six hours. We'll give you just a little bit more in extra time. And that extra time may prove crucial for the battle for GT3 and third position. But rounding the penultimate corner, Anthony Davidson pressed hard for fastest lap. It's the only thing that the number eight team have not got. They claimed pole position. Sebastian Buemi led 133 laps consecutively. Yeah, fantastic job, Anthony. Fantastic job this weekend. Well done, well done. And Anthony Davidson drives over the tyre crud towards yeah! his team. Toyota, baby! Go on yourself! And Anthony Davidson brings it home. It'll be first and second with Sebastian. Yeah, wonderful job, Anthony. Pick up program, please, in, the, in lap. You are leading the championship by 29 points. Uh, you are first. Our car seven... Uh, for 23rd, for 14th, for Audi 1 and Audi 2. Good job. Mathieu Linnell doing uh, our jobs oh, Great for us. job, guys. Great job. Yeah. Thanks what? for all your hard work. Everybody. And Emmanuel Collard just held on for third position in GTE. Um, Sarazen goes through. We wait for Brendan Hartley, who didn't make that extra stop. So they've managed to get through on six stops, despite the fact that they had that extra stop early on for the puncture. That's remarkable. It all starts as through goes Hartley for third place, and Mark Webber will join Brendan and Timo. But it's all about Toyota. Graham Goodwin, dillysportscar.com. This is a victory above all victories, perhaps other than Le Mans for Toyota. Uh, yeah, and it matters in two ways, John. Not only is it uh, clearly they're delighted with this, but the way that the finishing order actually panned out couldn't have been better with all six factory cars finishing, couldn't have been better for the number eight Toyota crew because the crew that was chasing them in the championship has finished sixth. It's the worst result they could have expected uh, with, without major dramas. So it's been a huge result here for Toyota.
quite possibly a season defining result. Uh, a great race from them, almost completely faultless, uh, and a good race actually by Porsche too. Uh, despite the fact that, that you know, they had a, the UK a couple of problems, well beaten by Tota, but probably the most convincing Porsche display we've seen so far. Yeah, both cars suffering a lack of power in the middle part of the race, but no lack of determination by the Toyota and the Porsche crews. The uh, two Toyotas side by side as they came into pit lane there. It's uh, great stuff, good to see. Here they come down into pit entry. I'm just wondering if we hadn't had those issues, Mark Webber's puncture, how that Porsche, the 20 car, by the way, got to the end with only six stops, having stopped so early on. That's something that we need to crunch the numbers on afterwards. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and a podium position. So that, that was some clever strategy there that went on in the 20 car, but take nothing away from Toyota and from their legion of fans here, this is a big victory. It's the 21st FIA WEC championship race of this new era. And in it, Toyota Hybrid Racing are the ones who come of age. Handshakes between the first and second place finishing drivers for Toyota. Anthony Davidson there taking the applause on top of the car. Absolutely, you can see in his eyes, can't you? Utterly delighted with that one. Racing drivers do love it when a day goes well, and certainly when it's gone as well as that. They'll leave here as the drivers' champ uh, championship leaders, as the manufacturers' championship leaders, and probably more important than that, as race winners here at Fuji International Speedway in front of their home fans and in front of the Toyota board. That is Brendan Hartley coming into the pit lane now. An extraordinary run from the 20 car. Mark Webber leading early on, taking an unexpected lead from the Paul City Toyota, suffering a slow puncture, then getting back to the head of the field with the strategy working in their favour. And then both Porsches reported as having power issues. Seemed to affect uh, the 14 slightly more than the 20 but they've managed to get in without the extra pit stop I expected at the end. Yeah, it's uh, all in all, you know, there, there are points at which it settled, didn't it, as, as endurance races tend to do. But yet again, at the end of this uh, frankly fantastic six hour format, uh, yet again, the things panned out that we had battles up and down the field again, John. How many times have we seen this at the FIWEC? That the final hour, the final 45 minutes, the final 20 minutes, there's still somebody there battling for something that mattered. And there, we had three factory cars all looking for someone to stumble, for someone to make a wrong call, for someone to make a mistake, for someone to actually still have the ponies left to push to the end. And ultimately, what, what it came down to was Brendan Hartley, the number 20, uh, Porsche team, I think, a deserved podium there after a great start to the race uh, with Mark Webber. Uh, after that stumble in the middle, uh, the young man bringing it home. Louise Beckett grabbing the victorious drivers and bringing them to our cameras. The eight crew are down with Louise Beckett on in pretty much picture perfect here. Anthony, well done. So Toyota for the fans, you did it, you, do, you got the win. Yeah, finally, you know, after two really unlucky races in Le Mans and, uh, where was the last one, Austin. Um, <laughs> it's great to be back on top and uh, to extend our lead in the championship. So, like I said before the race, we knew we had a strong car. It was amazing, you know, to have such a, a dominant car in the race. But Car 7 kept us honest and we couldn't relax. Um, although I think they would have been a little bit kind to us if they did close the gap, but uh, you always want to show your speed as a driver and uh, as, as a car crew. Um, so it was a good fight that we had. Well done. Well, he had the honor of bringing the car home for its victory. I can't, I've just been thinking there, Graham, I can't think of anything that they did wrong. No, not a thing. You know, Boemi lost the lead in the first corner. That wasn't his fault. He just got absolutely monstered, monstered by Mark Webber. This was the reaction just a few minutes ago. John Lutchen's there. Team president there on the left. 
and the whole team just absolutely delighted with that. And you know, when your day goes that well, you can't be failed to be anything other than buoyed up by it. And this will carry them forward to the next race in three weeks' time, John. There is the confirmation of the dominance of Toyota Hybrid Racing for the fifth round of the 2014 FIA World Endurance Championship. Porsche third and fourth, and perhaps the unlikeliest Porsche in third position after those issues earlier on for Mark Webber, who also takes the fastest lap as well as they step on the podium. Audi, well, this wasn't their track and it wasn't their day without really having any problems finishing two and three laps down on the leaders well can uh, you remember that no it's uh, it's pretty extraordinary stuff isn't it and it's just something to do with the way this this circuit um, suited these cars for p2 john great battle between the top two cars in in, in, in this race uh, olivier pla bringing the home the 26 ligier nissan the g-drive car home five and a half seconds only ahead of alex imperatori aston martin taking first and second in arm and ferrari first and second in gte pro time for the podium ceremonies mark weber with the fastest lap talking to gerard Navo there the man at the head ceo of the wec world endurance championship i think they'll all be thoroughly delighted with this event john oh, it's gone down very well indeed the podium just opposite us to our left in fact if i wave a bit you might be able to see us in the background no they're all hospitality units that you can see above the toyotas so the overall podium ceremony goes first third position the 20 Porsche team for the 919 hybrid Timo Bernhard with Mark Webber and Brendan Hartley TSO 40 hybrid racing team Alex Wirtz Stefan Sarazan Kaz Nakajima thought he drove very very well and listened to the cheer for Kaz TSO 40 hybrid, Andy Davison and Sebastian Buemi. <laughs> Significant for their teammate, of course, if they go on to win the championship, there will not be a three winners. Now the national anthem of the winning entrant. Noticing there that the team member of the uh, Toyota team getting the trophy, just to the left there with the, the hat on and the red, white and black, uh, red, white and uh, blue jacket. That is uh, Kinoshita-san, who is the team president. team president of Toyota Racing, who started off when this man was racing at Le Mans. In fact, he probably prepared cars that raced against Henri Pescarolo. Certainly worked on the TS-010, which was getting fired up behind us earlier on today. And its predecessor. And its predecessor. Yeah, Kinoshida-san, he is endurance racing personified as far as Toyota is concerned. And that is the man just standing there to the left. First place then, just the two drivers. Car number eight, Toyota Racing. Drivers, Anthony Davidson and Sebastian <laughs> Joining the winners on the podium is the team representative of Toyota Racing, Mr. Yoshiaki Kinoshita. Okay, it's time for champagne.
sometimes only the pictures need to be there. <laughs> and look at the joy on Yoshiaki Kinoshita's face. That is the man who is getting the champagne shower. And I bet that's never tasted any better. I bet so. Uh, you know, a real love of the sport, I'm sure. Spirit of the Mon, spirit of endurance, Ooh. written through him. So the trophies still being paraded by the Toyota team as we confirm the classification overall for the fifth round of the FIA WEC here at Fuji. Toyota 1-2, Porsche 3-4, Audi 5 and 6 and well off the pace today. They'll be working hard to get back their championship defence at the moment in jeopardy. Not the greatest weekend for Rebellion Racing. And the Lotus, well, even worse for them with their car. The CLM chassis uh, in less than pristine order, shall we say. So now to the GTE Pro category. Aston Martin Racing took pole position. They'll have to settle for third, second place AF Corsa and first place AF Corsa. But that's the first podium uh, in the WEC for the 99 crew, and I think it might be for the 71 crew as well. Yeah, Kraft Bamboo Racing taking third position. And now the national anthem of Italy is the entrance of AF Corsa. So the presentations then to Alex McDowell, Daryl O'Young and Fernando Rees, first of all. And the president of the Japanese Automotive Federation making the presentations. The second place trophy goes to car number 71. Second time on the podium for James Collado and David Rigon. 
They were on the podium with Spa as well. And the championship leaders extend their championship lead with Jimmy Bruni and Tony Vlander taking the big trophies home on the plane. GT Pro then AF Corsa with the top two steps of the podium. Aston Martin Racing, 41 seconds in arrears at the end of the race. Terrible weekend for Porsche team Manti, challenging for the championship as they came in here. And the 92 car, the best place of them, sitting down in sixth position. Not much better for the normally reliable 97 Aston Martin crew. Well, it's only now. The next round of the WEC is in Shanghai, China. A sprint during six hours. The WEC is in China. Teamwork. Speed and strategy are key. No mercy. World Endurance Championship. Get ready. What about you? And now we will present the podium ceremony for the LT1L class. Second place, Parker And confirmation of what we were talking about there with the F Corsa stretching away to uh, 30. Uh, Six points of a lead ahead of Porsche Team Manti and Aston Martin Racing challenging Porsche for second place. And now the P1L podium. Rebellion. And now the Swiss national anthem as entrance of the Rebellion team. So just the two classified cars in P1L with the CLM Lotus not getting to the end after that fiery moment. But we have our champions of the season because uh, Bart Hayden's group have been 100% perfect throughout the year. First win of the season for the 13 crew, however. So nice to share the love around a little bit. Nico Prost is seeing these nice trophies. Did you feel how heavy that was? That was nice. And Bart Hayden gets the manufacturer's trophy. Nice to see these guys closer to the front of the field. Now they did have problems today, which finished them, uh, made them finish a little further back down the field. However, 
five seconds off the front of the field and a good three seconds off the back of the uh, P1Hs. In fact, that's the first time that the 13 crew have scored points this season. So well done to them for that. second place in the championship yeah absolutely classification of uh, the p2 category was in doubt right till the end and under six seconds the gap and might that have been different had alex imperatori not made that slightly risky move early on but g drive take it roman Rusinov in the center there celebrating a win for the very pretty ligier coupe Without uh, a battle, though. Story of the race for me, however, is the third place car. Mistake in qualifying saw them thrown out and put to the back of the grid with uh, two larger restrictors in the Dunlop Shod on Rourke Morgan. And uh, first in from Gustavo Jakerman of Herculean proportions dragged the car up into contention. And then Kiko Ehara did a great middle stint. In third place, she finished off. And Alex Brundle held that position and pushed the car home. An unexpected podium, I think, after the early part of the weekend. And the KCMG coming in, team coming in second, backing up their good result at quarter. And G Drive Racing winning it here in Japan. That could be a very valuable result indeed when the championship uh, totals are finalised, John. Closes the gap to 16 points to Sergei Slobin in the... In the championship. Right, drivers' championship and the team, 27 to 26. Russian national anthem for the entrance. Well, as I said, Graham, I think this is the story of the race. Uh, if you take out the win for Toyota, Kiko Ihara on home ground, of course. And I, I'm not sure about this. Somebody may tell us, but I think that might be the first lady driver on the podium in WEC. I think you may be right, John. Uh, but coming from the very back, Yakiman's first stint was stunning through the traffic. Fabulous stuff. It just goes to show that Judd engine. It's a very potent piece of kit, and there's certainly still life in the Morgan chassis, isn't there? Good result for KCMG and the uh, the team there. They closed the gap as well on SP, but not by as much as G Drive will. Alex Imperatori impressed me, as did Richard Bradley and Matthew Housen, of course, the official driver mascot of the Isle of Wight Festival. And the first place trophy goes to car number 26, G Drive. And G Drive, Roman Rusinov, Oli Pla, Julian Canal. Julian Canal's transformation from GT driver to P2 driver is complete. Proper job from Julian Canal there. Uh, Olivier Pla, we expect it from, absolutely. Roman Rusinov did very well indeed. Julian Canal, though, theoretically should be the weak link there. He didn't prove to be that this time. It was a great showing from the, uh, the whole team. Thoroughly deserved that win, I thought. And a good battle. As I say, it might have been a little bit different for a little longer had uh, Imperatory not made that uh, slightly low percentage move on the but that Proton car. But that was the only thing he, went, he did. Oh, well. no, that, that was, was a great drive by Imperatory. Three very good drives on that podium uh, that would be worthy of the driver of the day alone. And that would certainly be the Canal drive, the Gustav Jackerman 
opening stint and the imperatory uh, opening stint and towards the end as well, putting the pressure back on. Happily, we will see this oak car back again in Shanghai and again after that in Bahrain. Mm. Slightly different driver crews for those races, but uh, good to have that bolster in the grid. Now that is the confirmation of the World Drivers Championship at the head of the field with Nicola Lapierre not here this weekend for family reasons, dropping down to second position, but still ahead of the Audi drivers. Despite not scoring this weekend, his two teammates uh, open up a handy lead. Uh, what that means as well, John, is uh, whatever happens at Shanghai, those, uh, those Toyota drivers will leave Shanghai as the championship leaders. Yeah, even if they uh, don't score, yes, good point. So it will uh, have to go further into the season. In the GT drivers, Jimmy Bruni and Tony Vlander ahead of Porsche driver Fred Markovicki. Not a great day for the 92 car today. That puncture earlier on was just the start of their problems. It's getting quite close to the point where those uh, Ferrari drivers might well be crowned, I think could be crowned champions next race. Uh, Aston Martin represented there with David Enemeyer Hansen in sixth position. The next round of the WEC is in Shanghai, China. A sprint during six hours. WEC is in China. Teamwork. Speed and strategy are key. No mercy. World Endurance Championship. Get ready. What about you? On behalf of the whole team, Graham Goodwin and John Hangdorf, and everybody behind the scenes, second of November, we'll see you in Shanghai. Thanks for joining us in Fuji. Bye for now. <laughs>